Chapter One of The Village in the Jungle by Leonard S. Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Danielle Cartwright. Dedicated to V. W. I've given you all the little that I've to give. You've given me all, that for me is all there is. So now I just give back what you have given, if there is anything to give in this. Chapter 1 The village was called Betagama, which means the village in the jungle. It lay in the low country or plains, midway between the sea and the great mountains which seem far away to the north, to rise like a long wall straight up from the sea of trees it was in and of the jungle the air and smell of the jungle lay heavy upon it the smell of hot air of dust and of dry and powdered leaves and sticks its beginning and its end was in the jungle which stretched away from it on all sides unbroken north and south and east and west to the blue line of the hills and to the sea the jungle surrounded it overhung it continually pressed in upon it it stood at the door of the houses always ready to press in upon the compounds and open spaces to break through the mud huts and to choke up the tracks and paths it was only by yearly clearing with axe and caddy that it could be kept out. It was a living wall about the village, a wall which, if the axe were spared, would creep in and smother and blot out the village itself. There are people who will tell you that they have no fear of the jungle, that they know it well that they know it as well as the streets of Mahanurara, or their own compounds. Such people are either liars or boasters, or they are fools, without understanding or feeling for things as they really are. I knew such a man once, a hunter and tracker of game, a little man with hunched-up shoulders and peering, cunning little eyes, and a small dark face, all pinched and lined, for he spent his life crouching, slinking, and peering through the undergrowth and the trees. He was more silent than the leopard and more cunning than the jackal. He knew the tracks better than the doe who leads the herd. He would boast that he could see a buck downwind before it could scent him, and a leopard through the thick undergrowth before it could see him. Why should I fear the jungle, he would say. I know it better than my own compound. A few trees and bushes and leaves, and some foolish beasts. There is nothing to fear there. One day he took his axe in his hand, and the sandals of deer hide to wear in the thorny places, and he went out to search for the shed horns of deer, which he used to sell to traders from the towns. He never returned to the village again, and months afterwards in thick jungle I found his bones scattered upon the ground, beneath some thorn bushes, gnawed by the wild pig and the jackal, and crushed and broken by the trampling of elephants. And among his bones lay a bunch of peacock feathers that he had collected, and tied together with a piece of creeper, and his betel case and the key of his house, and the tattered fragments of his red cloth. In the fork of one of the thorn bushes hung his axe. The massive wooden handle had been snapped in two. I do not know how he died, but I know that he had boasted that there was no fear in the jungle, and in the end the jungle took him. All jungles are evil, but no jungle is more evil than that which lay about the village of Betagama. If you climb one of the bare rocks that jut up out of it, 
you will see the jungle stretched out below you for mile upon mile on all sides it looks like a great sea over which the pitiless hot wind perpetually sends waves unbroken except where the bare rocks rising above it show like dark smudges against the grey green of the leaves for ten months of the year the sun beats down and scorches it and the hot wind in a whirl of dust tears over it tossing the branches and scattering the leaves the trees are stunted and twisted by the drought by the thin and sandy soil by the dry wind they are scabrous thorny trees with grey leaves whitened by the clouds of dust which the wind perpetually sweeps over them their trunks are grey with hanging stringy lichen and there are enormous cactuses evil-looking and obscene with their great fleshy green slabs which put out immense needle-like spines more evil-looking still are the great leafless trees which look like a tangle of gigantic spiders legs smooth bright green jointed together from which when they are broken oozes out a milky viscous fluid and between the trees are the bushes which often knit the whole jungle together into an impenetrable tangle of thorns on the ground beneath the trees it is very still and very hot for the sterile earth is covered with this thorny matted undergrowth through which the wind cannot force its way the sound of the great wind rushing over the tree-tops makes the silence below seem more heavy the air is heavy with the heat beating up from the earth and with the smell of dead leaves all the bushes and trees seem to be perpetually dying for ten months of the year the leaves withering and the twigs and branches decaying and dropping off to be powdered over the ground among the coarse withered grass and the dead and blackened shrubs and yet every year when the rains come the whole jungle bursts out again into green and it forces its way forward into any open space upon the tracks into the villages and compounds striving to blot out everything in its path if you walk all day through the jungle along its tangled tracks you will probably see no living thing it is so silent and still there that you might well believe that nothing lives in it you might perhaps in the early morning hear the trumpeting and squealing of a herd of elephants or the frightened bark of the spotted deer or the deeper bark of the sandbur or the blaring call of the peacock but as the day wore on and the heat settled down upon the trees you would hear no sound but the rush of the wind overhead and the grating of dry branches against one another yet the shadows are full of living things moving very silently themselves like shadows between the trees slinking under the bushes and peering through the leaves for the rule of the jungle is first fear and then hunger and thirst there is fear everywhere in the silence and in the shrill calls and the wild cries in the stir of the leaves and the grating of the branches in the gloom in the startled slinking peering beasts and behind the fear is always the hunger and the thirst and behind the hunger and the thirst fear again the herd of deer must come down to drink at the water-hole they come down driven by their thirst very silently through the deep shadows of the trees to the water lying white under the moon they glide like shadows out of the shadows into the moonlight hesitating tiptoeing throwing up their heads to stare again into the darkness leaping back only to be goaded on again by their thirst ears twitching to catch a sound and nostrils quivering to catch a scent of danger and when the black muzzles go down into the water 
it is only for a moment and then with a rush the herd scatters back again terror-stricken into the darkness and behind the herd comes the leopard slinking through the undergrowth whom has he to fear yet there is fear in his eyes and in his slinking feet fear in his pricked ears and in the bound with which he vanishes into the shadows at the least suspicious sound in the time of the rains the jungle might seem to be a pleasant place the trees are green and the grass stands high in the open spaces water lies in pools everywhere there is no need to go stealthily by night to drink at rivers or water-holes the deer and the pig roam away growing fat on the grass and the young leaves and the roots the elephant travels far from the river bank the time of plenty lasts however but a little while the wind from the northeast drops the rain fails for a month a great stillness lies over the jungle the sun looks down from a cloudless sky the burning air is untempered by a breath of wind it is spring in the jungle a short and fiery spring when in a day the trees burst out into great masses of yellow or white flowers which in a day wither and die away the pools and small water-holes begin to dry up under the great heat the earth becomes caked and hard then the wind begins to blow from the southwest, fitfully at first, but growing steadier and stronger every day. A little rain falls, the last before the long drought sets in. The hot, dry wind sweeps over the trees, the grass and the shrubs die down, the leaves on the small trees shrivel up and grow black and fall. The gray earth crumbles into dust and splits beneath the sun. The little streams run dry. The great rivers shrink until only a thin stream of water trickles slowly along in the middle of their immense beds of yellow sand. The water holes are dry. Only here and there in the very deepest of them, on the rocks, a little muddy water still remains then the real nature of the jungle shows itself over great tracts there is no water for the animals to drink only the elephants remember the great rivers which lie far away and whose banks they left when the rains came as soon as the southwest wind begins to blow they make for the rivers again but the deer and the pig have forgotten the rivers in the water-holes the water has sunk too low for them to reach it on the slippery rocks for days and nights they wander round and round the holes stretching down their heads to the water which they cannot touch many die of thirst and weakness around the water-holes from time to time one in his efforts to reach the water slips and falls into the muddy pool and in the evening the leopard finds him an easy prey. The great herds of deer roam away, tortured by thirst, through the parched jungle. They smell the scent of water in the great wind that blows in from the sea. Day after day they wander away from the rivers, into the wind, south towards the sea, stopping from time to time to raise their heads and snuff in the scent of water, which draws them on. Again many die of thirst and weakness on the way, and the jackals follow the herds and pull down in the open the fawns that their mothers are too weak to protect. And the herds wander on until at last they stand upon the barren, waterless shore of the sea. Such is the jungle which lay about the village of Betagama. The village consisted of ten scattered houses, mean huts made of mud plastered upon rough jungle sticks. Only one of the huts had a roof of tiles, that of the village headman, Babahami. The others were covered with a thatch of cajuns, 
the dried leaves of the coconut palm below the huts to the east of the village lay the tank a large shallow depression in the jungle where the depression was deepest the villagers had raised a long narrow bund or mound of earth so that when the rain fell the tank served as a large pond in which to store the water below the bund lay the stretch of rice fields about thirty acres which the villagers cultivated if the tank filled with water by cutting a hole in the bund through which the water from the tank ran into the fields the jungle rose high and dense around the fields and the tank it stretched away unbroken covering all the country except the fields the tank and the little piece of ground upon which the houses and compounds stood the villagers all belonged to the goya caste which is the caste of cultivators if you had asked them what their occupation was they would have replied the cultivation of rice but in reality they only cultivated rice about once in ten years rice requires water in plenty it must stand in water for weeks before it grows ripe for the reaping it could only be cultivated if the village tank filled with water and much rain had to fall before the tank filled if the rains from the northeast in november were good and the people could borrow seed then the rice fields in january and february were green and the year brought the village health and strength for rice gives strength as does no other food but this happened very rarely usually the village lived entirely by cultivating chinas in august every man took a caddy and went out into the jungle and cut down the undergrowth over an acre or two then he returned home in september he went out again and set fire to the dead undergrowth and at night the jungle would be lit up by points of fire scattered around the village for miles for so sterile is the earth that a china burnt and sown for one year will yield no crop again for ten years thus the villagers must each year find fresh jungle to burn in october the land is cleared of ash and rubbish and when the rains fall in november the ground is sown broadcast with millet or curacan or maize with pumpkins chilies and a few vegetables in february the grain is reaped and on it the village must live until the next february no man will ever do any other work nor will he leave the village in search of work but even in a good year the grain from the chinas was scarcely sufficient for the villagers and just as in the jungle fear and hunger forever crouch slink and peer with every beast so hunger and the fear of hunger always lay upon the village it was only for a few months each year after the crop was reaped that the villagers knew the daily comfort of a full belly and the grain sown in chinas is an evil food heating the blood and bringing fever and the foulest of all diseases parangi there were few in the village without the filthy sores of parangi their legs eaten out to the bone with the yellow sweating ulcers upon which the flies settle in swarms the naked children soon after their birth crawled about with immense pale yellow bellies swollen with fever their faces puffed with dropsy their arms and legs thin twisted little sticks the spirit of the jungle is in the village and in the people who live in it they are simple sullen silent men in their faces you can see plainly the fear and hardship of their lives they are very near to the animals which live in the jungle around them they look at you with the melancholy and patient stupidity of the buffalo in their eyes or the cunning of the jackal and there is in them the blind anger of the jungle the ferocity of the leopard and the sudden fury of the bear in Betagama there lived a man 
called Silindu, with his wife, Dingihami. They formed one of the ten families which made up the village, and all the families were connected more or less closely by marriage. Silindu was a cousin of the wife of Babahami, the head man, who lived in the adjoining compound. Babahami had been made a head man because he was the only man in the village who could write his name. He was a very small man, and was known as Punchi Arachi, the little Arachi. Years ago, when a young man, he had gone on a pilgrimage to the Vihari at the Meta Mahanuwara. He had fallen ill there, and had stayed for a month or two in the priest's pensala. The priest had taught him his letters, and he had learned enough to be able to write his own name. Silindu was a cultivator, like the other villagers. The village called him Tikak Pisu, slightly mad. Even in working in the china he was the laziest man in the village. His real occupation was hunting. That is to say, he shot deer and pig with a long, muzzle-loading gas-pipe gun, whenever he could creep up to one in the thick jungle, or lying by the side of a water-hole at night, shoot down some beast who had come there to drink. Why this silent little man with the pinched-up face of a grey monkey, and the long, silent, sliding step, should be thought slightly mad, was not immediately apparent. He seemed only, at first sight, a little more taciturn and inert than the other villagers, but the village had its reasons. Silindu slept with his eyes open, like some animals, and very often he would moan, whine, and twitch in his sleep like a dog. He slept as lightly as a deer, and would start up from the heaviest sleep, in an instant fully awake. When not in the jungle, he squatted all day long in the shadow of his hut, staring before him, and no one could tell whether he was asleep or awake. Often you would have to shout at him and touch him before he would attend to what you had to say. But the strangest thing about him was this, that although he knew the jungle better than any man in the whole district, and although he was always wandering through it, his fear of it was great. He never attempted to explain or deny this fear. When other hunters laughed at him about it, all he would say was, I am not afraid of any animal in the jungle, no, not even the bear or of the solitary elephant, whom all of you really fear, but I am afraid of the jungle. But though he feared it, he loved it in a strange, unconscious way in the same unconscious way in which the wild buffalo loves the wallow, and the leopard his lair among the rocks. Silent, inert, and sullen, he worked in the china or squatted about his compound. But when he started for the jungle, he became a different man. With slightly bent knees and toes turned out, he glided through the impenetrable scrub with a long, slinking stride, which seemed to show at once both the fear and the joy in his heart. And Silindu's passions, his anger and his desire, were strange and violent even for the jungle. It was not easy to rouse his anger. He was a quiet man, who did not easily recognize the hand which wronged him. But if he were roused, he would sit for hours or days motionless in his compound, his mind moving vaguely with hatred, and then suddenly he would rise and search out his enemy, and fall upon him like a wild beast. And sometimes at night a long-drawn howl would come from Silindu's hut, and the villagers would laugh and say, Hark, the leopard is with his mate. And the women next morning, when they saw Dingihami drawing water from the tank, would jeer at her. At length Dingihami bore twins, two girls of whom one was called Punchimanika, and the other Hinihami. When the women told Silindu that his wife was delivered of two girls, he rushed into the hut and began to beat his wife on the head and breasts as she lay on the mat, crying, Vessi, Vessi, Mao, 
where is the son who is to carry my gun into the jungle and who will clear the china for me do you bear me vessi for me to feed and clothe and provide dowries curse you and this was the beginning of Silindu's quarrel with babahami the head man for babahami hearing the cries of dingihami and the other women rushed up from the adjoining compound and dragged Silindu from the house dingihami died two days after giving birth to the twins Silindu had a sister called Carlina Hami, who lived in a house at the other end of the village. Misfortune had fallen upon her, the misfortune so common in the life of a jungle village. Her husband had died of fever two months before. A month later she bore a child which lived but two weeks. When Dingy Hami died, Silindu brought her to his hut to bring up his two children her hut was abandoned to the jungle when the next rains fell the mud walls crumbled away the tattered roof fell in the jungle crept forward into the compound and over the ruined walls and when punchy manika was two years old only a little mound in the jungle marked the place where carlina hami's house had stood carlina hami was a short dark stumpy woman with large impassive eyes set far apart from one another, flat, broad cheeks, big breasts, and thick legs. Unlike her brother, she was always busy, sweeping the house and compound, fetching water from the tank, cooking and attending to the children. Very soon after she came to Silindu's house, she began to talk and think of the children as though she had borne them herself. Like her brother, she was slow and sparing of speech, and her eyes often had in them the look, so often in his, as if she were watching something far away in the distance. She very rarely took much part in the interminable gossip of the other village women when they met at the tank or outside their huts. This gossip is always connected with their husbands and children, food and quarrels. But Carlina Hami was noted for her storytelling. She was never very willing to begin, but often after the evening meal had been eaten, the women and many of the men would gather in Silindu's compound to listen to one of her stories. They sat round the one room or outside round the door, very still and silent, listening to her droning voice as she squatted by the fire and stared out into the darkness. Outside lay Silindu, apparently paying no attention to the tale. The stories were either old tales which she had learned from her mother, or were stories usually about Buddha, which she had heard told by pilgrims round the campfire on their way to pilgrimages, or in the Matamas, or pilgrims' resting places at festivals. These tales and a curious droning chant with which she used to sing them to sleep were the first things that the two children remembered this chant was peculiar to carlina hami and no other woman of the village used it she had learned it from her mother the words ran thus sleep child sleep against my side ayo ayo the weary way you've cried hush child hush pressed close against my side ayo ayo will the trees never end our women's feet are weary o great one send night upon us that our wanderings may end hush child hush thy father leads the way thy mother's feet are weary but the day will end somewhere for the followers in the way ayo ayo the way is rough and steep ayo the thorns are sharp the river steep but the night comes at last so sleep child sleep until punchy manika and hinihami were three years old Silindu appeared not even to be aware of their existence he took no notice of them in the house or compound and never spoke about them but one day he was sitting in front of his hut staring into the jungle 
when punchy manika crawled up to him and put her hand on his knee and looked solemnly up into his face Cylindu looked down at her took her by her hands and stood her up between his two knees he stared vacantly into her eyes for some time and then suddenly he began to speak to her in a low voice little toad why have you left the pond isn't there food there for your little belly rice and coconuts and mangoes and little cakes of curacon is the belly full that you have left the pond for the jungle foolish little toad the water is good but the trees are evil you have come to a bad place of dangers and devils yesterday little toad i lay under a domba tree by the side of a track my gun in my hand waiting for what might pass the devils are very angry in the jungle for there has been no rain now for these three months the water-holes are dry the leaves and grass are brown the deer are very thin and the fawns dropped this year are dying of weakness and hunger and thirst therefore the devils are hungry and there is nothing more terrible than a hungry devil well there i lay flat on the ground with my gun in my hand and i saw on the opposite side of the track lying under a dumba tree a leopardess waiting for what might pass i put down my gun and sister i said is the belly empty for her coat was mangy and the belly caught up below as though with pain yako he devil she answered three days now i have killed but one thin gray monkey and there are two cubs in the cave to be fed yakini she devil i said there are two little toads at home to be fed but i still have a handful of curacon in my hut from which my sister can make cakes it remains from last year's china and after it is eaten there will be nothing the headman too is pressing for the three shillings body tax how i say to him can there be money when there is not even food but the curacon will last until the next poya day therefore your hunger is greater than mine the first kill is yours so we lay still a long time and at last i heard far away the sound of a hoof upon a dry stick sister i whispered i hear a deer coming this way yako have you no ears she said a long while now i have been listening to a herd of wild pig coming down wind can you not even now hear their strong breathing and their rooting in the dry earth and the patter of the young one's feet on the dry leaves yakini i said for i heard her teeth clicking in the darkness the ear of the hungry is in the belly the sound of your teeth can be heard a who cries distance away so we lay still again and at last the herd of pigs came down the track first came an old boar very black his tusks shining white in the shadows then many sows and young boars and here and there the little pigs running in and out among the sows and as they passed one of the little pigs ran out near the dumba bush and yakini sprang and caught it in her teeth and leapt with it into the branch of a palu tree which overhung the path there she sat and the little pig in her mouth screamed to its mother then all the little pigs ran together screaming and stood on one side near the bush where i lay and the great boars and the young boars and sows ran round the palo tree looking up at yakini and making a great noise and the old sow who had borne the little pig in yakini's mouth put her four feet against the trunk of the tree and looked up and said come down yakini she devil thief are you afraid of an old tuskless sow come down but the leopardess laughed and bit the little pig in the back behind the head until it died and she called down to the old sow go your way mother there are two cubs at home in the cave and they are very hungry every year i drop but one or two cubs in the cave but the whole jungle swarms with your spawn. I see eight brothers and sisters of your child there by the Dumba bush. Go your way, lest I choose another for my mate. 
also i do not like her man's teeth the old boar and the sows were very angry and for a long while they ran round the tree and tore at it with their tusks and looked up and cursed yakini but yakini sat and watched them and licked the blood which dripped from the little pig's back i too lay very still under my doomba bush for there is danger in an angry herd at last the old boar became tired and he gathered the little pigs together in the middle of the herd and led them away down the track then yakini dropped to the ground and bounded away into the jungle carrying the little pig in her mouth so you see little crow it is a bad place to which you have come be careful or some other devil will drop on you out of a bush and carry you off in his mouth while Silindu had been speaking hinihami had crawled and tottered across the compound to join her sister at the end of his long story she was leaning against his shoulder from that day he seemed to regard the two children differently from the rest of the world in which he lived he was never tired of pouring out to them in a low monotonous drone his thoughts opinions and doings that they did not understand a word of what he said did not trouble him in the least but when they grew old enough to understand and to question him he began to take a new pleasure in explaining to them the world in which he lived it was a strange world a world of bare and brutal facts of superstition of grotesque imagination a world of trees and the perpetual twilight of their shade a world of hunger and fear and devils where a man was helpless before the unseen and unintelligible powers surrounding him he would go over to them again and again in the season of drought the reckoning of his small store of grain and the near approach of the time when it would be exhausted his perpetual fear of hunger his means and plans for obtaining just enough for existence until the next china season but above all his pleasure seemed to be to tell them of the jungle of his wanderings in search of game of his watchings by the water-holes at night of the animals and devils which lived among its shadows end of chapter one Chapter Two of The Village in the Jungle by Leonard Wolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. So Punchy Manika and Hinihami grew up to be somewhat different from the other village children, who crawl and play about the compounds, always with the women and always listening to women's gossip long before they had grown strong and big enough to go down in the morning and evening with carla nahami to the tank and to carry back on their heads the red earthenware water-pots they had learnt from selindu to sit by his side for hour upon hour through the hot afternoons very still and very silent while he stared silently before him or droned out his interminable tales they grew up to be strange and silent children sitting one on either side of him in a long thoughtless trance and they learnt to believe all he told them about the strange world of jungle which surrounded them the world of devils animals and trees but above all they learnt to love him blindly as a dog loves his master when they grew old enough to trot along by his side selindu used to take them out with him into the jungle the villagers were astonished and shocked but selindu went his own way he showed them the water-holes upon the rocks the thick jungle where the elephant hides himself from the heat of the day strolling leisurely among the trees and breaking off great branches to feed upon the leaves as he strolls the wallow of the buffalo and the caves where the bear and the leopard make their lairs he showed them the 
samber lying during the day in the other great caves they dashed out tens and tens of them like enormous bats from the shadow of the overhanging rocks to disappear with a crash into the jungle below he taught them to walk so that no leaf rustled or twig snapped under their feet to creep up close to the deer and the samber and the pig they were surprised at first that the animals in the jungle did not speak to them as they always did to selindu when he was alone but selindu explained it to them you are very young he said you do not know the tracks you are strange to the beast but they know me i have grown old among the tracks a man must live many years in the jungle before the beasts speak to him or he can understand what they say punchy maniki and hinny hami were also unlike the other village children in appearance they like selindu never had fever and even in the days of greatest scarcity karlina hami had seen that they got food karlina hami was far more careful to wash them than most mothers are she used to quote the saying dirt is bad and children are trouble but a dirty child is the worst of troubles the result was that they never got parangi or the swollen belly and pale skin of fever their skin was smooth and blooming it shone with a golden colour like the coat of a fawn when the sun shines on it their eyes were large and melancholy like the eyes of buddha in the jataka they were like two windows made of sapphire shining in a golden palace their limbs were strong and straight for their wanderings with selindu had made their muscles firm as a man's not soft like the woman's who sit about in the compound cooking and gossiping and sleeping all day there was therefore considerable jealousy among the women and ill feeling against carla nahami when they saw how her foster children were growing up when they were ten or eleven years old it often burst out against her in angry taunts at the tank oh carla nahami nan kohami the headman's wife would say you are growing an old woman and alas childless but you have done much for your brother's children shameless they must be to leave it to you to fetch the water from the tank and not to help you this is the fourth chatty full you are carrying to-day i have seen it with these eyes the lot of the childless woman is a hard one see how my little one of eight years helps me nan kohami your tongue is still as sharp as chilies punchy manika has gone with my brother and hinny hami is busy in the house punchy manika wants but three things to make her a man i pity you carlin nahami to live in the house of a madman and to bring up his children shameless having no children of your own they are veda children and will be veda women wandering in the jungle like men the other women laughed and ango hami a dirty shrivelled woman with thin shrivelled breasts called out in a shrill voice why should we suffer these vedas in the village their compound smells of their own droppings and of the offal and rotten meat on which they feed i have borne six children and the last died but yesterday in the morning he was well then selindu cast the evil eye upon him as he passed our door and in the evening he was dead they wither our children that their own may thrive you lie said carla nahami roused for the moment by this abuse you lie mother of dirt yesterday at this hour i saw your poti sinho here in the tank pale and shivering with fever and pouring the cold tank water over himself how should such a mother keep her children all know that you have borne six and that all are dead what did you ever give them but foul words go and lie with your brother the madman the veda the pariah shrieked angohami as carla nahami turned to go go to your brother of the evil eye you blighter of others children eater of awful vesi vesiga mau go to him of the evil eye belly beliga dua go to your brother ayo ayo my little podi sinho i am a mother only of the dead 
a mother of six dead children look at my breasts shrivelled and milkless i say to the father of my child father of podi sinho i say there is no cura khan in the house there is no millet and no pumpkin not even a pinch of salt three days now i have eaten nothing but jungle leaves there is no milk in my breast for the child then i get foul words and blows does the rain come in august he says can i make the curacan flower in july hold your tongue you fool august is the month in which the children die what can i do then comes fever and Salindu's evil eye curse him and the little ones die ayo ayo your man is right said nan kohami this is the month when the children die last year in this month i buried one and my brother's wife another good rain never falls now and there is always hunger and fever the old die and the little ones with them the father of my children has but nine houses under him and makes but five shillings a year from his headmanship his father's father who was headman before him had thirty houses in his headmanship and twenty shillings were paid him by the government every year besides twenty-four caroonies of paddy from the fields below the tank i have not seen rice these five years the headman now gives all and receives nothing here one of the women laughed you may well laugh podi nona she continued did not he lend your man last year twenty caroonies of korakan and as a grain of it come back to our house and selindu owes another thirty and came but yesterday for more and angohami there who whines about her podi sinho her man has had twenty-five karunis since the reaping of the last crop these words of nankohami were not without effect an uneasy movement began among the little group of women at the mention of debts clothes were gathered up the chatties of water placed on their heads and they began to move away out of reach of the sharp tongue of the headman's wife and as they moved away up the small path which led from the tank to the compounds they murmured together that non kohami did not seem to remember that they had to repay two karunis of, of kurakan for every karuni lent to them nan kohami had touched the mainspring upon which the life of the village worked debt the villagers lived upon debt and their debts were the main topic of their conversation a good kurakan crop from two to four acres of jenna would be sufficient to support a family for a year but no one not even the headman ever enjoyed the full crop which he had reaped at the time of reaping a band of strangers from the little town of kambura pitaya thirty miles away would come into the village mohammadu lebi aha madu kasim the moor man booty keeper had supplied clothes to be paid for in grain with a hundred per cent interest at the time of reaping the fet sin halis mudalali kadikaraji alas apu had supplied grain and curry stuffs on the same terms and among a crowd of smaller men the sly-faced low-caste man who called himself ach jige don andres his real name andresa would have revealed his caste who dressed in dirty white european trousers and a coat was the agent of the tavern-keeper in kamburu pitaya from whom the villagers had taken on credit the native spirit made from the juice of the coconut flowers to be drunk at the time of marriages the villagers neither obtained nor expected any pity from this horde with the reaping of the chenas came the settlement of debts with their little greasy notebooks full of unintelligible letters and figures they descended upon the chenas and after calculations wranglings and abuse which lasted for hour after hour the accounts were settled and the strangers left the village their carts loaded with pumpkins sacks of grain and not infrequently the stalks of indian hemp which by government order no man may grow or possess for the man that smokes it becomes mad and when the strangers had gone the settlement with the headman began for the headman on a small scale lent grain on the same terms in times of scarcity or when seed was wanted to sow the chenas 
in the end the villager carried but little grain from his chenna to his hut very soon after the reaping of the crop he was again at the headman's door begging for a little curacan to be repaid at the next harvest or tramping the thirty miles to kamburupitaya to hang about the bazaar until the mudalali agreed once more to enter his name in the greasy notebook with the traders in kambarupitaya the transactions were purely matters of business but with the headman the whole village recognized that they were something more it was a very good thing for baba hami the arachchi to feel that selindu owed him many karunis of kurakan which he could not repay when baba hami wanted some one to clear a jenna for him he asked selindu to do it and selindu remembering the debt dared not refuse when selindu shot a deer for which offence the arak chi should have brought him before the police court at kambaru pataya he remembered his debt and the first thing he did was to carry the best piece of meat as an offering to the headman's house and baba hami was a quiet cunning man in the village he never threatened and rarely talked of his loans to his debtors but there were few in the village who dared to cross him and who did not feel hanging over them the power of the little man the power which they felt hanging over them was by no means imaginary it could make the life of the man who offended the headman extremely unpleasant it was not only by his loans that baba hami had his hand upon the villagers their daily life could be made smooth or difficult by him at every turn the life of the village and of every man in it depended upon the cultivation of jennas a jenna is merely a piece of jungle which every ten years is cleared of trees and undergrowth and sown with grain broadcast and with vegetables the villagers owned no jungle themselves it belonged to the crown and no one might fell a tree or clear a jenna in it without a permit from the government it was through these permits that the headman had his hold upon the villagers application for one had to be made through him it was he who reported if a clearing had been made without one or if a man having been given one cleared more jungle than it allowed him to clear every one in the village knew well that baba hani's friends would find no difficulty in obtaining the authority to clear a jenna and that the agent hamadoru would never hear from baba hami whether they had cleared four acres or eight but the life of the unfortunate man who had offended the headman would be full of dangers and difficulties the permit applied for by him would be very slow in reaching his hands when it did reach his hands if he cleared half an acre more than it allowed him to clear his fine would be heavy and will betide him if he rashly cleared a jenna without a permit at all baba hami had never liked selindu who was a bad debtor selindu was too lazy even to cultivate a jenna properly and even in a good year his crop was always the smallest in the village he was always in want and always borrowing and baba hami found it no easy task to gather in principal and interest after the boutique keepers from kamburu pitaya had taken their dues and he was not an easy man to argue with if he wanted a loan he would unheeding of any excuse or refusal hang about the headman's door for a whole day but if it were a case of repayment he would sit staring over his creditor's head listening without a sign or a word to the quiet persuasive arguments of the headman the headman's dislike became more distinct after the birth of punchi manika and hini hami selindu had resented his interference between him and his wife and when dingi hami died bitter words had passed between them though selindu soon forgot them baba hami did not for years selindu did not realize what was taking place but he vaguely felt that life was becoming harder for him a month after dingi hami's death his store of grain was exhausted and it became necessary for him to begin his yearly borrowings accordingly he took his gun and went in the evening to the nearest water-hole to wait for deer the first night he was unsuccessful no deer came to drink but on the second he shot a doe 
he skinned the deer cut it up and carried the meat to his hut he then carefully chose the best piece of meat and took it with him to baba hami's house the headman was squatting in his doorway chewing patel his little eyes twinkled when he saw salindu with the meat rala hami said salindu stopping just outside the door yesterday i was in the jungle collecting damba fruit what else is there to eat when i smelt the smell of something dead some fathoms away i searched about and, and soon i came upon the carcass of a doe killed by a leopard the marks of his claws were under the neck and the belly was eaten the meat i have brought to my house this piece is for you the headman took the meat in silence and hung it up in the house he fetched a chew of batel and gave it to selindu the two men then squatted down one on each side of the door for a long time neither spoke their chewing was only interrupted every now and then by the ejection of a jet of red saliva at last baba hami broke the silence four days ago i was in kamburu pitaya i was called to the kachacheri there they asked me two phantoms in the bazaar for a coconut ay yo i have not seen a coconut for two years two phantoms at last and last year at this time they were but one phantom each in the bazaar i met the kerala mahatmaya the kerala mahatmaya is a hard man he said to me arachchi there are guns in your village for which no permit has been given by the agent hamadoru i said to him ralahami if there be the fault is not mine then he said the order has come from the agent hamadoru to the disa mahatmaya that if one gun be found without permit in a headman's village there will be trouble both for the arachchai and the kerala now the disa mahatmaya is a good man but the kerala is hard and they say in kamburipitaya that the agent hamadoru is very hard and strict and goes round the villages searching for guns for which no permits have been given they say too that he will come this way next month there was a short silence and then baba hami continued it is five months Linda, since i told you to take a permit for your gun and you have not done so yet the time to pay three shillings has gone by and you will now have to pay four the kerala is a hard man and the agent hamadoru will come next month Selindu salaamed rala hami i am a poor man how can i pay four shillings or even three there is not a phantom in the house there was a permit taken two years ago you are my father and my mother i will hide the gun in a place that only i know of and if it be taken or question be made is it not easy to say that the stock was broken and it was not considered necessary to take a permit for a broken gun but the argument which before had been successful but with baba hami now seemed to have lost its strength a permit is required it is the order of government i have told you the kerala is a hard man and he is angry with me because i brought him but two coconuts as a present whereas other arach cheese bring him an amanum of patty for i too am a poor man selindu sat in helpless silence the hopelessness of raising two rupees to pay for a gun license for the moment drove out of his mind the object of his coming to baba hami's house all that he felt was the misery of a new misfortune and as was his nature he sat dumb under it at last however the pressing need of the moment again recurred to him and he started in the tortuous way habitual to villagers to approach the subject Ralahami, is there any objection to my clearing nugaga ha henna next jenna season there are three months before the jenna season why think of that now when the belly is empty the mouth talks of rice last year my jenna crop was bad there was but little rain and the elephants broke in and destroyed much kurakan the lord buddha himself would be powerless against the elephants Selindu got up as if to go he took a step towards the stile which led into the compound and then turned back as if he had just remembered something and began in a soft wheedling voice rala hami there is nothing to eat in the house there is karlina hami to feed too if you could but lend me ten kurunis i would repay it twofold at the reaping of nugaga ha henna baba hami chewed for some minutes and then spat with great deliberation i have no grain to lend now selindu 
rallahami it is only ten karunis i'm asking for only ten karunis and surely the barn behind your house is full there is very little grain in the barn now and what there is will not last me until the reaping of the next crop there is the old man my father to be fed and my wife and her brother and the two children will you let me die of hunger and my two children give but five karunis and i will repay it threefold if you had come last poya selindu i could have given it but i owed fifteen rupees to nandayas the booty keeper in kamburu pitaya for clothes and i took kuru khan to pay it the barn is all but empty ayo we must die of hunger then give but one measure and i will repay one karuni at next reaping i paid away all my grain that was in the barn the grain which remains is my father's and he keeps it for his use you must go to the mudalali in kambura pataya Salindu, and borrow from him and when you go there remember you must take a permit for the gun Salindu felt that he had nothing more to say he had the meat at home which he would dry and take to kamburu pitaya and sell in the bazaar then he would have to borrow from the muda lali who knew him too well to give anything but ruinous terms perhaps in that way he would manage to return to the village with a few karunis of Karakun and a gun license he walked slowly away from the headman's compound babahami's little eyes twinkled as he saw Slendu move away and he smiled to himself End of chapter two chapter three of the village in the jungle by leonard wolf this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three selindu made the journey to kamburu pataya obtained the license for his gun and some grain but life continued to become harder for him the headsman's ill-feeling worked against him unostentatiously and in all sorts of little things he never thought about the motives and intentions of those around him and babahami always had some excuse for refusing a loan or pressing for payment of the body tax he did not become conscious of babahami's enmity or aware that many of the difficulties of his life were due to it the collection of the body tax was a good example of the way in which the headman worked against him every villager had to pay the three shilling tax or do work on the roads work which was the worst of hardships to them it had always been babahami's custom to pay himself the tax for each villager and then recover what he had paid with heavy interest out of the crops at the time of reaping before some years after dingihami's death selindu found that when the time to pay the tax came round babahami was always short of money selindu never had any money himself and he was therefore compelled to work upon the roads as the years passed he became more sullen more taciturn and more lazy some evil power one of the unseen powers which he could not understand was he felt perpetually working against him he tried to escape from it or at any rate to forget it by leaving the village for the jungle he would disappear for days together into the jungle living upon roots and the fruit of jungle trees and anything which might fall to his gun he talked with no one except punchy manika and hinihami for them he never had a harsh word and it was seldom that he returned to the hut without bringing them some wild fruit or a comb of the wild honey gradually the hut of the vedas as they were nicknamed seemed to the other villagers to fall under a cloud the headman's enmity and the strange ways of selindu formed a bar to intercourse and so it came about that punchy manika and hinihami grew up somewhat outside of the ordinary life of the village the strangeness and wildness of their father hung about them as the other women said of them they grew up in the jungle and not in the village but with their strangeness and wildness went a simplicity of mind and of speech which showed in many ways but above all in their love for selindu and each other their lives were harder even than those of the other village women as they became older the fear of hunger became more and more present with them 
when selindu was away from the village they were often compelled to live upon the fruits and leaves and roots which they gathered themselves in the jungle and when the cheno season began they worked like the men and boys in the chenas they cut down the undergrowth and burnt it they cleared the ground and sowed the grain they lay out all night in the watch huts to scare away the deer and wild pig which came to damage the crop when they were fifteen baban apu the brother of nang johami came to live in his brother-in-law's the headman's house he had previously lived in another house with his father an old man toothless and brainless when the old man whom he had supported died he abandoned his hut and came to live with his sister and her husband the number of houses in the village thus sank to eight at that time baban apu was twenty-one years old he was tall for a sinhalese broad-shouldered and big-boned his skin was a dark chocolate brown his face oval his nose small his lips full and sensual his expression was curiously virile and simple but his brown eyes which were large and oval shaped swept it at moments with something soft languorous and feminine this impression of a mixture of virility and femininity was heightened by the long hair which he tied in a knot at the back of his head after the custom of villagers he was noted for his strength his energy and his good humour the minds of most villagers are extraordinarily tortuous and suspicious but by ban was remarkable for his simplicity it used to be said of him in the village baban's apu could not cheat a child but a child who had not learnt to talk could cheat baban apu for two years baban had lived in the hut adjoining cylinders without ever speaking more than a word or two to punchy manika but her presence began to move him strongly his lips parted and his breathing became fast and deep as he saw her move about the compound he watched in painful excitement her swelling breasts and the fair skin which went into soft folds at her hips when she bent down for anything one night in the chessa season punchy manika had been watching the crop of her father's jenna it lay three miles away from the village at some distance from any other jenna the track therefore which led from it to the village was used by no one except herself her father and sister in the early morning she started back to the hut there had been rain during the night and the jungle was fresh and green that freshness which the time of rain brings for so brief a time was upon all things the jungle was golden with the great hanging clusters of the cassia flowers the bushes were starred with the white caramba flowers and splashed with masses of white and purple catan the grey monkeys leaped shrieking and mocking from bough to bough the jungle was filled with the calling of the jungle fowl and the wild cries of the peacocks from the distance came the trumpeting and shrieking of a herd of elephants as punchy manika passed a bush she heard from behind it the clashing of horns very quietly she peered round two stags were fighting the tines of the horns interlocked up and down backwards and forwards snorting panting and straining they struggled for the doe which stood grazing quietly beside punchy manika had crept up very quietly but the doe became uneasy lifted her head and looked intently at the bush behind which punchy manika crouched she approached the bush slowly stamping the ground angrily from time to time and uttering the sharp shrill call of alarm but the bucks fought on up and down the open space punchy manika laughed as she turned away fear nothing sister she said there is no leopard crouching for you fight on brothers for the prize is fair punchy manika walked slowly on down the track the blood in her veins moved strangely stirred by the stirring life around her the trumpet call of the sambar blared through the jungle a terrific cry of desire the girl who had heard it unmoved thousands of times before started at the sound of it a sense of uneasiness came over her suddenly she stopped at the sight of something which moved behind a bush down the track she stood trembling as baban came out of the jungle and walked towards her his eyes were very bright his teeth showed white between his parted lips the long black hair upon his breast glistened with sweat he stood in front of her punchy manika he said i have come to you ayo she answered i was very frightened i thought you were a devil of the trees crouching there for me behind the bushes even when we were little children our father warned us against the devils that would leap upon us from the bushes i have come to you come with me out of the path into the thick jungle last night i could not sleep for thinking of you 
so i came in the early morning along the path to meet you on your way from the chenna i cannot sleep punchy manika for thinking of you i have watched you in the compound and at the tank your fair skin and the little breasts do not fear i will not hurt you punchy manika but come come quickly out of the path a strange feeling of excitement came over the girl of joy and fear as baban leaned towards her and put out his hand to take her by the wrist a great desire to fly from him and at the same time to be caught by him came over her she stood looking down until his fingers touched her skin then with a cry she broke from him and ran down the track to the village she heard his breathing very close to her as she ran and when she looked round over her shoulder she felt his breath on her face saw his bright eyes and great lips through which the teeth shone white another moment and she felt the great strength of his arms as he seized her he held her close to him by the wrists why do you run why are you frightened punchy manika i will not hurt you she allowed him to take her into the thick jungle but she struggled with him and her whole body shook with fear and desire as she felt his hands upon her breasts a cry broke from her in which joy and desire mingled with the fear and the pain ayo ayo end of chapter three chapter four of the village in the jungle by leonard wolf this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four in towns and large villages there are especially among people of the higher castes many rigid customs and formalities regarding marriages always observed it is true that the exclusion of women no longer exists but young girls after puberty are supposed to be kept within the house and only to meet men of the immediate family a marriage is arranged formally a formal proposal is made by the man's father or mother to the girl's father or mother there are usually long negotiations and bargainings between the two families over the dowry when at last the preliminaries are settled and the wedding day arrives it is a very solemn and formal affair all the members of each family are invited the bridegroom goes with his friends and relations to the house of the bride and then conducts her in procession followed by the guests to his own house much money is spent upon entertaining and new clothes and presents but in villages like Bedagama, these customs and formalities are often not observed the young girls are not kept within the house they have to work the young men know them and often choose for themselves there is no family arrangement no formal proposal of marriage the villagers are too poor for there to be any question of a dowry and yet the villager makes a clear distinction between marriage and what he calls concubinage in the former the woman is recognized by his and her families as his wife almost invariably she is openly taken to his house and there is a procession and feasting on the wedding day in the latter the woman is never publicly recognized as a wife marriage is considered to be more respectable than concubinage and in the headman's immediate family it would be more usual to find the women recognized wives than unrecognized wives and though in the ordinary village life the unrecognized wife is as common as or even more common than the recognized wife and is treated by all exactly as if she were the man's wife yet the distinction is understood and becomes apparent upon formal occasions for instance a woman who is living with a man as his unrecognized wife cannot be present at her sister's wedding when a man takes a woman to live with him in this informal way the arrangement is however regarded as in many ways a formal one a slightly lower form than the recognized marriage the man and the woman are of the same caste always there would even be strong objection on the part of the man or woman's relations if either the one or the other did not come from a respectable family 
baban knew well his brother-in-law's dislike of selindu and the contempt with which the vedas were regarded by the other villagers he knew that his sister and baba hami would be very angry with him if he chose a wife from such a family but he had watched punchy manika and gradually a love which was more than mere desire had grown up in him the wildness and strangeness of her father and of hini hami were tempered in her by a wonderful gentleness passion and desire were strong in him they would allow no interference with his determination to take her to live with him the night after his meeting with punchy manika on the path from the chenna he broke the news to nang Hami and baba Hami as he and his brother-in-law were eating the evening meal sister he said it is time that i took a wife nancho hami laughed there is no difficulty when you go to the chenna the women look after you and smile and say chi chi there goes a man oh that he would take my daughter to his house but there are no women for you here they are all sickly things unfit to bear you children my father's brother married a woman of kotagoda said baba hami in those days wives brought dowers with them a land he went to live on her land at kotagoda it lies fifty miles away towards rahuna his sons and daughters are married now in the village and have children they are rich it is a good village rain falls there and there are coconut lands and paddy grows the village spreads and prospers and the headman is a rich man they say that taxes paid upon sixty men every year it would be a good thing for you to take a wife from there for she would bring you a dowry yes said nancho hami it would be a good thing for you to go to kotagoda and take a woman from there a daughter of my man's brother she would bring you land and you could settle there what use is it to live in this village even the chenna crops wither for want of rain it is an evil place this i want no woman of kotagoda said baban nor will i leave the village there is a woman this punchy manika the daughter of selindu i am going to take her to live with me baba hami looked at his brother-in-law his little eyes moving restlessly in astonishment and anger nancho hami threw up her hands and began in a voice which shrilled and fluted with anger oh hey so we are to take vedas into the house and i am to call a pariah sister a fine and a rich wife a pariah woman a veda a daughter of a dog vessi the siga dua el hey the headman's brother is to marry a sweeper of jakes do you hear this will you allow these to mills in your house yes twill be a fine thing in the village to hear that the headman has given his wife and daughters to rodias leopards jackals baba hami broke in upon his wife's abuse but she now thoroughly aroused continued throughout the conversation to pour out a stream of foul words from the background in a voice which gradually rose shriller and shriller the woman is right baba hami said angrily to baban you cannot bring this woman to the house i will take no other woman i have watched her there about the compound she is fair and gentle she is unlike the other women of this village here he looked round at nanchahami in whose mouths are always foul words baba hami tried to hide his anger he knew his brother-in-law to be obstinate as well as good-humoured and simple no doubt the woman is fair but if you desire her is she not free to all to take does she not wander like a man in the jungle they say that even kings have desired rodaya women if you desire her it is not hard to take her but there need be no talk of marriage or bringing her to the house this morning i took her with me into the jungle but it is not enough the desire is still with me i have thought about it it is time that i took a wife to cook my food and bear me children i want no other than this i can leave your compound and build myself a new house and take her to live with me baba hami's anger began to break out again are you a fool will you take this beggar woman to be your wife is not her father always about my door crying for a handful of curacan fool i tell you my brother's children in kotagoda will bring you land paddy land and coconuts there is no difference between one woman and another i tell you i want no kotagoda woman i will take the daughter of selindu i want no strange woman of strange village i can build myself a house here and clear chenas as my father did and his father 
is it for this i took you into my house two years you have eaten my food how much of my curacan have you taken i have taken nothing from you i have worked two years in the chenna and the crop came to you not to me is not the grain now in your barn from the chenna cleared by me baba hami was too quiet and cunning often to give way to anger but this time he was carried away by the defiance of his brother-in-law whom he regarded as a fool he gesticulated wildly out of my house dog out of my house you shall bring no woman to my compound go and lie with the pariahs in their own fill baban got up and stood over baba hami i am going he said quietly and i will take panchi manika as my wife the abuse of the headman and his wife followed him out of the compound he walked slowly over to Salindu's hut he found Salindu squatting under a ragged mustard tree which stood in the compound and he squatted down by his side he did not like Salindu. he had always an uncomfortable feeling in the presence of this wild man who never spoke to any one unless he was spoken to and he felt it difficult to begin now upon the subject which had brought him to the compound Salindu paid no attention to him baban sat there unable to begin listening to the sounds of the women in the hut at last he said Salindu, i have come to speak to you about your daughter punchy manika Salindu remained quite still he apparently had not heard baban touched him on the arm i am talking of your daughter Salindu punchy manika Salindu turned and looked at him the girl is in the house what have you to do with her i want you to listen to me Salindu, for there is much to say i have watched the girl from the headman's compound and a charm has come upon me i cannot eat or sleep for thinking of her so i said to my sister my sister's husband it is time for me to take a wife and now i will bring this girl into the compound but they were very angry for they want to marry me to a woman of goda goda because of the land which she would bring as dowry to-night they abused me and there was a quarrel i have left their compound now i will make myself a house in the old compound where my father lived and i will take the girl there as my wife Salindu had become more and more attentive as he listened to baban the words seemed to distress him he shifted about fidgeted with his hands scratched himself all over his body when baban stopped he took some time before he said the girl is too young to be given to a man baban laughed the girl has attained her age she is older than many a woman who has a husband the girl is too young i cannot give her to you or evil will come of it baban's patience began to be exhausted his good humour had been done disturbed during the scene in the headman's compound but this new obstacle began to rouse him his voice rose i cannot live without the girl i have quarrelled with my sister and the headman over her i have left the compound for her i ask no dowry why should you refuse her to me they call us vetas in the village while you are the headman's house does the leopard of the jungle mate with the dog of the village that is nothing to me the wild buffalo seeks the cows and the village herds the girl is very gentle and my mind is made up also the girl wishes to come to me the loud voices of the two men had reached the women in the house they had come out and stood listening behind the men at in the last words of baban Salindu cried out as if he had been struck ayo ayo they take even my daughter from me is there money in the house no is there rice no is there curacan or chilies or jaggery or salt even the house is empty but there is always something for the thief to find they creep in while i am away in the jungle they see the little ones whom i have fed the little ones who laughed and called me a pochi when i brought them fruits and honeycomb from the jungle they creep in like the hooded snake and steal them away from me i o i o the little ones laughed to go punchy manika rushed forward through herself to Salindu's feet which she touched and caressed with her hands she struck the ground several times with her forehead crying and wailing apochi apochi will you kill me with your words i will never leave you nor my sister baban turned upon her are the words in the jungle nothing then did you lie to me when you said you would come to my house they are right then when they say that women's words are lies in the morning one thing at night another did i not tell you that i cannot be without you Ayo, you told me there under the cassia tree that you would come to me and cook my rice in an evening i am homeless and without you i should go now in the jungle and hang myself baban moved away but karlina hami caught hold of his hand and pulled him back panchi manika threw herself on the ground again in front of Salindu. 
i poached she it is true i said i would go to him do not kill me with bitter words i must go i cannot be without him i gave my word what can i do panchi manika crouched down at solendu's feet he sat very still for a little while and then began in a low moaning voice did i not often tell you of the devils of the trees that lurk for you by the way i have stood by you against them in the day i have held you in my arms when they howled about the house at night i told you that the place is evil and evil comes from it they lie in the shadows of the trees and cast spells on you as you pass and now one has got you and you laugh to go from me they sit in the trees among the grey monkeys and laugh at me as i pass in the morning they howl at me among the jackals as i come back in the evening they take all from me and the house is very empty i poach ye the devils are not taking me i shall not leave you when you come from the jungle i should be here with my sister but the man has called to me and i must go to him the cub does not always remain in the cave by the father's side her time comes and she hears her mate call from the neighbouring rock she leaves her father's cave for another's but a poached she she will still look out for the old leopard when he returns she will live very close to him ayo ayo the house will be empty the doe cannot always stay with the herd she hears the call of the buck and they fly together into the jungle the house is empty there is no use for me to live now carla nahami who had been growing more and more impatient here broke in are you mad brother the child is a woman now and it is time to give her to a man is she to die childless because she has a father there is no need for her even to leave the compound there is room for baban to make himself a house here baban eagerly seized upon the suggestion he assured solander that he had no intention of taking panchimanika out of the compound panchimanika still crouching at his feet told her father that she would never leave him it was eventually arranged that for the present baban should live in the house while he put up another house for himself and punchy manika Selindu took no part in the discussion after carlin ahami intervened he became silent there was nothing for him to do or to say which could help him it was only one more of the evils which inevitably came upon him the talk died down the others went into the house to prepare the evening meal he sat on under the mustard tree staring at the outline of the trees against the starlit sky the silence of the jungle settled down upon the compound panchi manika brought him his food she tried to comfort him to get him to come into the house but for once she could not rouse him he sat in the compound through the night staring into the darkness and muttering from time to time ayo the house is empty End of chapter four chapter five part one of the village in the jungle by leonard wolf this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five part one Pabun put up a new hut in Selindu's compound and three weeks after he left his brother-in-law he and punchy manika began to live together in it it was the beginning of a far greater prosperity for the family baban worked hard he cleared his jenna and watched it well his crop was always the best in the village and the produce went with salindus into a barn which served in common for the whole compound salindu did not again refer to punchy manika's leaving him he seemed hardly to be aware of a bun's existence in the compound he very rarely addressed a word to him in fact he now scarcely ever spoke to any one except any hami when he came back to the compound from the jungle or from the chenas he never went into the new hut where punchy manika lived he never called her to him as he had been used to do if she came out in the evenings to sit with him and speak with him he answered her questions but he no longer poured out to her everything that was in his mind as he still did to hini hami it seemed as if he were unable to share her with another and punchy manika altered her blind love for her father and her sister remained but it was swamped by a fierce attachment to baban 
she felt the barrier which had grown up and separated her from selindu and in a less degree from hinihami and as her life became different she lost some of the wildness which had before belonged to her she began to lead a life more like the other village women she no longer went to or worked in the chenna the jungle began to lose its hold on her she had listened from the time when she first began to understand anything to the tales of her father and imperceptibly his views of life had become hers she and he were only two out of the countless animals which wander through the jungle continually beset by hunger and fear but as she became more and more separated from him and attached to baban this view of life always vague and unconsciously held became vaguer and dimmer the simplicity of baban reacted upon her she became the man's woman the cook of his food the cleaner of his house the bearer of his children there had always been considerable difference in character between hini mahami and panchimanika there was very little of her sister's gentleness in hini hami there was added to the strangeness and wildness which she derived from selindu a violence of feeling far greater than his you could see this in her eyes which gradually lost the melancholy of childhood and glowed with a fierce startled look through the long black hair which hung in disorder about her pale brown face the village women who never tired of following mancho hami's lead in jeering at carlinahami and punchimanika soon learned to respect the passionate anger which it was so easy to rouse in hini hami and the passion of her anger was equalled by the passion of her attachment to selindu and punchimanika the women soon learned that it was as dangerous to abuse in her presence her father or her sister as to risk a gibe at the girl herself it was always remembered in the village how when angohami once worked up by the bitterness of her own tongue raised her hand against panchimanika hinihami then a child of eight had seized the baby which the woman was carrying on her hip and flung it into the tank water hinihami had taken no part in the discussion about her sister's marriage but when baban took Punchy Manika to live with him in the hut which he had built she felt an instinctive dislike towards him a feeling that she was being robbed of something her father and her sister were everything to her for she had never felt for carlina hami the blind affection which she felt for them she could not understand therefore how Punchy Manika could turn from them to this man whom she had scarcely known the day before she saw and understood her father's anger and unhappiness but she could not turn against her sister something had happened which she did not understand an evil had come out of the jungle and such evils come if any one could be blamed it was the stranger baban but as her sister desired to go to him she put on one side her own feelings of anger against him she watched in silence the new house being put up and she watched in silence punchy manika leave the old hut for the new she felt as if she were losing something that her sister was going away from her and that her life had greatly altered she turned with an increased passion of attachment to her father she refused to allow carla nahami to cook his food for him if he went out alone in the jungle she would sit for hours in the compound watching the path by which she knew he would return and whenever he would allow her she followed him on his expeditions the marriage of punchy manika and baban created a great sensation in the village the headman and his wife did not at first hide their anger and the thought that they had been crossed was not unpleasant to many of the villagers moreover baban was liked and in many ways respected the contempt in which the vedas had been held could no longer be shown towards a compound where he had married and where he lived 
the compound was no longer avoided the men entered it now to see Baban, and the women began to come and gossip with punchy Monica. it was not in baba hami's nature to remain long openly an enemy of any one his cunning mind was inclined to and suited for intrigue he understood how much easier and more enjoyable it is to harm your enemy if he thinks that you are his friend than if he knows you are his enemy he was however too angry with baban for any open reconciliation he hid his anger and though he never went into baban's compound nor baban into his when they met in the village paths they spoke to one another as if there was nothing between them but he often thought over the reckoning which he was determined one day to have and it was sinlindu and his family who he made up his mind would feel it most heavily he was a man who never forgot what he considered a wrong done him he could wait long to repay a real or imaginary injury the repayment might be made in many divers ways but until it was repaid with interest his mind was unsatisfied as time passed lindu's family began again to enter into the ordinary village life it was natural therefore that the hesitation which the villager might have felt to take a wife from the family died down before baban's example people who live in towns can hardly realize how persistent and violent are the desires of those who live in villages like Betagama. in many ways and in this beyond all others they are very near to the animals in fact in this they are more brutal and uncontrolled than the brutes that while the animals have their seasons man alone is perpetually dominated by his desires any hummy both in face and form was more desirable than any of the other women it was about a year after the bun and punchy Monica began to live together that proposals began to be made about her there lived in one of the huts with his old mother a man called puncherala he was a tall thin dark man badly afflicted with barangi the naturally crafty look of his face had been intensified by an accident when a young man he had been attacked by a bear which met him crawling under the bushes in search of a hive of wild bees which he had heard in the jungle the bear mauled him and had left the marks of its teeth and claws upon his cheeks and forehead and partially destroyed his right eye the drooping lid of the injured eye gave him the appearance of perpetually and cunningly winking he had some reputation in the village as a veterala or doctor and also as a dealer in spells the result of his quarrel with his brother had made him feared and respected they had cultivated a chenna in common and a dispute had arisen over the division of the produce Panchirala considered himself to have been swindled he went out into the jungle and collected certain herbs leaves and fruit he put them in a coconut shell together with a lime and placed them at night in the corner of his brother's compound the next morning his brother was found to be lying unable to speak or move the wife and mother came and begged Panchirala to remove the spell he denied all knowledge of the matter and in three days his brother died the brother's share of the chenna produce was handed over to Pancharala, as no one else was inclined to run the risk of the curse which appeared to attach to it Pancharala was about thirty-eight years old the woman who had lived with him had died about a year previously and the marriage of Bavan had directed his attention towards hinihami his first proposals were made to the girl herself he was astonished by the fury with which they were rejected but he was not discouraged he watched for his opportunity and some days later when hini hami was not there he went to selindu's compound he found selindu sitting in the shadow of the hut i heard he said to him that you have an ulcer in your foot let me see Ayo, caused by a bad thorn here are some leaves i brought them with me they will do it good selindu had been unable to walk for some days owing to the swelling and pain he was very glad to show the foot to the veterala Pancharala sat down to examine it and carlo nahami and baban came out to see what was going on this was exactly what Pancharala wanted he heated the leaves by putting them in hot water which he made carlo nahami fetch he tied them on with such ceremony and then the whole party squatted down to talk this medicine i learned from my father he told them it is of great power 
it will draw the evil and the heat out of the foot into the leaves and to-morrow you will be able to walk the power of medicine and spells was a subject which never failed to appeal to carlin and hami they say your father was a great man and that in those days people came to the village from all sides for his medicine ah but he was a great man and i have all my knowledge from him now the government builds hospitals and makes people go to them and gives them government medicine which is useless and so our work is taken from us and people die of these foreign medicines but my father was a great man he knew of many charms one which would bring any woman to a man there is a tale about that charm in those days there lived a karala mahatmaya by the sea a big-bellied man a great lover of women down the coast beyond his village was a village in which only malay people live the malay women are before all others in beauty very fair with eyes shaped like pomegranate seeds they are mohammedan people and no sinhalese can approach their women for the men are very jealous and also strong and fearless they are bad men the kerala mahatmaya used to go to the village on government work and every time he walked through the street and saw the women peeping at him from the doorways and he saw their eyes shaped like pomegranate seeds shining beneath the cloths which covered their heads he was very troubled and longed to have a malay woman at last he could bear it no longer so he lay down in his house and sent a message to my father to say that he was very ill and that he should come to him at once then my father went three days journey to the kerala's house and when he came there the kerala mahatmaya sent all the women out of the house and he made my father sit down by his side and he said to him federala i am very ill i cannot sleep have a great desire day and night in me for a woman from the malay village along the coast i can get no pleasure from my own women but if i be seen even talking to a malay woman the men of the village would rise and beat me to death the desire is killing me now you i know have great skill and charms you must make me one therefore which will bring a malay woman to me to a place of which i will tell you then my father said hama doru i dare not do this for i must go and make the charm in the compound of the girl's house and i know these malay people they are very bad men if they catch me there they will kill me but the kerala mahatmaya said there is no need to fear there is a house at the end of the village standing somewhat apart from the others there lives in it a young girl unmarried a daughter of tuwan abdid i will take you there on a moonless night and you will make the charm there and if the next night the girl comes to me i will give you five pounds then my father thought if i refuse the kerala mahatmaya he will be angry and put me into trouble and ruin me and if i consent to his wish i will gain five pounds which is much money and possibly a beating from the malay men it is better to risk the beating so he agreed to make the charm on a moonless night then the kerala mahatmaya gave out that he was very ill and that my father was treating him and for three days my father lived in the house preparing the charm on the fourth day the kerala mahatmaya and my father taking cold cooked rice with them set out from the house saying they were going to my father's village for the treatment of the kerala with medicines in my father's house but after leaving the village they turned aside from the path and went secretly through the jungle to a cave near the malay village the cave was hidden in thick jungle and they lay there through the day when it was night and very dark they crept out and the kerala showed the house to my father my father stood in the garden of the house and made the charm and buried it in the earth of the garden and returned to the cave with the kerala mahatmaya all through the next day they lay in the cave and ate only the cold rice and the kerala mahatmaya talked much of the malay women and their eyes which were shaped like pomegranate seeds and in the evening at the time when the women go to draw water the girl came to the cave and the kerala mahatmaya enjoyed her then he sent her away and he called my father who was sitting outside in the jungle and told him that the girl was cross-eyed and ugly and not worth five pounds but at the most ten rupees he gave my father ten rupees and told him he would give the other forty some other time but the money was never paid next day they went back to the kerala's house and told a tale about how the kerala mahatmaya had got well on the way to my father's village and so they had returned at once but the girl had seen the kerala mahatmaya in the village and she recognized his black face and big belly 
and she told her mother how she had been charmed to go to the cave the mother told the malay men that they were very angry next time that the kerala mahatmaya went to their village they set upon him and beat him with clubs and sticks until he nearly died then they put him in a bullock cart and tied his hands together above his head to the hood of the cart and took him twelve miles into kamburu pitaya to the agent hamadoru and said that they had caught the kerala mahatmaya with a bag on his back stealing salt and there was a great case and a magistrate hamadoru believed the story of the kerala mahatmaya who had many witnesses to show that on the very day on which the girl said she had gone to the cave they had seen him on the road to my father's village so the malay men all were sent to prison but my father got a great name for all the country except the magistrate hamaduru knew of the charm by which he had brought the girl to the fat kerala mahatmaya in the cave did your father teach you the making of the charm asked karl linahami am i not a veterala and the son of a veterala the learning of the father is handed down to the son yes i remember hearing my mother speak of him there was no one in the district she said so skilled in charms and medicines as your father yes he knew many things which other veteralas know nothing of he had a charm by which devils are charmed to become the servants of the charmer he learnt it from a man of sinhala who lived long ago in the neighbouring village this man was called Tikiri banda and he wanted to marry the daughter of the headman the headman refused to give her and Tikiri banda being very angry put a charm upon a devil which lived in a banyan tree and the devil took a snake in his hand and touched the headman with it on the back as he passed under the tree in the dusk and the headman's back was bent into a bow for the rest of his days was that the village called bogama asked salunda who had listened with interest where the nuga trees now stand in the jungle to the south the last house was abandoned when i was a boy but the devil still dances beneath the nuga trees yes it was bogama it was a village like this in my father's time and in your father's time i can myself remember houses there near the nuga trees of course said kalinahami bodhi sinho's wife angohami came from there ayo when the jungle comes in how things are forgotten well well said the veterala the devils still dance under the trees though the men have gone the chenna crops were bad and every year the fever came it is the same now in this village the old medicines of the veteralas are no longer used but people go to the towns and hospitals for these foreign medicines but they die very quickly and where there was a village there are only trees and devils the little group was silent for a while nothing could be heard but the sigh of the wind among the trees for miles around them then the veterala began to speak again yes that was a wonderful charm the headman walked bow-backed for the rest of his life because he would not give the girl i yield it is always the women who bring trouble to us men and yet what can a man do a man without a wife they say is only half a man there is no comfort in a house where there is no woman to cook the meal there is no need to use your charm veterala said karlinahami if you want one for yourself there is only one unmarried woman in the village now said the veterala and she is solindu's daughter an uncomfortable silence fell upon the listeners karlinahami and baban looked at solinda who remained silent his eyes fixed upon the ground the veterala's intentions were very clear and the point of his previous story is very obvious now Pancharala turned to karlinahami i was thinking but yesterday that it is time that the girl was given in marriage baban here has taken her twin sister and it is wrong that a woman should live alone it is not for me to give the girl she is her father's daughter Slender's face showed his distress the veterala was a dangerous man to offend but too much was being asked of him he began in a low voice the girl is too young she has not flowered yet puncher rolla laughed did you bring the girl up or only phil as the saying is they are called twins but the one has been married a year and the other has not flowered yet federala i would give the girl but she is unwilling she told me last night that you had spoken to her she is of the jungle while not fit for your house she was very frightened and angry for a moment Pancharala was disconcerted that his rebuff was known but anger came to his rescue am i to ask the girl then when i want a wife can the father not give his child so the child is angry and the father obeys oh hey strange customs spring up you are a fool slender if you tell the child to obey there is no more to be said 
the girl is a wild thing i tell you i cannot give her against her will the veterala got up he smiled at selinda who watched him anxiously you will not give the girl selinda i cannot i cannot you will not give her remember the man of sinhala who taught my father ayo how can i do this and the headman of magama and the devil that still dances beneath the trees selinda's face worked with excitement ask anything else of me veterala i cannot do this i cannot do this Pancharala walked away the others watched him in silence when he got to the fence of the compound he turned round and smiled at them again and don't forget he called out to tell the girl about the malay girl who came to the kerala mahatmaya in the cave a black-faced man and big-bellied but she came she came i am an ugly man and the bear's claws have made me uglier a poor bedfellow for a girl and so was he black as tamil and a great belly swaying as he walked but she came to the cave to the calling of my father's charm oh yes she came she came pancharala walked away chuckling selinda was trembling with excitement and fear kalinahami burst out into a wail of despair ayo what will become of us brother he is a bad man a bad man very cunning and clever there is no protection against his charms he will bring evil and disease upon the house he will make devils enter us what have you done what have you done i o baban was not as excited as the other two but he was very serious it would perhaps have been better to give him the girl he said the man is not a bad man if you do not cross him and the girl is of age to marry even the bravest man does not go down the path where a devil lives only the fool struggles against the stronger said kalinahami what the veterala says is medicine is medicine it is not too late brother to undo the evil to whom else is the village can you give the girl selindu turned upon them in his anger and fear have you too joined to plague me evils come upon a man it is fate what can i do the girl is unwilling am i to throw away the kurakan when the rice is already stolen am i to help the thief to plunder my house i am a poor man and the evil has come upon me i can do nothing against it his devils will enter me and i shall waste away but as for the child what else is left to me i will not force her to go to this son of a bad guy go into the house woman and cry there and you baban is it not enough that you have stolen from me one child that now you should join with his dog to steal the other from me the other two were frightened by this outburst of selindu they saw that to argue with him would only increase his excitement they left him he remained squatting in the compound and as his anger died down fear possessed him utterly he had no doubt of the powers of pancharala over him he knew that he had delivered himself into his power and the power of the devils that surrounded him he had no thought of resistance in such a case a terrible sense of a blank wall of fate against which a man may hurl himself in vain was upon him he sat terrified and crushed by the inevitableness of the evil which must be when hinihami returned he told her what had happened and she shared in his terror and despair End of chapter five part one chapter five part two of the village in the jungle by leonard wolf this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five part two the charms of the veterala did not take long to act upon selindu he felt that he was a doomed man and his mind could think of nothing but the impending evil the banyan trees of the ruined village of bagama obsessed his mind he knew that ruin waited for him there and yet a horrible desire to see them was always present with him he could no longer remain in the hut or compound he wandered through the jungle fighting against the pull of the desire his wanderings became a circle of which the banyan trees were the centre he tried to go back to his hut where he felt that there was safety for him and found himself walking in the opposite direction darkness began to settle over the jungle and the life which awakes only in its darkness began to stir voices mocked him from the canopy of leaves above him dim forms moved among the shadows of the trees suddenly a blind terror came upon him and he began to run through the dense 
jungle the boughs of the trees lashed him as he ran down the narrow tracks the thorns tore him like spurs he lost all sense of direction vague shapes seemed to follow him in the darkness enormous forms broke away from the track before him to crash away among the undergrowth and trees the throbbing of his heart and throat became unendurable but still his one idea was to run as he ran the jungle suddenly became thinner the thorny undergrowth had given way to more open spaces even here it was very dark he stumbled against the knotted root of a tree a long straight swinging bough struck him in the face a wild derisive yell came from above the blood seemed to rise and drown his eyes he felt about vaguely with his hands he recognized the root-like stringy trunks of the banyan trees he heard the cry ring out above his head and he fell huddled together among the roots of the trees selindu did not hear again the cry of the devil bird from the tree-tops he lay unconscious throughout the night when dawn broke he came to himself stiff and cold he dragged himself slowly to the hut there was no necessity to tell the others what had happened the pale yellow of his skin his sunken grazed eyes his shivering body told them that puncturala's charms had already begun their work and his devils had already entered selindu he lay down on a mat within the hut to wait for the slow sapping of his life by the spell for the next two days selindu lay in the hut very slowly letting go his hold of life a kind of coma was upon him as he felt life gradually slipping from his body from time to time the women began a shrill wail in the compound baban went to expostulate with pancharala but the veterala after listening with a malignant smile replied that he knew nothing and could do nothing in the matter baban returned to lounge moodily about the compound on the second day Karlinahami, determined in despair to go herself to the veterala she found him sitting in his compound you have come about your brother no doubt but i can do nothing i'm only a poor veterala there is the government hospital in kumburu pitaya and a mahatmaya in trousers a drinker of arak a clever man he will give you government medicines free of charge just a phantom or two for the peon who stands by the door you should take your brother there it is only three days journey veterala my brother lies in the hut dying he has covered his head with his cloth and he will neither eat nor speak life is slipping from him the doctor mahatmaya will say it is the fever he will give you a bottle of fever mixture free of charge a clever man the doctor mahatmaya yes you should take him to the hospital and get the medicine free of charge it is a good medicine though unpleasant to the taste they tell me ayo what is the good of going to the hospital why do you talk like that veterala you are laughing at me we know that it is the devils that have entered my brother and that you alone have power to save him devils what do i know of devils no they tell me the doctor mahatmaya keeps no medicine in the hospital against devils the government says there are no devils surely it is fever or fire fever or dysentery it is for these that they give government medicine no it is no good going to the hospital for devils veterala i have brought you kurakan here it is all i have and i will talk to the girl for you yes and to my brother if he gets well but take the spell from him veterala take the spell from him i pray you i know nothing of spells i am a poor village veterala with a little knowledge of roots and leaves and fruits 
which my father taught me federala you yourself told us of the charms and spells your skill is known charm the devil to leave my brother he meant no harm he is a strange man you know that federala he never meant to injure you the girl will come to you i will see to that only take the spell from my brother Pancharala sat and looked at Karlinahami, smiling for a little while then he said is the woman mad too what do i know of charms and spells i can work no charm on your brother but i have some little knowledge of devils my father taught me well well let me think now if a devil has entered the man and is slowly taking his life from him perhaps there is a way let me think do you know the village of Baragama? no vetterala no i have heard it but i do not know it well it lies over there to the east five days journey through the jungle beyond maha potana and the river of jewels do you think you could take your brother there yes vetterala we could go there there is a great temple there and the great baragama Devio lives in it he is a tamil god so they say but sinhalis caporalas serve him in the temple my father used to say that he is a very great god his power is over the jungle and the devils who live in it the devils of the trees obey him for his anger is terrible if a devil has entered a man and is harming him and taking his life from him that man should make a vow to the god so my father used to say then he should go to the temple at baragama at the time of the great festival and roll in the dust round the temple three times every day and call upon the god in a loud voice to free him from the devil and perhaps if he called loud enough the god will hear him and order the devil to leave him then the devil will be afraid of the god's power and will leave the man who will be freed from the evil now the great festival falls on the day of the next full moon perhaps if your brother makes a vow to the baragama de Villo and goes to the great festival the devil will be driven out by the god you and the girl might take him there and perhaps i will go too for i have made a vow myself Kalinahami fell at the vetterala's feet salaaming and whimpering blessings on him then she hurried home it took a long time to make selindu understand that there was hope for him at first he would not listen to their entreaties and exhortations at last when he was prevailed upon to believe that it was pancharala himself who had suggested the remedy some spirit to fight for life seemed to creep into him he took some food for the first time and sat listening to the plans for the pilgrimage it was decided that they should start on the next day and that baban should accompany them the next day the pilgrim set out on a journey which with the enfeebled Selindu, would they knew take them at least six days their road the whole way led them through thick jungle villages were few and what their work consisted only of a few squalid huts the only village of any size through which they were to pass was maha potana an agricultural village one day's journey from baragama which had sprung up around a vast tank restored by government they carried their food with them and slept at night on the bare earth under bushes or trees every day they trudged straggling along in single file from seven to eleven in the morning and from three to six in the evening Selindu was dazed and weak and often had to be helped along by baban the women carried large bundles of food and chatties wrapped up in cloths upon their heads it was the hottest time of the year when the jungle is withered with drought the grass has died down the earth is caked and cracked with heat the trees along the paths and road are white with dust the pools had dried up and the little streams were now mere channels of gleaming sand often they had to go all day without finding a pool or a well with water in it for twelve hours every day the sun beat down upon them fiercely the quivering heat from the white roads beat up into their faces and eyes the wind swept them with its burning gusts and eddies of dust their feet were torn by the thorns and swollen and blistered by the hot roads as hinihami followed hour after hour along the white track which forever coiled out before her 
into the walls of dusty trees the old song which carlina hami had sung to them when they were children continually was in her mind and she sang as she walked our women's feet are weary but the day must end somewhere for the followers in the way two days journey from betagama they joined a larger and more frequented track here they continually met little bands of pilgrims bound for the same destination as themselves the majority of them were tamils hindus from india from the tea estates and from the north and east of the island strange-looking men such as hinihami had never seen before very dark with bodies naked to the waist with lines of white and red paint on their shoulders their foreheads smeared with ashes and the mark of god's eye between their eyebrows they wore clothes of fine white cotton caught up between the legs and they carried brass bowls and brass tongs their women heavy and sullen-looking followed carrying bundles and children there were however also little bands of buddhists sinhalese like themselves and to one of these bands they attached themselves four of them were a family from a village only twenty miles north of betagama and jungle people like themselves they were taking a blind child to see whether if they called upon the god he would hear them and give him sight there were a fisher and his wife from the coast they were childless and the woman had vowed to go to the festival and touch the heel of the caparala in order that the god might remove from her the curse of barrenness last there was an old man a trader from a large and distant village of another district he wore immense spectacles and all day long he walked reading or chanting from a large sinhalese religious book which he carried open in his hand the rest of the party did not understand a word of what he read but they felt that he was acquiring merit and that they would share a little of it he had been brought up in a buddhist temple and at night after the evening meal he gathered the little party round him and preached to them or read to them by the light of the camp-fire how they should live in order to acquire merit in this life and at the appropriate places they all cried out together sadhu sadhu or he made them all repeat together aloud the sill or rules and as their voices rose and fell in the stillness of the night air carla nahami's face shone with ecstasy and a sense of well-being and quiet strange to her stole over hinihami even in Salindu there came a change he joined in the chant budhan saranam gachami with which they began and ended the day he became less hopeless and sullen and the look of fear began to leave his eyes in the evenings when the air grew cool and gentle after the pitiless heat and wind of the day as they sat around the fire by the roadside and the great trees rose black behind them into the night and the stars blazed above them between the leaves and up and down the road twinkled the fires of other pilgrims and the air was sweet with the smell of the burning wood and the hum of voices and the vast stillness of the jungle folded them round on every side and they listened to the strange words but half understood of the lord buddha and how he attained to nirvana then the sufferings of the day were forgotten and a feeling stole over them of peace and holiness and merit acquired and one evening at baban's suggestion carla nahami told them a story which had always been a favourite with the village women at first the old man with the book and spectacles showed signs of being offended at this usurpation but he was soothed by their saying that they did not want to tire him and by their asking him to read to them again after the story was finished in the end he was an absorbed listener as carlina hami told the following story the lord buddha in one of his previous lives met a young girl carrying kunji to her father who was ploughing in the field and when he saw her he thought the maiden is fair if she is unmarried she would make me a fit wife and she thought when she saw him if such a one took me to wife i would bring fortune to my family and he said to her what is your name her name was amara devi which means undying so she replied sir my name is that which never was is nor will be in this world nothing he said born in this world is undying 
is your name amara she answered yes sir then the buddha said to whom are you taking the kanji to the first god you are taking it to your father yes sir what is your father doing he makes one into two to make one into two is to plough where is your father ploughing he ploughs in that place from which no man returns no man returns from the grave is he ploughing near the burial ground yes sir then amara devi offered the buddha kanji to drink and he accepted it and he thought to himself if the maiden gives me the kanji without first washing the pot i will leave her at once but Ma amara devi washed the pot first and then gave the kanji the buddha drank the kanji and said friend where is your house that i may go to it and amara devi answered go by this path until you come to a boutique where they sell balls of rice and sugar go on until you come to another where they sell kanji from there you will see a flamboyant tree in full blossom at that tree take the path towards the hand with which you eat rice that is the way to my father's house and the buddha went as amara devi had directed him and found the house and went in amara devi's mother was in the house and she welcomed the buddha and made him sit down and he seeing the poverty of the house said mother i am a tailor have you anything for me to sew and she said son there are clothes and pillows to mend but i have no money to pay for the mending then he replied there is no need of money bring them for me to mend so the lord buddha sat and mended the torn clothes and pillows and in the evening amara devi came back from the fields carrying a bundle of firewood on her head and a sheaf of jungle leaves in the folds of her cloth and buddha lived in the house some days in order to learn the behaviour of the girl at the end of three days he gave her half a seer of rice and said amara devi cook for me kanji boiled rice and cakes she never thought to say how can i cook so much out of half a seer of rice but was ready to do as she was told she cleaned the rice boiled the whole grains made kanji from the broken grains and cakes from the dust she offered the kanji to the buddha and he took a mouthful and tasted the delight of its sweetness but to try her he spat it out on the ground and said friend since you do not know how to cook why do you waste my rice amari devi took no offence but offered him the cakes saying friend if the kanji does not please you will you eat of the cakes and the buddha did the same with the cakes then amara devi offered him the rice and again he spat out the rice and pretended to be very angry and smeared the food upon her head and body and made her stand in the sun before the door the girl showed no anger but went out and stood in the sun then the buddha said amara devi friend come here and she came to him and he took her as his wife and lived with her in the city in the gatekeeper's house and she still thought he was a tailor and one day he sent two men to her with a thousand gold pieces to try her the men took the gold pieces and with them tempted her but he, she said these thousand gold pieces are unworthy to wash my husband's feet and three times she was tempted and at last he told them to bring her to him by force so they brought her to him by force and when she came into his presence she did not know him for he sat and stayed in his robes but she smiled and wept when she looked at him the buddha asked her why she smiled and wept and she said lord i smiled with joy to see your divine splendour and the merit acquired by you in innumerable births but when i thought that in this birth you might by some evil act such as this by seducing another's wife earn the pains of death i wept for love of you then the buddha sent her back to the house of the gatekeeper and he told the king and queen that he had found a princess for his wife and the queen gave jewels and gold ornaments to amara devi and she was taken in a great chariot to the house of the buddha and from that day she lived happily with him as his wife the other pilgrims except the fisher who had fallen asleep were delighted with kalanami's story and they wanted her to tell them another but she was afraid to offend the old man again so she refused the old man read to them a while and gradually one after the other they dropped off to sleep and in the morning they started off again down the long white road and at midday when they were hot and footsore the wall of jungle before them parted suddenly and they came out into a great fertile plain the green rice-fields stretched out before them 
dotted over with watch huts and clumps of coconut trees and red-roofed houses and the immense white domes of dagobas gleaming in the sun beyond shone the pleasant sheet of water through which the jungle had yielded the smiling plain the dead trees still stood up gaunt and black from its surface great white birds sat upon the black branches or flapped lazily over the water with wild hoarse cries its bosom was starred and dappled with pink lotus flowers and beyond again lay the long dark stretch of jungle out of which far away to the north towered into the fiery sky the line of dim blue hills it was the tank and village of mahaputana and when the weary band of pilgrims suddenly saw the monotony of the trees and of the parched jungle give place to the water and the green fields and the white dagobas the shrines built by kings long ago to hold the relics of the lord buddha they raised their hands salaaming and cried aloud sadhu sadhu they picked lotus flowers and went to the great dagoba which is called after an ancient king and laid the flowers upon the shrine as an offering and walked three times around crying satu satu and thus acquired merit then they went into the bazaar which was crowded with pilgrims hindus and buddhists and indian fakirs and moormen innumerable bullock carts stood on the road and paths and open spaces and the air rang with the bells of the bulls which lazily fed upon the great bundles of straw tied to the carts and the old man who had noted the poverty of Salindu and his family bought them rice and curry and plantains so they sat under the shade of a great bow tree and ate a meal such as hinihami had never eaten before her eyes wandered vacantly from thing to thing she was dazed by the crowd perpetually wandering to and fro by the confused din of talking people of coughing cattle and jangling bells in the evening they went to another dagoba and then returned to the bow tree and lighted their fire all about them were other little fires around which sat groups like themselves of pilgrims eating the evening meal they ate rice again and cakes and hinihami grew heavy with sleepiness a great peace came upon her as she heard kalinahami tell of how she had before come on pilgrimage to the great buddhist festival in maha patona when the crowds were tens of thousands more and the old man told of a pilgrimage to the sacred city of anurad hapur on the great poya day when hundreds of thousands acquire merit by encircling the shrine and the merit to be acquired by climbing adam's peak or by visiting the ruined shrines of sitopahua which the jungle has covered so that the bears and leopards have made their lairs in the great caves by the side of buddhas who lie carved out of rock the air was heavy with the smell of cooking and the pungent smell of the burning wood the voice of the old man seemed to come from very far away she covered her head with a cloth and lay down on the bare ground for the first time the bareness and fear and wildness of life had fallen from her she fell asleep in the peace of well-being and the merit which she had acquired next morning to the regret of all they had to leave the pleasant village and resting place of mahaputana and face again the suffering and weariness of the jungle for two days their path led them through low thorny jungle where there was little shelter from the sun the track became stony and rocky grey boulders of grey lichen-covered rock were strewn among the thick undergrowth at intervals could be seen enormous rocks towering above the trees in the afternoon of the first day they caught their first glimpse of the sacred baragama hill which rises into three rounded peaks above the village and temple next day towards evening they had reached the high forest which starting from its foot clothed the hill almost to its peaks then once again the jungle parted suddenly and they stood upon the bank of a great stream the banks were deep and enormous trees kumbuk with its peeling bark and the wild fig tree shaded them the season of drought had narrowed the stream of water so that it flowed shallow in the centre of the channel leaving on either side a great stretch of white sand up and down stream were innumerable pilgrims washing from them in the sacred waters the dust of the journey and the impurities of life before they entered the village they followed the example of the other pilgrims and performed the required ablutions after which they put on clean white clothes and climbed a path on the opposite bank which led them into the village 
they found themselves in a long very broad street on each side of which were boutiques and houses and large buildings resting places for the pilgrims the street was thronged with pilgrims idling buying provisions hurrying to the temple it was near the time for the procession to start from the temple the festival lasted fourteen days and every night the god was taken in procession through the village it culminated in the great procession of the fourteenth night which falls when the moon is full and in the ceremony of the following morning when the carbarala goes down accompanied by all the pilgrims into the bed of the river and cuts the waters with a golden knife slindu and his party arrived in baragama on the ninth day of the festival so that they would remain six days in the village and take part in six processions at either end of the broad straight street stood temples the one at the north end belonged to the baragama de vallo de vallo the temple or Dwala itself was a small squat oblong building above which at one end rose the customary dome-like erection of hindu temples on which are fantastically carved the images of gods around the temple was an enormous courtyard enclosed by red walls of roughly baked bricks just outside the wall of the courtyard on the east side was another and a smaller temple belonging to the god's lawful wife at the southern end of the street stood another temple it was a square dirty white building without a courtyard but surrounded on all sides by a veranda in which among a litter of broken furniture and odds and ends lounged and squatted and slept a large number of pilgrims the only entrance to the shrine itself was through a doorway in the front which was screened by a large curtain ornamented crudely with the figures of gods and goddesses no one was allowed to enter behind this curtain except the caporalas for the temple belonged to the mistress of the baragama de Vio. the solemnity of the pilgrimage was intensified in the minds of selindu and carla nahami and the other pilgrims who were villagers like themselves by the mystery which surrounds the god on the road and around the fires at night in the streets of the village and in the very courtyard of the temple they listened to the tales and legends and believing them all without hesitation or speculation they felt through their strangeness far more than they had ever felt with the buddha of Dagobas and viharas that this god was very near their own lives who was he this tamil god living in the wilderness whom the tamil said was Kandaswami, the great hindu god these buddhist villagers felt that they could understand him he was so near to the devils of the trees and jungles whom they knew so well he had once lived upon the centre of the three peaks of the great hill ruling over the unbroken forest which stretched below him tossing and waving north to the mountains and south to the sea that was why every night throughout the festival a fire blazed from the peak but one day as he sat among the bare rocks upon the top of the hill and looked down upon the winding river and the trees which cooled its banks the wish came to him to go down and live in the plain beyond the river even in those days he was a tamil god so he called to a band of tamils who were passing and asked them to carry him down across the river the tamils answered lord we are poor men and have travelled far on our way to collect salt in the lagoons by the seashore if we stop now the rain may come and destroy the salt and our journey will have been for nothing we will go on therefore and on our way back we will carry you down and place you on the other side of the river as you desire the tamils went on their way and the god was angry at the slight put upon him shortly afterwards a band of sinhalese came by they also were on their way to collect salt in the lagoons then the god called to the sinhalese and asked them to carry him down across the river the sinhalese climbed the hill and carried the god down and bore him across the river and placed him upon its banks under the shadow of the trees where now stands his great temple then the god swore that he would no longer be served by tamils in his temple and that he would only have sinhalese to perform his ceremonies and that is why to this day though the god is a tamil god and the temple a hindu temple the kapuralas are all buddhists and sinhalese the god therefore is of the jungle a great devil beneficent when approached in the right manner and season whose power lies for miles upon the desolate jungle surrounding his temple and hill 
a power to swear by for he will punish for the oath sworn falsely by his ill a power who will listen to the vow of the sick or of the barren woman a power who can aid us against the devils which perpetually beset us it was in this way that the pilgrims regarded the god and they chose well the time of his festival to approach him for the god loved a hind and had made her his mistress and had placed her in the temple which stood at the southern end of the street on each of the fourteen nights of his festival at caporalis entered his shrine and covering the god in a great black cloth so that no one should look upon him carried him out and placed him upon the back of an elephant then the pilgrims called upon the name of the god and with bowls of blazing camphor upon their heads followed him in procession to his mistress's temple there the caporalis blindfolded took the god hidden by the cloth from the elephant and carried him up the steps of the temple again the pilgrim shouted the god's name and women pressed forward to touch the caporala as he passed for in this way they escaped the curse of barrenness the caporala carried the god to his mistress and then retired amid the roar of tom-toms the jangling of bells the flaring of great lights and the passionate shouts of the people the pilgrims prostrated themselves then the caporala still blindfolded again slipped behind the curtain into the shrine and brought out the god and placed him upon the elephant and the procession followed him back to his own temple selindu and the others reached the village in the evening only a little while before the procession started they therefore made their way once to the great temple and took their stand among the pilgrims who crowded the courtyard they had eaten nothing since the midday meal they were hungry and dizzy after the long days upon the road selindu seemed too dazed and weak to take much notice of what was taking place about him and he had to be helped along by the bun carlin nahami was awed and devout an old pilgrim she knew the demeanour required of her the effect upon hinihami was different tired and hungry though she was even the great crowd in the courtyard excited her as each new pilgrim arrived he called aloud upon the god and the whole crowd took up the cry which rose and fell around the shrine she who had before never seen more than forty or fifty people in her life felt a weight and breath of thousands that jostled and pressed her her heart beat as under the flare of the torches hundreds of arms were raised in supplication and to the crash of the tom-toms the name of the god thundered through the air the tears came into her eyes and ran down her cheeks as time after time the roll of the many voices surged about her and when at last the great moment came and the caporala appeared carrying the god under the black cloth and over the sea of arms the elephant lifted up its trunk and trumpeted as the god was placed upon his back she stretched out her hands and cried to the god to hear her they followed in the rear of the procession where men roll over and over in the dust and childless women touched the ground with their forehead between every step in fulfilment of their vows selindu with drawn face and vacant eyes dragged himself along leaning on baban carlin nahami devout and stolid raised the ceremonial cry at the due stopping-places but hinihami felt the power of the god in her aunt over them all she felt how near he was to them mysteriously hidden beneath the great cloth which lay upon the elephant's back she felt again the awe which great trees in darkness and the shadows of the jungle at nightfall roused in her the mystery of darkness and power which no one can see and again and again as the procession halted and the cry of the multitude rolled back to them her breath was caught by sobs and again she lifted her hands to the god and called upon his name she formulated no prayer to him she spoke no words of supplication only in excitement and exultation of entreaty she cried out the name of the god they were too tired that night to go into the shrine of the big temple after the procession and see the ceremony there they had lost sight of the old man in the crowd so that they had to make their meal off a little food that they carried with them then worn out by their journey and excitement they lay down on the bare ground in the courtyard of the temple next morning selindu was no better he seemed weaker and more lifeless it was clear that the devil had not yet left him baban remained with him while Kalinahami and hinihami went down to the river to bathe the excitement of the previous evening had not died out of the girl and there was much going on around her to keep it up the village was a small one and really consisted of little more than the one street of thirty or forty houses 
which were roofed with red tiles and had brown walls of mud most of the houses were turned into boutiques during the pilgrimage and the inhabitants prospered by selling provisions to the pilgrims when karlanahami and hinihami returned from the river hundreds filled the street lounging strolling gossiping and purchasing every now and then the crowd would gather more thickly in one quarter and they would see a pilgrim arrive performing some strange vow there were some who had run a skewer through their tongue and cheeks another had thrust through the skin of his back a long stick from which hung bowls of milk at another time they saw a man naked except for a dirty loin-cloth his long hair hanging about his face and a great halo of flowers and branches upon his head thirty or forty great iron hooks had been put through the skin of his back to every hook was attached a long cord and all the cords had been twisted into a rope another man held the rope while the first bearing with his full weight upon it so that the skin of his back was drawn away from his body danced around in a circle and shouted and sang as karlinahami and hinihami were making their way slowly through the crowd they suddenly heard a soft voice behind them say well mother has not the hospital cured your brother of his fever they turned and saw the smiling face and winking eye of the veterala hinihami shrank away from him behind karlinahami veterala said karlinahami i must speak with you come away from all these people they pushed through the crowd and going down a narrow opening between two boutiques found themselves in the strip of quiet forest upon the bank of the river the veterala squatted down under a tree and began to chew betel karlinahami squatted down opposite to him and hinihami tried to hide herself behind her from the eye of the veterala which seemed to her maliciously to wink at her Pancharala leaned round and peered at the girl well daughter he said ironically emphasizing the word daughter what have you come to the god for have you touched the caporala's foot and prayed for a child truly they say he is the god of the barren wife chi chi she covers her face with her hands is the man dead then what has the widow to do in baragama oh hey now see she has come to the god for clothing and food as they say may the god give her a man young and fair and strong a prince with cattle and land for the girl is fair even i the one-eyed old man can see that and the god is a great god don't talk this nonsense Baderala, broke in karlinahami impatiently you shame the girl and frighten her the god is a great god we know that and as you told me we brought my brother here io the long road and the hot sun we are burnt as black as tamils and look at our feet on the road the strong and healthy fall sick and the sick man grows weaker have you sent my brother here to kill him he lies now in the temple with no strength in him last night we took him in the parahara and called upon the god to hear us i pray you veterala you are a wise man and renowned for your knowledge tell me what wrong have we done the devil remains the god has not hurt us nor driven him out be patient mother this fever is a hard thing to cure did i not tell you that even in the hospital there is no medicine against it and it is hard for a man to find the lucky hour the gecko calls and the man starts from the house the man does not hear the sign he is saying you there bring that along and you here where is the bundle with the curricon so he starts on the journey in an unlucky hour we heard no gecko nor any other bad sign but we had to start quickly for the time was short we had no time to consult an astrologer to find the lucky hour yes perhaps that is it and it is no easy matter as i told you to find a cure for these fevers but Baderala, what are we to do now the man's strength goes from him even to take him back the long way to the village will be difficult patience mother patience you must call louder to the god nightly until the moon is full perhaps even now the devil the fever is fighting against him ayo what help for the cultivator when the flies have sucked the strength from the paddy he sowed in an unlucky hour and not even the god can help him piteous Baderala, will you not come with us and look at my brother now why should i see your brother said the Baderala angrily what good can i do did i not tell you woman that i cannot cure your brother's fever where the god fails can the man succeed oh the minds of these women they say in the village here he looked round and smiled at hinihami 
that even the little one is like an untamed buffalo cow do not be angry with me federella you are the only help left for us we are weary with walking and in grief how can the women of the house not raise the cry when the brother and father lies dying within if i have spoken foolishly pardon my words Poncherella sat silently looking at henny hami the girl was crying the memory of the great god whom she had seen go riding by upon the elephant amid the flames and the shouts the wild god who ruled over the jungle and to whom the men crowned with flowers and leaves were now dancing in the street the god to whom she cried so passionately on the night before had left her her excitement and exultation had died out as she listened to the jeering words of Poncherala. she hated him as she had hated him when he approached her before but as she listened to him talking to carlina hami fear the fear that she felt for unknown evils gradually crept upon her she cried helplessly and Poncherala smiled at her as he watched her carlina hami watched his face expectantly and anxiously at last Poncherala began again slowly how the girl cries and for her father too i'm thinking that there is yet something for you to do i'm a poor Federala, and my powers are small but there is a man here a great man a holy man who they say is very skilled in medicine and magic and knows the mind of the god he is a sannyasi from beyond the sea from india and his hair is ten cubits in length perhaps if you take slindu to him and inquire of him he will tell you the god's mind but you must take money for him ayo what is the use of talking of money to the starving Poncherala fumbled in the fold of his cloth and drew out his batel case from this he took a very dirty rag in which were a number of copper and silver coins he made it the sum of ninety-five cents and handed it over to carlina hami here you are then a rupee even the gods require payment you can pay me three shillings in Kurakan when the crop is reaped the sanyasi sits behind the little temple under a banyan tree to-day when the sun sinks behind the trees of the jungle take your brother to him and make inquiry Poncherala got up and began walking away followed by the obeisances and profuse thanks of carla nahami the two women hurried back to the temple they found that the old man and the fisher and his wife had joined selindu and baban the whole party agreed that the only thing to do was to consult the sanyasi they waited dozing and talking through the hot afternoon until the hour fixed by the vetterala arrived as soon as the sun sank behind the jungle and the shadow of the trees fell upon the temple courtyard they went in a body to the banyan trees they found the sanyasi sitting with his back against the trunk of a tree with a brass bow by his side he was unlike any sanyasi whom they had seen before he had a long black beard reaching below his waist a big hooked nose and little twinkling black eyes he wore a long white cotton robe which was indescribably dirty and an enormous dirty white turban as they approached him he unwound the folds of this turban and displayed his hair to the crowd which surrounded him it was plaited and matted into two thin coils upon the top of his head and its length had not been by any means exaggerated by Poncherala. the sanyasi spoke only a strange language unintelligible to the tamils and sinhalese in the crowd but there stood by him an old tamil man who interpreted what he said baban led selindu up to the sanyasi and dropped the money in the bowl he explained what he wanted to the old tamil who understood and spoke very badly sinhalese the crowd pressed forward to listen the sanyasi and his interpreter muttered together the old man then addressed the crowd and told them that the holy man could not consult the god or give an answer with them pressing upon him there was much talking and excitement but at last a large circle was cleared and the crowd was induced to move away out of earshot most of the people squatted down and though they could not hear a word of what followed they watched in hope of some exciting development baban and selindu squatted down in front of the sanyasi carlina hami hinehami and the others of their party stood behind them selindu weak and dejected though he was for the first time for several days seemed to take some interest in what was passing it had been arranged that baban should explain the case to the sanyasi will you tell the holy man he said to the interpreter that we are poor folk and ask pardon of him this man is my wife's father a hunter a very poor man there is also a yaka who lives in the banyan trees in the jungle over there 
Kaban made a sweep with his arm towards the west this yaka has entered this man and his life is going from him why has the yaka entered the man there is another man in the village that man is skilled in charms and magic and is angry with this man therefore he charmed the devil to do this well then when this had happened the woman went to him and prayed him to charm the devil away again then he said take your brother to baragama and pray to the god there at the great festival so we walked and walked to this place with the sick man we went in the parahara and called to the god but the god does not hear us and the man's life is going from him then the woman went again to the man for he too is here and told him he said i can do nothing take the man to the holy man who sits under the banyan tree and make inquiry of him so we waited for the lucky hour and have brought him the interpreter talked in the strange tongue with the sannyasi and then said to baban the holy man says that the offering is too small father it is all we have we are very poor rain never falls upon our fields and we have no land we pray him to help us there was another muttered conversation and then the interpreter said it is very little for so great a thing but the holy man will help you the little group became very still every one watched the sannyasi anxiously he muttered to himself fixed his eyes on the ground in front of him made marks in the sand with his finger and swayed his body from side to side then looking at selindu intently he began to speak very volubly selindu watched him fascinated at last the sannyasi stopped and the interpreter addressed them the holy man says thus it is true that a devil of the jungle has entered the man that this devil is of great power why has this happened the man is a foolish man there has come into the holy man's mind another man his face marked with scars and one-eyed he is a verderala very skilled in charms you have not told why the one-eyed man is angry but the holy man knows because of his holiness and wisdom the one-eyed man came and said give me your daughter but this man being mad refused and spoke evil then the one-eyed man was very angry and went away and made a charm over the devil and the devil entered the man when the one-eyed man made the charm he said to the devil unless she be given to me do not leave him a cry broke from hinihami she covered her face with her hands and crouched in fear upon the ground the interpreter paid no attention to her now even the one-eyed man cannot loose the charm so he has sent you to the god the god is of great power over devils he heard your prayer and he said to this devil leave the man but the yaka answered fighting against the power something must be given the master said unless she be given do not leave the man am i to die for this foolish man's sake then the god said yes something must be given either the man or the girl the holy man knows this and says that you must remain here and take the man every night in the parahara until the night of the full moon and on the morning of the next day you must return to the village but on the evening of the first day's journey the one-eyed man will meet you in an open stony place beside two palu trees then you must go to him and say there is the girl take her he will take the girl and the devil will leave the man otherwise if you do not do this the man will die for something must be given either the man or the girl remember too that the girl cannot be given during the festival Inihami pressed her body against the ground but her eyes were dry now she was broken tired and numb with fear and despair she had always known that it was she who was bringing death upon her father instinctively like a wild animal against a trap she had fought against the idea of giving herself to Pancharala. at the thought of her body touching his the skin seemed to shrink against her bones selinda was everything to her and she knew that now she was everything to him at first she had felt that she was being driven inevitably to sacrifice herself but when carla nahami returned from pancharala's compound and told them of the pilgrimage hope came to her the hardships and excitement of the road her ecstasy before the god had driven away her first feeling of despair the god would certainly help them but fear had crept in again at the first sight of pancharala and as she listened to his talk with carla nahami her hope grew cold now she knew that she must inevitably sacrifice herself had not the sannyasi known the truth which baban had not disclosed she knew that not even the god could help her she had heard his words yes something must be given either the man or the girl once more evil had come out of the jungle 
the effect upon the other listeners had also been great the holy man had seen what baban had hidden they knew well that they had heard from him the reply of the god they walked back to the temple talking about it in low voices there was no suggestion of doubt in any one as to what should be done even Salindu had given in the god had spoken it was fate the inevitable the girl would be given the remainder of the festival passed slowly for them they followed the parahara dispirited and called upon the god nightly but there was no hope or even doubt now to excite them Slindu, listless waited for his release hinihami was cowed and dulled by despair the nights passed and the morning following the new moon came and they went down dutifully to the river to take part in the cutting of the waters they were a melancholy little group among the laughing joking crowd which stood knee-deep in the river and when the supreme moment came and the caporala cut the waters and the crowd with a shout splashed high over themselves and one another the waters which would bring them good fortune through the coming year hinihami stood among them weeping the pilgrimage was over and a line of returning pilgrims began at once to stream across the river westwards the old man and the fisher and his wife said good-bye to them for they felt that it was not right for them being strangers to be present at what was to take place upon the homeward journey then they too set out they walked all that day slowly for selinda was very weak and in silence when the shadows began to lengthen the jungle became thinner and the ground more stony they knew that they must be nearing the place the track turned and twisted through the scrub the air was very still they passed a bend and there before them stood the vetarala under some palu trees they stopped for a moment and looked at one another Karlinahami touched Slindu on the arm he took hinehami by the hand and went up to pancharala his eyes seemed to be fixed upon something far away beyond pancharala he spoke very slowly here is the girl take her pancharala looked at hinehami and smiled it is well he said Slindu turned and with Karlinahami and baban walked on down the track neither of them looked back hinehami was left standing by the vetarala her arms hanging limply by her side her eyes looking on the ground end of chapter five part two chapter six of the village in the jungle by leonard wolf this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six it became clear on the morning after hinihami had been given to the vetarala that the sannyasi had rightly interpreted the will of the god and that the devil had left selindu his eyes no longer presented the glazed appearance which is the sign of possession he ate eagerly of the scanty morning meal and though still weak walked with a vigour unknown to him since the night when he fell beneath the banyan trees in the jungle throughout the homeward journey strength and health continued to return to him and by the time they reached the village the colour of his skin showed that he had been restored to his normal condition though they travelled very slowly they had not again seen the vetarala and hinihami on the way home pancharala made no haste to return to the village and he only appeared there two days after selindu arrived he showed no signs of pleasure in his triumph he was more quiet and thoughtful than usual in the house he seemed to his mother to be uneasy and a little afraid of hinihami the girl had yielded herself to him in silence in the long journey together through the jungle he had without success tried many methods of breaking or bending her spirit but he had failed his jeers and his irony his anger and his embraces had all been received by her in sullen silence he would have put her down to be merely a passionless stupid village woman had he not seen the light and anger in her eyes and the shudder that passed over her body when he touched her on the morning after she arrived in the village hinihami was alone in pancharala's compound the vetarala had gone out and his mother was in the house she saw selindu coming along the path and ran out eagerly to meet him they sat down under a tamarind tree just outside the stile 
in the compound fence the yaka has gone said selindi the god drove him out after the vaterala took you but now what to do the house is empty without you child i must come back a poach cheat i cannot live in this house but is it safe will not he bring evil again upon us the god said one must be given and now if i take you again will he not kill you the gods said that one must be given and it was done i was given and the man took me surely the gods cannot lie the evil has been driven out and as for the man i am not frightened of him ane said the mocking voice of the veterala behind them they are not frightened of the man oh no nor of the devils either i suppose selindu and hini hami got up the old fear came upon selindu when he saw punchurala but the girl turned angrily upon the veterala who was astonished by her violence punchurala she said i am not frightened of you the god did not say i was to live with you there is no giving of food or clothing i was given that the devil might leave my father was the god disobeyed i was given to you you dog the devil has flown the god heard us there at baragama he will not allow you again to do evil mother mother come out listen to the woman i brought to the house she has become a veterala the pilgrimage has made her a sannyasi i think knowing the god's mind skilled in magic keep your words for the women of the house i am going and are there no other charms selindu no other devils in the trees you have learned wisdom surely from a wise woman do not listen to him apochi he can no longer harm us the god has aided us she turned upon pancharala do you wish me to stay in the house yes there are still devils in the trees do not i too come from the jungle i shall be like a yakini to you in the house you dog you can tell them they say by the eyes which do not blink rightly the village women call me yakini i will stay with you look at my arms are they not as strong as a man's arms i will stay with you but as you lie by my side in the house i will strangle you pancharala pancharala instinctively stepped back and hinihami laughed oh hey are you frightened pancharala the binder of yakas is frightened of the yakini you can tell her they say because her eyes are red and unblinking and because she neither fears nor loves it is better for you that i should go to the trees from which i came mighty veterala otherwise i would strangle you and eat you in the house come apochji we will go out into the jungle together again as we did long ago ayo for long time i was a little thing then and a little sister too come apochji do not fear this rodaya dog he is frightened and now i will never leave you pantarala was really frightened he stood and watched the girl walk slowly away with selindu along the path things had not happened quite as he had expected or hoped he had enjoyed his first triumph over the girl but he had soon grown to doubt whether her continued presence in his house would add to his comfort he had felt without understanding that the giving of her body to him had only made her spirit more unyielding even on the way from baragama he had felt nervous and uncomfortable with her he was angered by his defeat and by her taunts but he watched her disappear with a distinct feeling of relief the veterala made no further attempt to molest selindu and the next nine months were a period of unwanted prosperity and happiness in the veda family towards the end of october great clouds rolled up from the northeast and great rains broke over the jungle for days the rain fell steadily ceaselessly the tank filled and ran over the dry sandy channels became torrents sweeping down old rotten trunks and great trees through the jungle a mist of moisture rose from the parched earth and hung gray upon the face of the jungle suddenly the ground became green and soon the grass stood waist-high beneath the undergrowth the earth at last was sodden and as the rain still fell and the streams overflowed the water spread out in a vast sheet beneath the trees 
not for forty years it was said had rain fallen so abundantly a great chenna crop was assured the more energetic began to talk of rice cultivation now that the tank was full and to regret the want of seed paddy then a rumour spread that the government was going to make advances of seed and at last one day the kerala mahatmaya appeared in the village and the rumour was confirmed promissory notes were signed buffaloes were borrowed to turn up the soil of the fields and at last after twelve years the village again saw paddy standing green in the water below their tank selindu's family principally owing to baban had a large share in the prosperity which came to the village from the wonderful chenna and rice crops their store was full of karakan and millet and rice they were well fed and even selindu became happy after the return of hinihami he seemed to change greatly they were almost always together and the fearlessness which she had shown towards pancharala and which seemed to have changed her suddenly from a child into a woman inspired him the fear of evil overhanging him no longer oppressed him he worked with baban cheerfully in the chenna and rice fields he began again to talk with punchy manika and sometimes he would sit in the compound and tell his strange stories to her and to the child who had been born to her eighteen months before and he was happy as he had been happy with her and with hinni hami years ago when they were children his happiness and hinni hami's was greatly increased when she gave birth to a daughter the child conceived during the pilgrimage was a pledge to them from the god that as his word had been obeyed the evil had been finally conquered to the physical joy which hinni hami felt as she suckled the child was added her exultation in the knowledge that she was holding in her arms a charm against the evil which had threatened selindu her hatred for the father only increased therefore her love for his child but the love and care which she showed from the moment of her birth to punchy nona as she called her daughter were from the first to be shared with another on the morning following the evening on which the child was born selindu came back from the jungle carrying in his arms a fawn newly dropped by its mother he went straight to hinni hami who lay in the hut nursing the child and kneeling down by her placed the fawn in her arms hinni hami with a little laugh took it and nestling it against the child was soon suckling the one at one breast and the other at the other selindu watched in silence he was very serious it is well it is well he said when he saw that the fawn was sucking quietly and nestling against hinni hami and the child the little weakling said hinni hami gently touching with her fingers the soft skin of the fawn how hungry for milk the little one is where has it come from it has come to you from the jungle the gods have sent it she bent her head and very softly drew her lips backwards and forwards over its back it takes the milk like the child has the god given another gift a poached chief the god sent it last night i went to the water-hole but nothing came while the moon was up then clouds gathered and the moon was hidden and it became very dark i heard a doe cry near by in pain ama ama but it was too dark to see so i lay down and slept on the top of the high rock i woke up with the first light and as i lay there i heard below the moving of something among the leaves very slowly looked over the rock and there below in the undergrowth i saw the back of a doe her head was down hidden by the leaves and she murmured licking something on the grass slowly slowly i took up my gun and leaned it over the rock and fired everything was hidden from me by the smoke and i lay quiet until the wind blew it from before me when i looked again i saw the doe stand there still the blood running down her side and she stretched up her head toward me from the jungle and her grey eyes rolled back with fear and showed white and she opened her mouth and cried terribly to me i was sorry for her pain and i said hush mother the evil has come what use to cry lie down that death may come to you easily but again she stretched out her neck toward me and cried aloud in pain ama ama ayo ayo it is you who have brought the evil yaka to the child here that i dropped last night and that lies now between my feet little son i have borne you to be food for the jackal and the leopard then i came down from the rock and stood by her and said mother the daughter at home 
this night bore a child i will take this one too to her and she will give it the breast then she stretched out her head and she cried out again and fell dead upon the ground by the side of the fawn hini hami pressed the fawn to her yes he has come to me out of the jungle a sign from the god a great charm against evil did not the god himself take the doe as his mistress they told it to us at Baragama, and now in the same night he has sent me a son and a daughter from the jungle so hini hami sucked with the child and the fawn together the village looked on with astonishment and disapproval the woman is as mad as the father was the general comment it was commonly rumoured that she showed more love for bunchy apu as the fawn was called than for her daughter and though she did not realise it herself it was true the son from the jungle inspired in her a passionate love and tenderness the great eyes which watched her and the wonderful skin that she was never tired of caressing he had come to her out of the jungle with something of the mystery and exultation which she had felt in baragama towards the god who went by upon the elephant and her love was increased by the attachment of panchi apu to her long before panchi nona could crawl about the compound the fawn would trot along by her side crying to be taken up and fed and even after it grew old enough to feed upon grass and leaves it never left her following her always about the house and compound and through the village and jungle the year of the great rains and rice and plenty was followed by a year of scarcity and sickness for four months from june to october the sun beat down from a cloudless sky the great wind from the southwest failed at last but even then the rain did not come and the withering heat lay still and heavy over the jungle the little puddle thick with mud in the tank which supplied the village with water dried up and the women had to go daily four miles to fetch water from an abandoned tank in the jungle in november the chenas were still standing black and unsown at last a little rain fell and the seed was sown the crop just showed green above the ground and drought came again and the young shoots died down then when it was too late to save the crops the rains came and with them sickness want had already begun to be felt by bodies weakened by the long drought and fever and dysentery swept over the country there was not a family in Betagama which did not suffer nor a house in which death did not take the old or the children the doctor mahatmaya whom pancharala despised appeared in the village bringing the medicines which he despised still more but his efforts were no more or less successful than those of the village veterala when at last the sickness passed away it was found that the village had lost sixteen out of its forty-one inhabitants and the jungle pressed in and claimed two of the eight houses after dysentery and fever had taken the men the women and their children who lived there even selindu's house did not escape their death took its toll of the young first punchy manika's child sickened and then punchy nona day after day the mothers helpless watched the fever come and shake the children's bodies and sap and waste their strength the wail of the two women each for her dead child was raised in one night it was lindu who seemed to feel the loss of the children more than any one else in the house this time clearly the envious powers had grudged him his little happiness he had been foolish to show his pleasure in the children crawling about the house he had brought disaster upon them and upon himself the misery he had felt at losing punchimanika came upon him again it was his own fault he was a fool to tempt the evil powers that stood around him eager for their opportunity after their first wild outburst of grief punchy manika and hini hami felt their loss less than selindu the death of the child is what every mother must continually expect they had seen it too long in the village to be surprised at their own suffering the birth of children every year and then the coming of the fever to carry them off their grief was lightened by the feeling of resignation to the inevitable and in hini hami's case there was a further consolation she still had punchy apu in whose attachment she could forget the child's death all her love for the child was now merged in her love for him he was the mysterious gift and pledge of the god and she felt that so long as he followed by her side so long as she felt the caress of his lips upon her hand 
no real evil could come to her hinihami's extraordinary love for the deer was well known in the village and had never been approved at first it was regarded merely as the folly of the mad woman these views were however very rarely expressed to the girl herself for most of the villagers stood in some fear of her passionate anger but about the time when the epidemic of fever and dysentery was decreasing a new feeling towards them made its appearance in the village it was started by Pancharala, the mad woman and her child he would say what sort of madness is that an evil woman an evil woman i have some knowledge of charms and magic i took her to my house to live with me but did i keep her i drove her away very soon i did not want the evil eye and a work of evil to bring misfortune on my house my mother knows for she heard her call herself a yakini only because of my knowledge of charms was i able to keep away the evil with which she threatened me and then comes this deer which they say is found in the jungle was not the woman herself in travail that very night do not she devils give birth to devils do village women suckle deer surely it is a devil born of a devil look at the evil that fell upon the village when it came the crops withered and the old and the young died it has brought us want and disease and death the village soon came to believe in pancharala's opinions small children were hurried away out of sight of hinihami as she passed the deer was certainly a devil who had brought misfortune on the village some said that at night it went out and ate the corpses in the new graves it had been clear for some time that the ill-feeling against them had been growing when an event occurred which required immediate action the son of the headman died suddenly and apparently for no cause then it was remembered that three days before the child had been carrying some leaves when he met the deer and henny hami the deer had gone up to the child and tried to nibble the leaves but the boy had snatched them away the headman and the veterala were convinced that henny hami and the deer were the direct cause of the child's death there was much talk between baba hami and pancharala other villagers were sent for there was much coming and going and discussion in the headman's compound and eventually action was decided upon the next day hinihami was collecting firewood in an old channa the deer was with her feeding at a little distance from her upon the young leaves and grass suddenly she was aroused by noise and movements near her a small band of men and boys from the village had crept quietly through the jungle and now were between her and the deer as she looked up the first stone was thrown it missed its mark but another followed and struck with a thud upon the deer's side he bounded forward hinihami cried out and ran towards him at the sound of her voice he stopped and looked round a shower of stones fell about him thin streams of blood began to trickle down his flanks suddenly he plunged forward upon his head his two forelegs broken at the knees a cheer broke from the men hinihami as she dashed forward was caught by two men and flung backwards upon the ground she fell heavily and for a moment was stunned then she heard the long bleeding cry of pain and saw the deer vainly trying to raise itself upon its broken legs among the jeering knot of men she felt the blood surge up to her forehead and temples as a wave of anger came over her and she flung herself upon the two men who barred her path swinging their arms wildly they gave her blow upon blow with the open hand upon her head and breast her jacket was torn into shreds and at last she fell exhausted the sight of the bleeding deer and the woman lying on the ground naked to the waist seemed to send a wave of lust and cruelty through the men they tore henny hami's cloth from her and taking her by her arms dragged her naked up to the deer bring the vessi to her child they shouted comfort your yaka yakini is there no milk in your breast for him now they held her that she might see what they did the deer was moaning in pain one of the men cut a thick stick and struck him upon the hind legs until they were broken hinihami fought and struggled but she was powerless in their hands at length when they had become tired of torturing them they threw her down by the deer's side and went away hinihami was unhurt but she was stunned by the violence of anger and horror the deer moaned from time to time she tried to lift him with some vague idea of carrying him back to the house but he screamed with pain at the slightest movement and he had grown too big for her to carry she felt that he was dying she flung herself down by him 
caressing his head and calling to him not to leave her panchi apu panchi apu she kept repeating you must not die surely the god who gave you to me will save you panchi apu panchi apu you cannot die then gradually a sense only of dull despair settled upon her she sat through the long day unconscious of the passing of time she was unaware when the deer died she knew that he was dead now and that with him everything had died for her there was nothing for her to live for now and already she felt life slipping from her she thought of the child who had died too she had missed her and grieved for her but she had never loved the child as she loved the deer he had come to her a wild thing from the jungle the god's mysterious gift now he was lying there dead his broken limbs twisted under him the dead white eyes bulging the tongue hanging out from the open mouth she shuddered as she remembered the scene shuddered as she recalled the thud of the stones and the blows she was found by selinda next morning still sitting naked by the body of the deer her hair wet with the dew and her limbs stiff with the chill of the jungle at night he tried in vain to rouse her she recognized him let me be a poached tea she kept repeating let me die here for he is dead let me die here a poached tea then selindu wrapped her cloth about her and carried her in his arms to the house she cried a little when she felt his tears fall upon her but after that she showed no more signs of grief she lay in the house silent and resigned to die she had even ceased to think or feel now life had no more a hold upon her and in the hour before dawn in deep sleep she allowed it to slip gently from her end of chapter six chapter seven part one of the village in the jungle by leonard wolf this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven part one selindu knew well now that hinihami had been a victim to save him both the devil and the god had said either the man or the girl must be given it was the girl who had been given but it was he who should have died when the devil still possessed him he knew now when it was too late that in giving hinihami to the veterala he was giving her to certain death he had gained nothing by his first refusal of the veterala but pain and trouble and now the bitterest of griefs in the end he had lost her utterly now indeed the house was empty he was a fool yes a fool he knew that but how can a man know how to walk surrounded by all the snares of evil and disaster a man may wash himself clean of oil but however much he rubs himself he will never rub off fate and then there was pancharala it was he who was the real cause of the evil why had he ever come with his hateful face into the compound he would go in the early morning and take his gun and shoot the veterala dead as he came out of his house and yet what would be the good of that now now that hinihami was dead it would only be more evil it would be useless it was useless for him to do anything now for days selindu sat about the compound thinking and thinking as punchy Manika called it she alone had any influence with him and even she had no power to console him in time grief lost its first bitterness and he sank into a perpetual state of sullen despair an air of gloom and disaster seemed to hang about the compound it was not long after the life of the village had been stirred by the death of hinihami that another event happened which caused no little excitement it was seen that baba hami the headman was having a house built on the open ground adjoining his compound and as soon as it was finished there came to live in it a man from kamburu pataya known as fernando many of the villagers had had dealings with him he kept a small boutique in kamburu pataya and lent money 
on the usual and even more than the usual interest he was not a sinhalese and spoke sinhalese very badly some people said he was a tamil his black skin and curly black hair pointed to the fact that he had kaffir blood in his veins he was a typical town man cunning unscrupulous with a smattering of education he wore the ordinary native cloth but above it a shirt and coat and the villagers therefore called him mahatmaya it was obvious that some very peculiar circumstances had brought such a man to settle down in a village like Betagama. the fact was that the headman and many of the villagers were deeply in his debt the failure of the previous year's chenna crop had made it impossible to recover anything in fact he was pestered with requests for further loans to tide the debtors over the hot season until the chenas could again be sown the creditor was faced with an unpleasant alternative if he refused further loans he would lose what he had lent already through the death or emigration of his debtors or they would borrow from others and thus make it difficult for him to recover on the other hand the complete failure of the chenna crop made his own position far from easy the debt outstanding together with the interest would be in itself a heavy charge on the next crop even if it were a really good one to be safe in giving still more credit he required additional security it was baba hami the headman who devised a scheme to meet these difficulties four acres of chenna would be allowed to each debtor the permits would be given in favour of the debtors who were to assign their rights to fernando for one-fifth of the crop it was tacitly understood that if the four-fifths of the crop exceeded the amount of the loans and interest the debts would be considered cancelled fernando was to come to the village and himself supervise the working of the chenas practically therefore the money-lender was hiring labour for the cultivation of chenas for one-fifth of the crop an exceedingly paying transaction while his rights and power of action for the outstanding debts remained unaffected the villagers were completely in his hands and both sides were fully aware of it the whole transaction certainly so far as the headman was concerned was illegal baba hami knew this but his needs were pressing and his own profit would be great for while his consent was purchased by the cancellation of his debts by a private arrangement with fernando his own four acres of chenna were not assigned to the money-lender to the villagers fernando was owing to his dress and habits a mahatmaya he did not treat them as his equals and they being in his debt treated him as a superior he was however on terms of intimacy with baba hami and although he had a small boy with him as servant he took all his meals in the headman's house punchy manika very soon attracted fernando's attention her face and form would have been remarkable even in a town to find her among the squalid women of so squalid a village astonished him he wanted a woman to live with him he was always wanting a woman and it would be far more comfortable to have his food cooked for him than to go always to the headman for his meals he anticipated no difficulty she was a mere village woman and the husband was a village boor and in his debt despite his confidence fernando decided to act cautiously he knew very little about villages but he knew the many proverbs about women and trouble and he had heard many tales of violence and murder of which women had been the cause he was quite alone among people whom he did not really understand far away from the boutiques and police court the busy little town which he understood and where alone he really felt secure he was a timid man and he hated the jungle and though he despised these people who lived in it he was not comfortable with them his first move was to try to learn something about the family from the head man he sounded baba hami cautiously the result pleased him greatly they were bad people according to the headman vedas gypsies traffickers and evil whores and vagabonds by evil charms they had enticed baban to their compound and now they boasted that he the brother of the headman's wife 
had married punchy manika they were dangerous people they had brought misfortune and death into the village fernando was not greatly impressed by their reputation for working harm by magic as became a town man he was somewhat sceptical but what was clear to him was that the headman hated the whole family they would get in no eventuality any help or sympathy from him this knowledge was as valuable as it was pleasing to him then one evening he surprised them by coming and chatting to babun almost as if he were an equal it was evening just about the time before the lamps are lit in the house when the air grows cool and the wind dies down and the afterglow of the setting sun is in the sky the work in the chenna for the man and in the house for the woman was over baban was squatting in the compound near the house and panchi manika stood behind him leaning against the door-post from time to time a word or two was spoken but for the most part they were content to allow the silence of the evening to descend upon them as they watched with vacant eyes the light fade out of the sky Bunchy Manika brought the wooden mortar in which the grain was pounded turned it upside down and dusted the top with a piece of cloth will you sit down haya said baban fernando sat down upon it baban squatted opposite to him while punchy manika stood behind leaning against the door-post well baban said fernando will the chana crop be good do you think who can say ayah who can say only a fool measures his grain before it is on the threshing-floor then all these villagers do that for they are all fools ayo what cattle what trouble they give a man we are poor men aya and ignorant i'm not thinking of you baban but of the others there's only one man in the village all say that and i've seen it myself but the others they will ruin me how much do they owe me only a very good crop will pay it but they don't care they don't fence the jenna or watch it they sit and sleep in the compound and the deer and pig go off with my rupees in their bellies isn't that true it's true ayah and what can i do a town man with all these chennas i ought to have a gambaraya yes you want a gambaraya so i thought and i thought too this baban is the only man in the village why shouldn't he be my gambaraya well what do you say you could look after the other chennas and also cultivate your own baban was silent with astonishment it was a piece of good fortune which he could never have dreamed of i would give you one twentieth of the crop after the fifth had been paid to the cultivators fernando went on would you do it for that yes i, I will do it for that gladly very well that's settled you are my gambaraya now fernando sighed and stretched himself what a place this jungle is he said it is not fit for a sensible man to live in of course these other villagers if they went anywhere else what could they do the cattle they do not know the east from the west as the tale says if they get into a bazaar they are frightened and run about like a scared bull but you baban you are young and strong you are a knowing man why do you starve here when you could eat rice and grow fat elsewhere so my sister and her man said ayah they wanted me to go away and marry in another village over there rain falls and rice grows there but it is a great evil to live in a strange place among strangers fernando laughed an evil you call it but how many have got wealth and fortune by going to strange places have you not heard of mahapotana many years ago it was all trees and jungle like this and no one lived there then they built the great tank in the jungle and people went there from all the villages of the west poor men living in villages like this now it is a town and all are rich there and eating rice yes ayah we know that the tank was built in my father's time and the kerala mahatmaya and the rata mahatmaya came to the village and spoke as you speak now and they said that land would be given to all that went there and water from the tank for the cultivation of rice 
it was in a year i remember my father telling me when rain had not fallen like the last crop with us and there was want in the village and many died of fever they urged my father to go for he was a good man they knew that and my father said to them so he told me how can i go to this strange place can i take the woman and the child with me i have no house there and no money to buy in the bazaar among strangers and in strange places evil comes here my father lived and his father before him in this house and they cleared the chenis as i do and from time to time when rain fell sowed rice below the tank what folly for me to leave my home and field in the chenna to meet evil in strange places my father said this to the headman and all the other men of the village also refused to go except one man apu they called him he went with his wife and was given land under maha potana and nothing was heard of apu for many months and his brother who still lived here at last went to maha potana to inquire about him and when he came there the people told him that apu was dead of the fever and that his wife had gone away and no one knew where she had gone but people die of fever in Betagama. yes i of course many people die of fever here too but they die among their relations and friends and people who are known to them in houses where their fathers lived before them surely it is a more bitter thing to die in a strange place i am a poor man and ignorant and i cannot explain it to you better there is always trouble and evil in strange places when a man goes even upon a journey or pilgrimage to kamburu pitaya or mahapatana or baragama always aya he is troubled and afraid in the bazaars and boutiques and on the roads people unknown to him and everywhere he is thinking of his village and his house and the tank and the jungle paths which he knows there and people living in the village all of whom he knows that is why a man will not leave his village even when the crops fail and there is no food no not even when the headmen come and they come now every year and say there is good land to be given in such a place there is work upon such a road or in such a village why starve here i have heard people say that far away in the west there are large towns colombo and kalutara and gala where every one has food and money always but i uh, not even to those towns do you see a man going who has been born and lived all his life in a village am i not now among strangers what evil will befall me may the gods keep it away from you Aya. but how can a man tell what evil is before him but you are not an ignorant village man like us and besides after the chen is reaped you will return to your house fernando was silent for a while when he spoke again he had a curiously seductive effect upon his listeners his low soft voice and broken sinhalese the languorousness and softness which seemed to pervade him fascinated them even more than what he said what can the buffalo born in the fold know of the jungle or does the wild buffalo know how to work in the rice fields i was born far away across the sea on the coast i was only a little child when they brought me to colombo to live there in the shop which my father kept he had no fear to leave his village and to cross the sea nor had he any desire to go back again there he was a rich man oh hey what a town is colombo there we lived in a great building and all around us were houses and houses and people and people no jungle or snakes or wild beasts not even a paddy field or a coconut tree always streets and people walking walking backwards and forwards on the red roads and very few even known to you by sight and bullock carts and carriages and rickshaws hundreds upon hundreds and there are houses very high as high as the hill at baragama full of white mahatmayas and their women always coming and going from the ships how many times have i stood outside when a boy and watched them always laughing and talking loud like madmen and dancing men and women together and how fair are the women fair as the lotus flower as the tale says very fair and very shameless is it true then that the women of the white mahatmayas are shameless broke in punchy manika in colombo all say they are shameless very fair very mad and very shameless their eyes are like cat's eyes the proverb says if the eyes of a woman are like the eyes of a cat evil comes to the man who looks into them the hair of the english mahatmayas women is very fair 
the colour of the young coconut flowers yes they are mad in the evening strange music is played by many men sitting high up near the roof then every mahatmaya takes a woman in his arms and looking into her eyes goes round and round very quickly on the floor aya aya is this a true tale why should i tell you what is false did i not live twenty years there in colombo it is a great town in the morning i went and walked on the stone road that has been built into the sea and within is the harbour full always of great ships bigger than villages always the mahatmayas are coming and going in the great ships from where they come and where they go no one can tell you stand upon the stone road and you see the great ship come in across the sea in the morning filled with white mahatmayas and in the evening it carries them out again across the sea they are all very rich and for a thing that costs one shilling they willingly give five also they are never quiet going here and there very quickly and doing nothing very many are afraid of them for suddenly they grow very angry their faces become red and they strike any one who is near with the closed hand fernando stopped he had become quite excited as he recalled his life in colombo in his youth he had forgotten where he was suddenly he became aware of his surroundings the little village so far away from everything the ignorant uncouth villager who listened to him the woman behind him for whose sake he had come to the hut and whom for the moment he had forgotten for a while baban did not like to disturb his silence then he asked diffidently but i if colombo is your village how is it that you now live in kamburu pataya fernando laughed what talk is this of villages he said everywhere here the question is of what village is he and then he is of Betagama or bogama or baragama or any gama and the liver in villages says as you did but now how can i leave my gama did i not tell you that i am of no village my father's village is beyond the sea and they say that the father's village is the son's i've never seen that village i've forgotten its name i was born in colombo which is no village but a town i o oh, what a town it is how pleasant the houses and the noise and smell of the bazaar for miles and the dust and people everywhere what folly to live here like a sannyasi on the top of a bare rock perhaps one day i shall return to colombo and live in a great house as my father did my father was a rich man but always gambling no money stayed in the house and i spent much money upon women there was a notch girl from the coast her eyes had made me mad and she devoured me it was always rupees and bracelets and anklets and silk cloths then my father was very angry for all the money had gone on the gambling and jewellery there was no money to pay the merchants for goods for the shop but worst of all he had no money for gambling the girl had taunted me because i had come empty-handed saying that she would shame me openly if i came back again with nothing so i again asked my father for money he drove me away cursing me so i went into the shop and took goods and sold them and taking two handfuls of silver flung them down before the girl but when my father found what i had done he cursed me again and beat me and drove me out of the house saying that if i returned he would give me to the police i ran out very sad because of the girl i was also sorry that i had given her both handfuls of silver had it not kept one for myself i stood at a street corner thinking that now i would die of hunger and that it would be better to hang myself just then there passed a moorman cassim a man of kalatara a merchant whom i had often seen in my father's shop he laughed at me when he saw me and said speaking tamil now i see that the feet of the girl have danced away with the old man's wealth and the young man's life at that the tears ran down my face and i told him all that had happened then he said come with me to kalutara you can sell there for me in my shop so i went with him to kalutara and stayed there selling for him for two years after that he sent me to sell for him in kambur pataya and there i now live and have a shop of my own fernando paused for a while then he began again you see i have no village i live always among strangers but no evil has come i left colombo without a cent and now i have become rich what folly to starve where one was born when there are riches to be got in the neighbouring village well i am going now baban accompanied his guest to the stile of the compound and took leave of him with the usual words it is well go and come again fernando was quite satisfied with his interview he thought he had gauged baban and that he would have no difficulty with him he seemed so simple and mild both the man and woman had obviously been impressed by him and by his wealth he was however still cautious he decided to make his first overture through the servant boy whom he could trust the boy was instructed carefully he was to go to punchi manika as if on his own initiative 
his master was a rich man and a great lover of women he had already remarked upon her beauty the boy was quite sure that though his master had not actually said so he desired her greatly if she agreed he would tell his master that the next night that babun was watching in the chenna she would come to his house so would receive him in hers it would benefit both her and her husband for his master was very kind and generous the attempt was a failure punch and Manika listened to what the boy had to say and then gave him a sound smack in the face which sent him crying back to his master she was very angry with the badness of these boys from the town and she did not suspect that he had been sent by his master fernando beat the servant boy and himself went to punch in Manika's compound one evening when he knew that babun would be watching at the jenna woman he said you have beaten my servant boy why is that he came here with evil words aya evil words a child of eight chi chi but he came here with evil words and lies lies what did he say that your face is very fair and that all men desire you aya aya do not speak like that he spoke shameful words i cannot tell you what he said nonsense you have beaten my servant and you must tell me why or i must go to the head man aya why force me to tell what is shameful what nonsense are you a child then what shame is there in words the boy came here with shameful words saying that you desired a woman he called me to come to you secretly at night when my man goes to the jenna fernando looked very hard at punchy manika he smiled when her eyes dropped but what if the boy did not lie what if he was sent by his master hush aya do not speak like that why am i so foul that the woman of the village of babun shrinks from me it is not that what is it then the women of colombo and cumbero pataya have not found me foul are you afraid yes aya i am afraid afraid of what what harm can come who need know and what can babun do he is a fool he owes me money what can he do i am afraid it is difficult for me to explain to you for i see you will grow angry i am a village woman ignorant i am not a woman like that i went to the man willingly even against my father's will he has been the father of my child that is dead he is good to me let me alone aya let me alone to keep his house and cook his meals for him as before why not i do not ask you to come to kamburu pataya to be my wife there is no talk of leaving your husband i am rich and can give you money and jewels you will bring good fortune to your husband for i will cancel his debts and give him the share of the other chenos which i promised him i cannot do it aya what folly there is nothing to fear the houses are near with the same fence no one will know if you come to me through the fence after nightfall if i say come i want you is it not enough do you wish me to lie on the ground before you and pray to you enough enough aya pardon me i cannot do it will you bring ruin on your man then i do not understand what she doesn't understand what cattle these people are is babun in my debt is he to get a share of my chenas yes aya i heard you tell him so well is anything given for nothing do they give you rice in the bazaar for nothing or curricon or cloth do they fool why do you stand there looking at me like a buffalo you your man tell him that i have been here and what i said will he sell you to me like a sack of curricon if not he is a fool too a dog a pig if not he gets no share of the crop from me his debts stand and the interest too i can ruin him he i will too i will ruin him do you hear that well what do you say what is there to say i i cannot do it if this thing must come to us what can we do always evil is coming into this house from the jungle my father says at first there was no food then the devil entered into my father then more evil upon my sister and her child and upon my child the children died they killed punchy apu they killed my sister and now evil again punchy Manika had spoken in a very low voice very slowly fernando stood looking at her for a moment he was affected by the resignation and sadness of her tone then he thought he had been a fool to lose his temper and threaten openly but how could one deal with cattle like these people he began to grow angry again but he recognized that it was useless and dangerous further to show his anger and disappointment he returned without another word to his house his failure astonished him almost more than it annoyed him his first thought was to approach babun himself probably the woman was only frightened of her husband and probably the husband would see more clearly the advantages to be gained by giving his consent but fernando had lost a good deal of his confidence he felt the need of an adviser and ally there could be no danger in consulting the head man in any case it would be dangerous for babahami 
to oppose him and there was every reason to believe that baba hami would be only too glad of an opportunity of working against baban and punchi manika next day after he had eaten the evening meal in the headman's house and while he was sitting in the compound with baba hami chewing batel he opened the subject i thought to get your wife's brother to oversee my janus he is a good man i think baba hami spat what will you pay him one twentieth of the crop he is a good man to work he is a good worker his chen is always the best but he is a fool he has brought disgrace upon us is he married to that woman no he went to her father's house and lives there with her it would be a good thing to take him from them is he not tired of her now he was mad about her he would not listen to reason ah but that was at first long ago they say the man first finds heaven in a woman later in a field and last in the temple would you like to get him back to your house yes well why not fernando moved nearer to baba hami and lowered his voice rala hami i must live here some months without a woman what comfort in a house the woman is not ill-looking and could cook my meals for me i had thought of this for some days so i sent my servant boy to her she answered that she would come but she was afraid of her man then i thought of speaking to the man but it is not easy for a stranger i thought if he marries this woman it is a disgrace to the headman it is better that his friends speak to him probably he is tired of the woman and will marry from another village some girl who has a dowry of land baba hami seemed to be considering the ground in front of him with great attention from time to time he spat very deliberately it was impossible to tell from his face what impression fernando's suggestion had made upon him his silence irritated fernando what swine these villagers are he thought well he said at last what do you say did she say she would come to you if baban allowed her yes but why do you ask that if the man agrees what difficulty can there be perhaps none perhaps none aye but who can say they are mad those people it happens so sometimes to people who live as we do in the jungle the spirits of the trees they say enter into a family and they are mad and a trouble to the village who knows what such people will do well what more is there to say now is the plan good yes but will you help me the plan is a good one certainly but i am on bad terms with my wife's brother we quarrelled about the girl what can i do if you talk to him now Ralahami, you quarrelled when he was hot after the girl that was long ago and a man soon tires of the woman that has borne him children and there are many ways Ralahami, to persuade him if you will help me there are the debts and the chenas and many other ways what is there that a headman cannot do it is wrong for him to sit still and watch disgrace come upon him and his family have you given him his permit to chenna yet no not yet well you can keep it back how can they live without chennas then there are the courts i can help you there for being of kambur pataya i know the ways of the courts well there will be cases and trouble for him and for them baba hami was not to be hurried he considered the proposal for some minutes it was the sort of persecution which appealed to him he would at the same time be injuring those he disliked helping those in whose debt he stood and pleasing himself he could see very little risk in it and much to gain well Aya, he said at length i will help you if i can i will speak to baban shall it be done soon yes quickly send for him now there is no harm in doing it before me and there is no time to lose if i am to get the woman baba hami was at first averse to doing things with such precipitation he liked to think over carefully each move in his game but he was over persuaded by fernando who could not restrain his impatience a message was sent to baban that the headman wanted to speak to him the bun was very much astonished at receiving this message and still more so at his reception he was given a chew of betel and welcomed warmly brother said the headman it is a bad thing for those of the same blood to quarrel this mahatmaya has been speaking of it saying that you are a good man all that is very long ago and it is well to forget it i have forgotten it i have never had a bad thought of you in my mind brother good good nor i of you brother really well and how are things with you now the light half of the moon returns this mahatmaya is giving me his genus to work for a share of the crop good good where there is food there is happiness never have i known a year like this and i am growing an old man now on the poya day two months back there was not a karani of grain in all the village i went to the kerala mahatmaya i said to him can men live on air he is a hard man he said his stomach swollen with rice for ten years now i have told you to leave your village there are fields and land elsewhere there is work elsewhere they pay for work on the roads 
if you make your paddy field and rock do you expect the rice to grow i said to him the government must give food or the people will die then he said go away and die quickly and he abused me calling me a tom-tom beater and drove me away so i went to this mahatmaya and arranged about the chenas had not it been for him we should all have starved i know the mahatmaya has been very good and now again the mahatmaya said to me it is a foolish thing to quarrel with a brother it is long ago and about a woman a young man hot after a woman what use is it send for him and be friends but mahatmaya is very good to us i was wrong brother i say it to you myself i use shameful words to you but that was long ago a young man must have a woman it is foolish to stand in his way even the buck will turn upon you in the rutting season all that is forgotten now so the mahatmaya says it is time he said for him to marry send for him and become friends again for the heat of youth is now past so i sent for you i have come he said to me now is the time the boy has become a man when he learns about the woman he will do as you ask i do not understand that the woman has offered to go and live with the mahatmaya and cook his meals for him so the mahatmaya says very well i will take her to live with me while i am here i will give her food and money and also to her father i will give work in my channels to your brother so your brother can leave the woman and marry from another village i do not understand i do not wish to marry from another village and what offer of the woman do you talk of the woman came to the mahatmaya while you were away in the chenna she offered herself to him the mahatmaya said to her i cannot take you unless the man gives you then he came to me he said to me this woman says this and that to me it would be better for me to take her to live with me while i am here and you should marry your brother to an honest woman so i sent for you it must be lies brother it must be lies who told this to you the mahatmaya himself would he tell lies is this true ayah baban asked fernando yes it is true the woman came to me the woman is a whore brother i told you so long ago it is better that you should give her to the mahatmaya and marry now from another village you can come back to my house and live here meanwhile baban was dazed his first instinct had been to disbelieve entirely the story about punchy manika he did not believe it now but he could not disbelieve it why should the mahatmaya lie he could not tell him to his face that he was lying he got up and stood hesitating the others watched him fernando had difficulty in repressing his laughter several times baban opened his mouth to speak and then stopped i do not understand he said at last i do not understand this the woman went to the mahatmaya offered herself aya that cannot be so surely she would be afraid yet you yourself say it's true ayo i do not understand i must go to the woman herself babahami got up and caught hold of baban by the arm trying to prevent his leaving the compound do not do that brother let her go let her go to the mahatmaya and do you stay here my house is always open to you stay now and i will tell the woman to go to the mahatmaya no no i must see her myself what is the use there will only be abuse and angry words it is always lies or foul words in a woman's mouth i must go brother i must see her myself what folly but you would never listen to me and see what has come of it she is a whore it was known before but you would not believe it you would not listen hark the lizard chirps it is an evil hour but again you do not listen you are going brother to meet misfortune but bun allowed himself to be brought back into the compound his mind worked slowly and he was dazed by the shock and by the insinuating stream of the headman's words but there was a curious obstinacy about him which babahami recognized and feared but bun came back but he did not squat down again he stood near fernando his forehead was wrinkled with perplexity surely the story could not be true and yet how could it be false why should the mahatmaya and babahami lie to him the simplicity of his character made him always inclined to believe at once and without question anything said to him the head man had reckoned on this and his plan would probably but for fernando have succeeded suddenly however the latter could no longer restrain his amusement the wrinkled forehead the open mouth the pain and hesitation in baban's face as he stood before him seemed to him extraordinarily ridiculous he laughed the laugh broke the spell baban turned again i must see the woman herself he said as he walked away that was foolish aya said babahami to fernando very foolish he would have stayed i know but i couldn't help it he stood there like a bull pulled this and way and that with a string in his nose what now he will come back then we shall see it is spoiled now i think this bull is an obstinate brute when it jibs we may have to use the goad it will be the only way i think 
they waited in silence the headman proved right babun returned he did not speak to fernando but addressed himself to baba hami the mahatmaya was right to laugh at me for a fool yes i am a fool i know that the tale was false it was the mahatmaya who called the woman to come to him and she refused i knew it yes brother i knew it but i was frightened by your words i thought he is my sister's man why should he lie to me it was lies the woman wept for shame when i told her it was true brother it is the woman who is lying now to you she is frightened of you frightened that you should know what she has done i am a fool brother but what use is there in repeating lies now the story was false it was the mahatmaya who came to my house and called the woman to him she refused she would not leave me he turned to fernando ayah why come and trouble us we are poor and ignorant and you have wealth and women in the town as you told us leave us in peace ayah leave us in peace it is not lies broke in babahani truly you are a fool the woman is ashamed now and lies to you and you believe but what has that to do with it the mahatmaya is now ready to take the woman it is time that this folly should end let him take her and come back to this house she refuses i tell you what is that to do with it it is time for you to marry and leave that filth what is the good brother of beginning this again it will only lead to angry words again i told you so many years back that i want no other wife than this it is the same now i will live with no one else all these lies and words are useless oh hey oh hey it may lead to angry words yes but are they useless last time you refused to listen to me well i did nothing i allowed you to go your own way you brought shame on me and my family i did nothing i let you go but now it is different suppose they were lies the words spoken by me just now they weren't but suppose they were what then the mahatmaya wants the woman now he calls her to him she will not come you refuse to give her is it wise wise brother think a little is there much Kurakan in the house after the drought the mahatmaya has made you overseer of his genus if the woman is refused will you remain overseer the twentieth of the crop will go i think to someone else is it wise for the bull to fight against the master when he has the goat in his hand is it wise too always to be fighting against the headman even the headman has a little power still the chenna permit has not yet come for you perhaps it may never come who knows the mahatmaya will not do that and you you are my brother if the woman has not given to me said fernando neither will the twentieth be given to you i have not come here to be laughed at by cattle like you first the woman has offered and then i am refused what does it mean would you try to make me out a fool very well i then i will not have the twentieth the woman cannot be given to you fool said barbara hami so you refuse again to listen to me but remember this time it will not be as it was before you shall not always disgrace and insult me i have never spoken nor thought evil of you brother but i tell you as i told you before i will not live without this woman it is useless to talk more for nothing but angry words will follow therefore i am going baban did not wait for any answer from the two men but went quickly from the compound the other two sat on discussing the matter for long they had to take their steps quickly for fernando would only be a few weeks in the village and he was very anxious now that he was really opposed to possess punchy manica their plans were laid that night end of chapter seven part one chapter seven part two of the village in the jungle by leonard wolf this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven part two babun and selinda very soon became aware of the web that was being spun around them they had already begun to cultivate a chenna together two days after babun's conversation with baba hami and fernando they found another man baba sinno a near relation of baba hami in occupation of it babun went to the headman to inquire what this meant the headman was quite ready to explain it no permit could be given to babun and selindu this year it was a government rule that permits were to be given only to fit persons babun and selindu were not fit persons therefore no permits could be given to them that was all they returned to the compound amazed overwhelmed babun explained to selindu the real cause 
of the headman's act the proposal of fernando and its reception it was clear that the two men would stop at nothing that they had determined upon the complete ruin of Selindu's family unless punchy manica were given up for if no chenna were given it meant starvation for they had at the utmost food only for a month and besides that nothing but their debts they saw that baba sino was but a foil they did not dare to turn him out by force because they had no permits which would give them the right to do so if they had felt that there was any one in the village who would openly take their part it would have been different but they knew that no one would dare to side with them against the headman and fernando who already held the whole village enmeshed in their debt the more they discussed it the more horrible became their fear in a month they would be starving or forced to leave the village there was only one thing for them to do to put the whole case before the assistant government agent baban set off for kamburu pataya next morning with this object his trouble and his fear drove him and he did the three days journey in two on the morning of the third day hours before the office opened he was standing haggard and frightened on the kutch jerry veranda waiting to fall at the feet of the assistant agent at last a peon or two arrived and later some clerks at first no one took any notice of him then a peon came and asked him what he wanted he told him that he had come to make a complaint to the assistant agent the peon said the assistant agent is always on circuit you must send a petition when will he be back i don't know where is he now Aya? i don't know he had not the few cents necessary to buy him a fuller answer he went from one peon to another and from one clerk to another trying to learn more particulars they told him nothing they did not know they said when the assistant agent would return or where he was he had better have a petition written and come again a week later he became stupid with fear and misery he hung about the veranda hour after hour doing nothing and thinking of nothing at last late in the afternoon he wandered aimlessly into the bazaar he was passing the shop of the moorman who had previously made many loans in Betagama. Kasim, who was sitting within doing nothing knew baban and called out to him what are you doing in kamburu pataya baban like cotton down in a storm what is the matter with you i hear the dog fernando is in Betagama may he die of the fever i've been to the kachchari to lay a complaint before the agent hama doru the agent hama doru is away on circuit i cannot learn where he is or when he returns oh hey a complaint those dogs of peons every one knows where the agent hama doru is except the peon and he only knows when there are phantoms in his hand the agent hama doru is in gal badapatu on circuit he will not return for another ten days every one knows that are you then we are ruined why what is it we are ruined only the agent hama doru could help us and now it will be too late our chenna is taken from us ayo ayo is this one of fernando's games they say that the chennas are his now and not the government's the low caste fisher vesiga puda he is a madalali now i expect he hopes to be made the agent hamodoru one day it is he Aya, he and the headman they want me to give my wife to the madalali i refused now they have taken my chenna from me they will ruin me the agent hamodoru if he knew 
would have interfered to stop this but now it will be too late by the time i can complain to him it will be too late ayah the fat moorman rolled from side to side with laughter oh the dog oh the dog oh the dog there is no one like these fishers for finding money and women everywhere allah they call us moormen cunning and clever the only thing i ever found in badagama was bad debts and here the swine of a fisher finds not only bags of grain and bags of rupees there but women too but i am sorry for you baban i remember you you were a good man in that accursed village come in here now and i'll see what i can do for you i should like to stop that swine's game but it is difficult one wants time we must send a petition the agent hamadoru would stop it if he knew but there are always peons and clerks and headmen in the way before you can get to him sense here and sense there and delays and inquiries you want time and we haven't got it but there is nothing for it but a petition here now i'll write it myself for you to spite that dog fernando the mother lolly made baban give him all the particulars and he wrote the petition and stamped and posted it he told baban to come in again to kamburu pataya in ten days time to see him about it he also gave him food and made him sleep that night in his veranda the next day baban somewhat comforted set out for his village he was very weary by the time that he reached it he felt that he could show little gain from his journey to Salindu and panchiminika ruin seemed very near to them they could do little but sit gloomily talking of their fears but baba hami and fernando were meanwhile not idle the cunning headman and the townman with his energetic fertile mind were a strong combination on the morning after baban's return to the village a rumour spread through the village that the headman's house had been broken into during the night and that baba hami had left at once to complain to the kerala late in the afternoon of the same day the kerala and baba hami arrived in the village they called to them three or four of the village men and went with them straight to Salindu's compound the kerala a fat consequential bullying man went in first and summoned baban Salindu and panchi manika they were handed over to baba hami's brother who was instructed to keep them in the compound and not to allow them out of his sight the news of the burglary had not reached baban and Salindu. they were bewildered by what was passing they saw the kerala go into the house with baba hami they were some time in the house while the men in the compound talked together in whispers a little group of men and women had gathered outside the fence and fernando stood in the door of his house watching what was happening at last the two headmen came out of the house the kerala was carrying a bundle he walked up to baban and showed him the bundle it consisted of two cloths a pair of gold earrings and some other pieces of gold jewellery where did you get these from yako he asked i know nothing about them they are not mine don't lie yako they were in your house where did you get them from hama doru i know nothing about them some one must have put them there lies they were stolen last night from the arach cheese house the madalali saw you leaving the house in the night curse you i shall have to take you into kamburu pataya now to the court and the magistrate hamadoru and what about this fellow pointing to Slindu? do you charge him as well yes mahatmaya said baba hami but there is the box too should not the jungle round the house be searched for it yes hi there you fellows go and search that piece of jungle there three or four men went off slowly and began a desultory search in the jungle which lay behind the compound suddenly there was a cry and one of them lifted up a large box he brought it to the kerala the lock had been forced open it was recognized as the headman's the case was complete and the onlookers recognized that the evidence against baban was damning baban and Salindu were taken off to the headman's house they had to spend the night in the veranda with baba hami's brother who was there to see that they did not run away 
the injustice of this new catastrophe seemed to have completely broken baban's spirit his misfortunes were too many and sudden for him to fight against he refused to talk and squatted with his back against the wall silent throughout the night the effect upon selinda was different she saw at last the malignity of the headman and how his life had been ruined by it this last stroke made him aware of the long series of misfortunes which he now felt were all due to the same cause this knowledge roused him at last from his resignation and from the torpor habitual to his mind he talked incessantly in a low voice sometimes to baban but more often apparently to himself they call me a hunter a veda a fine hunter to be hunted for years now and not to know it it is the headman who is the veda a very clever hunter i've been lying here like a fat old stag in a thicket while he was crawling crawling nearer and nearer round and round looking for the shot where was the watching doe to cry the alarm always he shot me down as i lay quiet but the old hunter should be very careful in the end misfortune comes perhaps this time i am a buffalo wounded the wise hunter does not follow up the wounded buffalo where the jungle is thick ha ha the wounded buffalo can be as clever as the clever hunter he hears the man crawling and crawling through the jungle he stands there out of the track in the shadows the great black head down the blood bubbling through the wound listening to the twig snap and the dry leaves rustle and the man comes nearer and nearer fool you cannot see him there but he can see you now he will let you pass him and then out he will dash upon you and his great horns will crash into your side and he will fling you backwards through the air as if you were paddy straw the old buffalo knows the old buffalo knows the young men laugh at him buffalo's eyes they say blind eyes foolish eyes a foolish face like a buffalo but he is clever ama he is clever when wounded when he hears the hunter after him cleverer than the cleverest hunter and when it has gone on for years all his life what will he do then will he lie quiet then oh he will lie quiet yes and let them take all from him daughter and home and food he will shake his head and sigh the great sigh and lie quiet in the mud of the wallow very sad and then at last they come after his life shall they take that too then at last he knows and is angry very angry and he stands waiting for them the fools they come on crawling still they do not know that he is ready for them now the fools the fools the next morning the kerala took with him the complainant the accused and the witnesses of whom fernando turned out to be one and started for kamburu pataya banchi manika went with them they travelled slowly and reached kamburu pataya on the fourth morning selindu had relapsed into his usual state of sullen silence baban's spirit appeared to be completely broken he scarcely understood what the charge against him was he knew nothing of why or on what evidence it had been made he waited bewildered to see what new misfortune fate and his enemies would bring upon him the parties and witnesses in the case were taken at once to the courthouse they waited about all the morning on the veranda the court was a very large oblong room with a roof of flat red tiles at one end was the bench a raised dais with a wooden balustrade around it there were a table and a chair upon the dais in the centre of the room was a large table with chairs round it for the bar and the more respectable witnesses at the further end of the room was the dock a sort of narrow oblong cage made of a wooden fence with a gate in it selindu and baban were locked up in this cage and a court peon stood by the gate in charge of them there was no other furniture in the room except the witness box a small square wooden platform surrounded by a wooden balustrade on three of its sides nothing happened all the morning baban and selindu squatted down behind the bars of their cage they were silent they had never been in so vast or so high a room the red tiles of the roof seemed a very long way above their heads outside they could hear the murmur of the sea and the rush of the wind and the whispered conversation of the witnesses on the veranda but inside the empty room the silence awed them 
about one o'clock there was a stir through the court the headman hurried in a proctor or two came and sat down at the table the peon nudged baban and Salindu and told them to stand up then they saw white hamadoru an englishman appear on the dais and sit down the court interpreter a sinhalese mahatmaya in coat and trousers stood upon a small wooden step near the bench the judge spoke to him in an angry voice the interpreter replied in a soothing deferential tone the conversation being in english was unintelligible to baban and Salindu. then the door of their cage was unlocked and they were led out and made to stand up against the wall on the left of the bench the courthouse stood on a bare hill which rose above the town a small headland which ran out into the sea to form one side of the little bay the judge as he sat upon the bench looked out through the great open doors opposite to him down upon the blue waters of the bay the red roofs of the houses and then the interminable jungle the grey jungle stretching out to the horizon and the faint line of the hills and throughout the case this vast view framed like a picture in the heavy wooden doorway was continually before the eyes of the accused their eyes wandered from the bare room to the boats and the canoes bobbing up and down in the bay to the group of little figures on the shore hauling in the great nets under the blazing sun to the dust storm sweeping over the jungle miles away where they lived the air of the court was hot heavy oppressive the voices of those who spoke seemed both to themselves and to the others unreal in the stillness the murmur of the little waves in the bay the confused shouts of the fishermen on the shore the sound of the wind in the trees floated up to them as if from another world it was like a dream they did not understand what exactly was happening this was a case and they were the accused that was all they knew the judge looked at them and frowned this increased their fear and confusion the judge said something to the interpreter who asked them their names in an angry threatening voice Salindu had forgotten what his his gay name was the interpreter became still more angry at this and Salindu still more sullen and confused from time to time the judge said a few sharp words in english to the interpreter Salindu and baban were never quite certain whether he was or was not speaking to them or whether when the interpreter spoke to them in sinhalese the words were really his own or whether he was interpreting what the judge had said at last the question of the names was settled baba hami was told to go into the witness box as he did so a proctor stood up at the table and said i appear for the complainant your honour any one for the defence said the judge have you a proctor the interpreter asked Salindu. no said baban we are very poor no your worship said the interpreter baba hami knew exactly what to do it was not the first time he had given evidence he was quite at his ease when he made the affirmation that he would tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth he gave his name and his occupation then his proctor stood up and said to him now arachchi tell us exactly what has happened abihami cleared his throat and then told the following story in a rather sing-song voice about four days ago when i woke up in the morning my wife had gone out into the compound i heard her cry out ayo someone has made a hole in the wall of the house i ran out and saw a hole on the western side of the house the hole was big enough for a man to crawl through there are two rooms in the house one on the eastern side and one on the western side we my wife and i were sleeping that night in the room on the east side in the other room was a wooden box in which were clothes and two new sarong cloths and jewellery belonging to my wife the box was locked when i saw the hole i ran back into the house to see if the box was safe i found it had disappeared at that i cried out ayo my box has been stolen then the mudalali who had been staying in the hut next to mine 
hearing the cries came up and asked what was the matter i told him he said last night about four pias before dawn i went out into the compound for a call of nature i heard a noise in your compound thinking it was a wild pig i stepped back into the doorway and looked then i saw your brother-in-law come running from your compound carrying something in his hands he ran into the jungle behind his own house i went straight off to the village of the kerala mahatmaya it lies many miles away to the north then when the sun was about there pointing about three-quarters way up the wall of the court i met the kerala mahatmaya on the road the kerala mahatmaya said what are you coming this way for to trouble me i am going to kamburupataya i told him what had happened and turned with him to go back we came to the village in the afternoon the kerala mahatmaya went to the accused house and searched in the roof between the thatch he found the two sarong cloths and my wife's jewelry and the box with the lock broken was found in the jungle behind the house when baba hami began his story baban and selindu had not really listened to what he was saying they were still dazed and confused they did not quite understand what was going on but as he proceeded they gradually grasped what he was doing and when he told the story about the mudalali they saw the whole plot their brains worked slowly they felt they were trapped there was no way out of it baba hami's proctor stood up to examine him but the judge interrupted him the first accused i understand is the brother-in-law of the complainant is that correct i propose to charge the accused now but is there any evidence against the second accused Salindo isn't his name mr perara the proctor called baba hami to him and had a whispered conversation with him there is no evidence sir he said to the judge to connect him directly with the theft but he was in the house in which the first accused lived on the night in question he must have been an accessory he is the owner of the house i understand and might be charged with receiving no certainly not if that's your only evidence to connect him with the theft i should not be prepared to convict in any case mr pereira i shall discharge him at once especially as the man does not look as if he is quite right in the head very well sir charge the first accused only said the judge to the interpreter there is no evidence against the second accused he can go this conversation had been in english and therefore was again unintelligible to the two accused their bewilderment was increased therefore when the interpreter said to selindu you there go away selindu not knowing where he had to go remained where he was can't you hear yako shouted the interpreter clear out the peon came up and pushed selindu out on to the veranda a small group of idle spectators laughed at him as he came out they'll hang you in the evening father said a small boy i thought the judge hama doru said ten years rigorous imprisonment said a young man selindu turned to an old man who looked like a villager and said what does it mean friend every one laughed you are acquitted said the old man go back to your buffaloes baban also did not understand the acquittal of selindu things appeared to be happening around him as if he were in a dream the interpreter came and stood in front of him and said the following sentence very fast in sinhalese you are charged under section ten ten of the penal code with housebreaking and theft of a box clothing and jewelry in the house of the complainant on the ninth of the tenth instant and you are called on to show cause why you should not be convicted i don't understand hamadoru you heard what the complainant said yes hama doru he charges you with the theft have you anything to say i know nothing about this he says he knows nothing about this said the interpreter to the judge any witnesses said the judge have you any witnesses said the interpreter to baban how can i have witnesses no one will give evidence against the headman any reason for a false charge asked the judge Hamadoru the headman is on very bad terms with me he is angry with me because of my wife he is angry with my wife's father he wanted me to marry from another village then he wanted me to give my wife to the mudalali and because i refused he is angry anything else baban was silent there was nothing more to say he looked out through the great doors of the jungle 
he tried to think where beta gama was but looking down upon it from that distance it was impossible to detect any landmark in the unbroken stretch of trees very well mr pereira said the judge mr pereira got up again and began to examine baba hami how long have you been a headman fifteen years have you ever had a private case before no are you on bad terms with your brother-in-law no but he is on bad terms with me how is that there is a government order that chenins are only to be given to fit persons the accused is not a fit person he could do work but he is lazy therefore chenins were refused to him he thought that i had done this it was a kach chari order from the agent hamodori last week he was very angry and threatened me because of it the mudalali heard him is the mudalali a friend of yours how could he be aya he is a mahatmaya of kamburu pataya i am only a village man how could he be a friend of mine he comes to the village merely to collect debts due to him and when he comes you let him stay in the unoccupied house next to yours otherwise you do not know him yes that is true aya is the kerala related to you no a friend of yours no he was on bad terms with me he said i troubled him and was a bad headman mr pereira sat down any questions said the judge any questions the interpreter asked baban i don't understand said baban yako said the interpreter angrily do you want to ask complainant any questions what questions are there to ask it is lies what he said there was a pause while the judge waited for baban to think of a question the silence confused him and all the eyes looking at him he fixed his own eyes on the jungle at last baban thought of a question did you not ask me to give the woman to the mudalali no said bamahami did not the mudalali call her to go to his house i know nothing of that weren't you angry when i married the woman no baban turned desperately to the judge hamadoru he said it is all lies he is saying the judge was looking straight at him but baban could read nothing in the impassive face the light eyes the cat's eyes of the white hamadoru frightened him is that all said the judge baban was silent who is this mudalali said the judge sharply to baba hami fernando mudalali hamadoru he comes from kamburu pataya he is a trader he lends money in the village what's he doing in the village now he has come to collect debts when did he come about a week ago when is he going i don't know is he married i don't think so i don't know why do you give him a house to live in hamadoru the little hut was empty he came to me and said arachchi he said i must stay here a few days i want a house there is that hut of yours can i live in it so i said why not whose is the hut mine why did you build it it was built hamadoru for this brother-in-law of mine when i don't know what do you mean hamadoru last year i think but your brother-in-law lives with his father-in-law yes and why did you build him a house there was talk of his leaving the other people has the mudalali ever stayed in the village before no do you owe anything to him no next witness baba hami stood down and the kerala entered the witness box he was examined by mr pereira he told his story very simply and quietly he had met bamahami who had told him that his house had been broken into and that a box had been stolen he described the box and its contents he suspected his brother-in-law who had been seen going away from his house in the night by the mudalali the kerala then described how he went in and searched the house and how he found the cloths and jewellery which answered to baba hami's previous description he then produced them the proctor examined him are you on good terms with the complainant i am not on good terms or bad terms with him i only know him as a headman do you complain of his troubling you i complained that he was a bad headman he has troubled me with silly questions he is an ignorant man mr pereira sat down any questions asked the judge any questions asked the interpreter of baban baban shook his head what questions are there he said 
do you know this mudalali said the judge to the kerala i have seen him before in kamburu pataya have you seen him before in Betagama? no did you know that he was there no do you know of any ill-feeling between complainant and accused no i did not know the accused at all i live many miles from Betagama. next witness fernando was the next witness he wore for the occasion a black european coat a pink starched shirt and a white cloth he was cool and unabashed he told how he had gone out in the night for a call of nature how he had heard a noise in the compound of the headman and had then seen baban come out carrying something and go with it into the jungle behind his own house could you see what it was asked the proctor not distinctly he walked as if it were heavy it was rather large how did you recognize him can you swear it was he i can swear that it was the accused i recognized him first by his walk but i also saw his face in the moonlight are you on bad terms with the accused does he owe you money i'm not on bad terms with him i scarcely know him he owes me for Kurakan lent to him i had arranged to make him my kambaraya all the villagers there owe me money how long have you been in the village about ten days i am making arrangements for the recovery of my loans last crop failed and therefore much is owed to me the proctor sat down any questions said the judge any questions said the interpreter to baban baban shook his head it is lies they are telling he murmured are you married the judge asked fernando no you live with a woman in kambura pataya yes how did you come to settle in the hut in Betagama? i was getting into difficulties with my loans because the crop failed last year i thought i must go to the village during the chenna season and arrange for the repayment i saw the hut empty there and went to the headman and asked whether i might live there he said yes do you know the accused's wife i have seen her their compound adjoins that of the hut otherwise i do not know her next witness the man who had found the box gave evidence of how and where he had found it various villagers were then called who identified the things found in selindu's hut and the box as having belonged to babahami they all denied any knowledge of ill feeling between baban and the headman or of any intimacy between the headman and fernando this closed the case for the prosecution the judge then addressed baban in a speech which was interpreted to him baban should now call any witnesses whom he might have it was for him to decide whether he would himself go into the witness-box and give evidence if he gave evidence he would be liable to cross-examination by baba hami's proctor if he did not he the judge might draw any conclusion from his refusal baban did not really understand what this meant he did not reply well said the interpreter i don't understand are you going to give evidence yourself as the judge hama doru lights explain it to him properly said the judge now look here there is the evidence of the kerala that he found the things in your house there is no evidence of his being a prejudiced witness there is the evidence of fernando that he saw you leaving the complainant's hut at night you say that fernando wants your wife and that the headman is in league with him against you at present there is no evidence of that at all according to your story the things must have been deliberately put into your house by a complainant or fernando or both listen to what i am saying have you any witnesses or evidence of all this hamadoru how could i get witnesses of this no one will give evidence against the headman i will adjourn the case if you want to call witnesses from the village what is the good no one will speak the truth well then you'd better in any case give evidence yourself get up here said the interpreter baban got into the witness box he told his story the judge asked him many questions then the proctor began cross-examining are you on bad terms with the kerala do you know him well i'm not on bad terms i scarcely know him do you know that fernando came to the village to recover money that he has arranged to get the chenna crops from many of the villagers in repayment of his loans yes did he ask you to act as overseer of those chennas and promise you a share of the crop if you did yes because he thought you the best worker in the village yes i think so 
when did this happen about a week ago the proctor sat down the bun called no witnesses there was a curious look of pain and distress in his face the judge watched him in silence for some minutes then he told the interpreter to call Slindu. Slindu was pushed into the box the interpreter recited the words of the affirmation to him he said i do not understand hama doru it took some time to make him understand that he had only to repeat the words after the interpreter he sighed and looked quickly from side to side like a hunted animal the eyes of the judge frightened him he was uncertain whether he was being charged again with the theft he had not listened to what was going on after he had been sent out of the court it occurred vaguely to him that the best thing would be to pretend to be completely ignorant of everything he still thought of the wounded buffalo listening to the hunter crawling after him through the scrub he doesn't move he muttered to himself until he is sure he stands quite stupid and still listening always but when he sees clear then out he rushes charging stop that muttering said the judge and listen carefully to what i ask you you've got to speak the truth there's no charge against you you've got nothing to fear if you speak the truth do you understand i understand hama doru said Selinda, but he thought they are cunning hunters they lie still in the undergrowth waiting for the old bull to move but he knows he stands quite still is there any reason why the headman should bring a false case against you and the accused i don't know hamadoru you are not on bad terms with him personally i have nothing against him he does not like me they say why doesn't he like you hamadoru how should i know that you have never had any quarrel with him no hamadoru are you related to him i married a cousin of his wife the accused lives in your house he is married to your daughter yes hamadoru do you know of any quarrel between him and the headman how should i know that there was no quarrel at the time of the marriage they say this and that but how should i know hamadoru you know nothing about it yourself then no hamadoru do you know the madalali fernando no hamadoru you don't know him doesn't he stay in the hut adjoining your compound i have seen him there i have never spoken with him did you hear of anything between him and your daughter they talk hamadoru what did they say they said he wanted my daughter who said when this man pointing to baban when three or four days ago you know nothing more yourself about this no hamadoru neither baban nor baba hami's proctor asked Selindu any questions he was told to go away and was pushed out of court by the peon the case was over only the judgment had to be delivered now the judge leant back in his chair gazing over the jungle at the distant hills there was not a sound in the court outside down on the shore the net had been hauled in and the fish sold not a living being could be seen now except an old fisherman sitting by a broken canoe and looking out over the waters of the bay the wind had died away and sea and jungle lay still and silent under the afternoon sun the court seemed very small now suspended over this vast and soundless world of water and trees but bun became very afraid in the silence the judge began to write no one else moved and the only sound in the world seemed to be the scratching of the pen upon the paper at last the judge stopped writing he looked at baban and began to read out his judgment in a casual indifferent voice as if in some way it had nothing to do with him the interpreter translated it sentence by sentence to baban there is almost certainly something behind this case which has not come out there is i feel some ill feeling between complainant and accused the complainant impressed me most unfavourably but the facts have to be considered there can be no doubt that complainant's things were found hidden in the house in which accused lives and that the box was found in the jungle behind the house the evidence of the kerala is obviously trustworthy on these points there is clear evidence too that a hole had been made in complainant's house wall then there is the evidence of the mata lali as matters stand it was for the accused to show that that evidence was untrustworthy he has not really attempted to do this his father-in-law's evidence if anything goes to show that there is nothing in complainant's story that fernando wanted to get hold of his wife accused's defence implies that there was a deliberate conspiracy against him 
i cannot accept his mere statement that such a conspiracy existed without any corroborating evidence or motive for it he has no such evidence even if there were ill feeling over the refusal of a chenna or something else it would cut both ways that is it might have been accused's motive for the theft a convict accused and sentenced him to six months rigorous imprisonment the bun had not understood a word of the broken sentences of the judgment until the interpreter came to the last word six months rigorous imprisonment even then it was only when the peon took hold of him by the arm to put him back again into the cage that he realized what it meant that he was to be sent to prison hamadoru he burst out i have not done this i cannot go to prison hamadoru it is all lies it is lies that he has said he is angry with me i have not done this i swear on the barakama temple i have not done this i cannot go to prison there is the woman hamadoru what will become of her oh i have not done this i have not the proctors and idlers smiled the peon and the interpreter told baban to hold his tongue the judge got up and turned to leave the court i am sorry he said but the decision has been given i treated you very leniently as a first offender every one stood up in silence as the judge left the court as soon as he left everything became confusion proctors witnesses court officials and spectators all began talking at once baban crouched down moaning in the cage punchy manika began to shriek on the veranda until the peon came out and drove her away only selindu maintained his sullenness and calmness he followed baban when he was taken away by the peon to the lock-up at one point when he saw that the peon was not looking he laid his hand on baban's arm and whispered it is all right son it is all right don't be afraid the old buffalo is cunning still very soon he will charge he smiled and nodded at baban and then left him to find punchy manika it took some time for selindu to find punchy manika she had wandered aimlessly away from the court through the bazaar selindu was now extraordinarily excited he seemed to be almost happy he ran up to her took her by the hand and began leading her quickly away out of the town we must go away at once he said there is much to think of and much to do it is late but we at least do not fear the jungle the jungle is better than the town we can sleep by the big trees at the second hill but a poach gee my man what will become of him what will they do to him will they kill him the bun is all right i have told him the government do not kill there is no killing here but in the jungle always killing the leopard and jackal and the hunter yes and the hunter always killing the blood of deer and pig and buffalo and at last the hunting of the hunter very slow very quiet very cunning and at the end after a long time the blood of the hunter but approach g stop do what does it mean they are taking him to prison what will they do with him shall we never see him again the hunter yes yes we shall see him again very soon but he will not see us what is this about the hunter it is my man i am talking about oh baban he is all right the white hamadoru said six months rigorous imprisonment i heard that quite clear at the end six months rigorous imprisonment it was all that i heard clearly he is all right there is no need for you to cry they will take him away over there selindu pointed to the east there is a great house i remember i saw it a long time ago when i went on a pilgrimage with my mother they will put him in the great house and give him rice to eat so i hear then he will come back to the village but it will be after the hunting oh Apochji, are you sure yes child all will be well after the hunting but now i must think punchy manika saw that it would be impossible to get anything more out of selindu in his present state they walked on in silence as they walked his excitement began to die down he seemed to be thinking deeply from time to time he muttered to himself late in the evening they came to the big trees selindu collected some sticks and made a fire then he squatted down while punchy manika cooked some food which they had carried with them once or twice as they sat round the fire after having eaten the food punchy manika began to question selindu about baban but he did not reply he did not seem to hear her her mind was numb by the fear and uncertainty she lay down on the ground and an uneasy sleep came to her suddenly she was aroused by selindu shaking her she saw in the light of the fire how his face was working with excitement child there are two of them two of them the whole time and i never saw it what do you mean where hunting me child hunting us all me you and baban and hinihami they killed hinihami your sister 
i found her lying there in the jungle dying they did that but they shall not get you there are two of them listen i hear them crawling round us in the jungle do you hear now there i thought there was only one fool that i was the little headman but now i hear them both the little headman first and then the other the man with the smooth black face and the smile it was he wasn't it didn't baban say so he came to you and called you to come to his house baban said so i heard him fernando the mudalali he wanted to take you away but he couldn't then he went to the headman and together they went to hunt us isn't that true isn't that true yes approached she yes it was because they wanted me for the mudalali then they took the chenna away and then they brought the case they have taken my man from me what shall i do hush i'm here they shall do no more listen child it is true that they have taken baban from you for six months he will be over there very well they think they thought to send me there too but the judge hamadora was wise get out he said to me i did not understand then and they laughed at me but i understand now well those two will come back to the village the man they think is away over there for six months only the woman and the mad father are here what can they do the mudalali can now take the woman is this true apochji it is what i fear it is true it is true but do not be afraid the old father is there but he is not altogether mad the mudalali will come back to-morrow perhaps or the next day with the headman and they will begin again yes yes that is what i fear apochji what can we do we must go away hush child do not cry out there is no need to be afraid we cannot go away how can we live away from the village and the jungle which we know that is foolish talk there in the town i do not understand even what they say to me and the noise and the talking in the bazaar and people always laughing and the long hard roads and so many houses all together how could we live there but in the village i am not altogether mad it is folly to talk of leaving it and the jungle very soon i shall feel the gun in my hand again then i shall be a man again slipping between the trees very quietly ha ha we know the tracks little arachchi i remember child when i was but a boy i went out once with my father for skins and horns he was a good hunter and knew the jungle well we went on and on many days round and round too he leading and i following and at last we came to very thick jungle which not even he knew and a sort of madness came on us to go on and on always and we had forgotten the village and the wife and another the jungle was tall dense and dark and the sky was covered with cloud day after day so that one could not tell the west from the east and at last when we had many skins and horns my father stopped and stood still on the track and laughed child he said we are mad we have become like the bear and the elephant it is time to return to the village then he turned round and began to walk soon he stopped again frowning it was very dark he stood there for a little thinking and then climbed a very big tree and looked around for a long time then he came down and i saw from his face that he was very afraid we said nothing but started off again for many payas we walked and always through very thick jungle again he stopped and climbed a tree and again when he came down there was a great fear in his face ayo that was the first time that i saw the fear the real fear of the jungle but then i did not understand i poached he i said what is the matter boy he said and his voice trembled we are lost i do not know where we are nor where the village lies nor how we came nor which is east and which is west from the trees i can see nothing which i know not even the hill at baragama only the tops of the trees everywhere therefore we must be very far from the village i have heard of such things happening to very good hunters but always before i have known the way punchi apu must have died like that wandering on and on until no powder is left and no food Ayo, the jungle will take us as they say then i said apochchi do not be afraid i do not know which way we came and i cannot tell just now which is west and which is east because of the clouds but i know where the village lies it is over there can you lead the way he asked and i said yes then he said perhaps you know perhaps you do not but now one way is as good as another for me you go first at that i was pleased and led on straight to where i knew the village must lie for two days i led the way and my father said nothing but i saw that he became more and more afraid and on the third day suddenly he cried out 
i know this this track leads to the village you are going right it was a track i had never been on but i still led the way and on the fourth day we entered the village well what was i saying yes i know the tracks even in those days when i was a boy i knew the jungle but this time it requires clever hunting yes a poached tea but what to do now when they come back to the village those two ah now you listen child i thought over it all this time and there's only one way i shall kill them both kill them oh a poached tea no no you are mad am i mad and what if i am haven't they always called me mad the mad veta well now let them see if i am mad or not have they not hunted me for all these years and am i always to go running like a stupid deer through the jungle no no little arachchi no no this time it is the old wounded buffalo three times four times that night in the hut when i saw it first i got up to get my gun and ended and again after the cord i would have done it had i had a gun but i thought no not yet for once we must act cunningly not in anger only the buffalo's eye is red with anger but he stands quiet until the hunter has passed then he charges but a poached tea you must not say that you cannot do it you must come away they will take you and hang you what can i do i cannot leave the village i will not i have told you that there is no other way but what are you going to do ah uh, i must think it needs cunning and skill first i must think no no a poached tea no no it would be better to give me to the mudalali i would rather kill you than that do you hear i shall kill you if you go to the mudalali oh oh isn't it enough that they should have taken my man from me and now more evil comes i tell you that i will end this now now i shall sleep and to-morrow think of the way selinda refused to listen any further to punchy manika's expostulations he lay down by the fire and soon slept next day and throughout their journey to the village he was very silent and refused to discuss the subject at all with her the lethargy habitual to him had left him completely he was in an extraordinary state of excitement goaded on perpetually by great gusts of anger against babahami and fernando when he got back to his house he sat down in the compound in a place from which he could see the headman's house and waited he watched the house all day and when in the evening he saw the headman return he smiled then he got up and went into the hut he took his gun which stood in the corner of the room unloaded it and reloaded it again with fresh powder and several big slugs he examined the caps carefully chose two and put them in the fold of his cloth then he lay down and slept next morning he was very quiet and thoughtful but if any one had watched him closely he would have seen that he was really in a state of intense excitement after eating the morning meal he took his gun and went over to the headman's house to the astonishment of baba hami and his wife he walked into the house put his gun in the corner of the room and squatted down baba hami watched him closely for a minute or two he felt uneasy he noted that the curious wild look in selinda's eyes was greater than ever well selinda what is it he said arachchi i've come to you about this jenna i cannot live without jenna you must give it back to me you heard in court that the jenna can not be given to you it has been given to apu let us have an end of all this trouble yes arachchi that is why i have come to you i want an end of all this trouble do you hear that and end now to-day of trouble 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 for years we must end it to-day do you hear what do you mean yes what did i say this this now arachchi that was nothing do not mind what i said then i was thinking thinking you know they call me mad in the village well i was thinking you know now that babun is over there for six months i heard the judge hamadoro say that clearly but to me he said merely clear out i was never a friend of that babun all the trouble has come from him he took punchy manika from me and then hini hami i saw her lying in the jungle by the deer what did we call him kalu apu punchy apu yes yes punchy apu that was long ago they beat her they threw stones at her that was long ago in the jungle but now baban is away for six months when he comes back i shall say to him clear out as the judge hamadoru said they laughed at me then a foolish old man a mad old man eh ha ha little arachti little arachti you have laughed at me too for years haven't you haven't you what is all this Linda? what do you mean i don't understand ah arachti it is nothing do not mind what i say i do not know what i was saying i am a poor man arachti very ignorant a little mad but i am a quiet man i have given no trouble in the village you know that well arachti don't you 
i cannot speak well like you Rachti, in the court but this is what i want to say i do not like this baban all the trouble has come from him i am a quiet man in the village you know that i said to my daughter on the way here by the big palu trees at the second hill i said to her the man is now sent away he will be over there for six months he is a foolish man it is he who has brought the trouble the mudalali is a good man Yerachti too is a good man why should we quarrel with those two there is no shame in your going to the mudalali then my daughter said i will do as you think best apochti do you understand now Arachti? selindu stopped the Arachti had been watching him narrowly he began to understand the drift of selindu's incoherent words but he still felt uneasy as selindu spoke his suppressed excitement became more and more apparent in his voice and words but baba hami knew well that he was mad and that he was also wonderfully stupid it was just like him to do things in this wild way the more baba hami thought of it the more he became convinced that the conviction of baban had done its work selindu and punchy manika had given in yes i think i understand he said it is true that the mudalali will take your daughter he is a good man and the trouble came from baban as you say that is it Arachti, that is it let the mudalali take punchy manika my daughter cannot live with thieves now she will go to the mudalali do you understand yes selindu but it must be done quietly she cannot go openly to his house or there will be silly talk after what was said in the court no no it must be done quietly very quietly i will tell the mudalali and she can come at night to him afterwards perhaps she can live at the house but at first she must go secretly at night ah ha arrived to you are clever how clever you are you think of all things yes it must be all done quietly quietly very well selinda i will tell the mudalali it is a good thing to end all this trouble like this yes it is a very good thing to end it like this yes like this like this but now the jenna arachti i cannot live without the jenna without a jenna i must starve you cannot see me starve even now there is no grain in my house you must give me the jenna baba hami thought for a while then he said well i will see what can be done perhaps i can arrange with apu about the jenna we will see yes arachti but let us have done with it once for all the thing is settled apu cannot be left there come why what do you want don't you trust me yes i trust you why not Arachti? but i am afraid of apu if he is left there to do work he will refuse to go he is in the channel now it would be better to go and tell him at once i cannot go now to-morrow perhaps Arachti, it is but two miles you said it is a good thing to end the trouble let us settle it now to-day and the mudalali can have punchy manika to-night baba hami was silent he disliked being hurried on the other hand he would be very glad to see the whole matter settled his action with regard to the chenna troubled him because it was dangerous he knew that the petition had been presented and he was not at all sure that he would come off as well in an inquiry as he had in the court it would also be wise to bind selinda to him by giving him back the chenna and not to risk his changing his mind about madalala and punchy manika he argued a little more and stood out half-heartedly against selindu's urgings to start at once at last he gave in and they started for the jenna they followed a narrow jungle track which had been lately cleared the tangle of shrubs and undergrowth and trees was like a wall on each side of the track the headman walked first and selindu carrying his gun followed for the first three-quarters of a mile they walked in silence except for a word or two which the headman shouted back to selindu without turning his head selindu had fallen somewhat behind he quickened his pace and came up close to the headman he was muttering to himself what do you say asked baba hami what was i talking i do not know Arachti. they say the hunter talks to himself in the jungle it is a custom have you ever been a hunter Arachti? no you know that well enough oh yes you are no hunter who should know that better than i but do they call me a good hunter Arachti? skilful cunning do i know the tracks Arachti? of course every one knows you to be the best hunter in the district i owe the best hunter in the district and do you know Arachti, that i am afraid of the jungle so they say what are you afraid of selinda began to speak with great excitement as he went on his voice began to get shriller and shriller it trembled with anger and fear and passion i am afraid of everything Arachti, the jungle the devils the darkness but above all of being hunted have you ever been hunted Arachti? 
no of course you are not a hunter and therefore have never been hunted but i know it happens sometimes to the cleverest of us the elephant they say but that i have never seen but the buffalo i have seen that here on this very track before it was cleared many years ago the buffalo is stupid isn't he little rochti very stupid he does not see he does not hear he goes on wallowing in his mud and they hunt him year after year year after year he does not know he does not see them he does not hear them do you know that i know it i am a hunter then then having crept close they shoot him it was near here at first crash he tears away through the jungle the blood flowing down his side he is afraid very afraid and in pain but the pain brings anger and with anger anger arachti comes cunning and now arachti now comes the game the dangerous game the young men laugh at it but the wise hunter would be afraid there he stood do you see there under that maya litten tree head down very still and the hunter fool fool crept after him through the undergrowth there was no track then ah oh, it was thick then he could not see anything but the shrubs and thorns he did not see the red eyes behind him nor the great head down for the other was cunning now cunning and very angry and when the hunter had gone on a little just where you are now rochti then do you hear little rochti then out and crash he charged charged like this baba hami had at first hardly listened but the fury and excitement of selindu had at last forced his attention as selindu said the last words baba hami half stopped and turned his head he just saw selindu's blazing eyes and foam on the corner of his lips at the same moment he felt the cold muzzle of the gun pressed against his back selindu pulled the trigger and baba hami fell forward on his face a great hole was blown in the back and the skin round it was blackened and burnt the chest was shattered by the slugs which tore their way through the body writhed and twisted on the ground for a minute and then was still selindu kicked it with his foot to see whether it was dead there was no movement he reloaded his gun and turned his back towards the village his excitement had died down the old lethargy was coming upon him again he felt this himself and walked faster muttering even now it is not safe there were two of them there is still the other when selindu got back to the village fernando was in the headman's compound when he saw selindu he came down towards the fence and called out to him where is the arachchi they say he went out with you selindu walked up towards the stile and stopping levelled his gun at the madalali fernando stepped back his mouth wide open his eyes staring his whole face contorted with fear he cowered down behind the stile stretching his hands vaguely out between the wooden bars and shouted don't shoot don't shoot the stile was little or no protection between the two bottom bars selindu could see the madalali's fat stomach and legs he took careful aim between the bars and fired fernando fell backwards writhing and screaming with pain selindu went and looked over the stile at the same moment baba hami's wife rushed out of the house but he saw that his work had been accomplished blood was pouring from the madalali's stomach his two legs and one of his hands were shattered the trouble is ended he muttered he walked very slowly to his house he put the gun in the corner of the room thought for a minute and then immediately left the hut he saw that already there was a crowd of people in the headman's compound the women were screaming slindu turned into the jungle at the back of his house and walking quickly cut across to the track which led to come over pitaya End of chapter seven part two chapter eight of the village in the jungle by leonard wolf this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight before selindu reached the kamburu pataya track he stopped and squatted down with his back against a tree he wanted to think after the wild excitement which had possessed him now for three days a feeling of immense lassitude came upon him his mind worked slowly confusedly he had no clear idea of where he was going or of what he ought to do he was very tired very unhappy now but he felt no regret for what he had done no remorse for the blood of the arachchi and de fernando could trouble him so far as they were concerned he only felt a great relief he wanted to lie down and sleep he leant back against the tree and began to doze but he started up again immediately listening for footsteps of pursuers 
his first idea had been simply to run away into the jungle to get away at any rate from the village the hunt would begin he would be hunted once again he knew that then he thought of going east where the thick jungle stretched unbroken for miles he could live there in some cave among the rocks he could live there safe from his hunters for months he had heard stories of other men doing this strange men from other districts whom the government and the police were hunting down for some crime they came down from the north so it was said flying to the sanctuary of the uninhabited jungle where they lay hidden for years they lived alone in caves and in trees eating leaves and wild fruit and honey and the birds and animals which they managed to snare or kill they were never caught there were no villages in that wilderness from which information could come to the police sometimes one of the few bold hunters who were the only people to penetrate these solitudes would catch a glimpse of a wild naked man in a cave or among the shadows of the trees some of them perhaps eventually trusting to the lapse of time and to the short memory of the government went back to their villages and their homes but most of them died of fever in the jungle to which they had fled if such a life were possible for men from distant villages who did not know the jungle it would be easy for selindu but as he squatted under the trees thinking of what he should do a feeling of horror for such a life crept over him and his repugnance to flying became stronger and stronger he was very tired what he desired and the desire was sharp was to rest to be left alone untroubled in the village in his hut in his compound to sleep quietly there at night to sit hour after hour through the hot day under the mustard tree in the compound but in the jungle there would be no rest it was just in order to escape that terror the feeling of the hunted animal the feeling that some one was always after him meaning evil that he had killed the arachchi and the mudalali and if he fled into the jungle now he would have gained nothing by the killing he would live with that feeling for months for years perhaps for ever the hunt would begin again and again it was he who would be the hunted then he thought of returning to the village but that too would be useless he would get no peace there he knew well what would happen the kerala would be sent for he would be seized worried bullied ill-treated probably that would be worse than the jungle suddenly the conviction came to him that it would be best to end it all at once to go into kamburu pataya and give himself up to the radha mahatmaya and the white hamadoru to confess what he had done he got up and started for the town immediately keeping to the game tracks in the thick jungle and avoiding the main tracks for he did not wish to meet any one he walked slowly following instinctively the tangled winding tracks his lassitude and fatigue increased he reached kamburu pataya in the evening of the third day and asked his way to the radha mahatmaya's house when selindu reached the radha mahatmaya's house no news of the murder had yet come to kamburu pataya he had walked slowly but what was a slow pace for him was faster than that of the other villagers he went into the compound and walked cautiously round the house in the veranda through the lattice-work he saw the radha mahatmaya lying in a long chair there was a table with a lamp upon it beside him slindu coughed the radha mahatmaya looked up and said sharply who is there hamadoru it is i may i come into the veranda what do you want at this time come to-morrow i can't attend to anything at night hama doru i come from betagama there has been a murder there come in then slindu came into the veranda and salaamed he stood in front of the radha mahatmaya hama doru he said i have killed the arachchi and the mudalali the radha mahatmaya sat up you what what do you mean who are you i am selindu of betagama the arachchi brought a false case against me and my son-in-law may i sit down hamadoru i am very tired baban was sent to prison by the judge 
hamadoru but to me he said clear out the case was false they were trying to bring evil upon me and my daughter the Madalali wanted the girl they were still trying to bring evil on me so i said enough i took the gun and i went out with the arachchi over there to the chenna and i shot him through the back he is dead lying there on the track then i went back to the village and shot the Madalali in the belly through the stile he was not dead then but i looked over and saw the blood coming fast from the belly low down he must be dead now the rada mahatmaya was not a brave man as he listened to selindu's short expressionless sentences the bald description of the shedding of blood given in the tired voice of the villager he became afraid he sat up in his chair looking at selindu who crouched in front of him motionless watching him the light of the lamp fell upon the dark livid face it was the face of the grey monkeys which leap above the jungle among the tree-tops and peer down at you through the branches a face scarred and pinched by suffering and weariness and fear it was as if something evil from the darkness which he did not understand had suddenly appeared in his quiet veranda he looked out nervously over selindu's head into the night the light of the lamp in the veranda made it seem very dark outside the radha mahatmaya became still more afraid in the silence which followed selindu's speech he suddenly got up and shouted for his servant there was the sound of movement in the back of the house and a dirty servant boy in a dirty vest and cloth came blinking and yawning into the veranda the ratta mahatmaya told him to stand by selindu the ratta mahatmaya drew in a deep breath of relief the beating of his heart became quieter now yako he said in a sharp angry tone stand up selindu did not move he looked up at the ratta mahatmaya with weary eyes and said hamadoru i am very tired for days now there has been no rest for me ayo i cannot remember how long it is now since i sat quiet in my compound let me sleep now i have come straight to you and told you all i thought at first i would run away i could have lived out there for months and you would not have caught me but i was tired of all this i am very tired i thought no what is the good out there away from the village and the hut and the compound and the daughter it is the evil all over again ayo how tired i am of it it is better to end it now so i came here i have told you no lies what harm can i do now let me sleep here and to-morrow you can do what you like to me do you hear what i say stand up yako stand up make him stand up the servant boy kicked selindu in the ribs and told him to stand up selindu rose slowly now then you say you have killed the arachchi and the madalali is that fernando the boutique keeper yes hamadoru yes fernando the boutique keeper fetch me ink and paper and a pen the servant boy fetched the paper ink and pen meanwhile selindu again squatted down the rada mahatmaya prepared to write didn't you hear me tell you to get up get up yako the servant boy kicked selindu again now then when did you kill them and how three or four days ago it was in the morning i went with the arachti to the jenna i shot him through the back where did you get the gun it was my gun i had it in my house was it licensed yes hamadoru i am very tired what is the good of all these questions i tell you i killed them both let me be i cannot think of these things now to-morrow perhaps to-morrow surely you have me here safe and can do with me what you like to-morrow the rada mahatmaya was a self-important fussy little man he was also timid and not fond of taking responsibilities the sudden appearance of selindu with this strange story out of the darkness had upset him he was very annoyed when selindu again sank down into a squatting position stand up fellow he said stand up didn't you hear me pariah stand up you've got to answer my questions now then what did i ask last now then he paused and thought for a moment it is not perhaps too late perhaps i'd better take him at once to the magistrate yes that's better you there get the bull put into the hackery no no stop there you must look after the man keep him there kalu apu kalu apu call kalu apu kalu apu hoy do you hear wake up put the bull in the hackery and hurry up 
at last another servant boy was woken up the bull was put into the hackery the rada mahatmaya put on a dark coat and with many curses and complaints got into the cart selindu followed slowly with the servant boy they trailed wearily along the dark roads for three quarters of a mile then the cart stopped in the compound of the magistrate's bungalow the rada mahatmaya got out and went round to the back of the house to announce his arrival through the servants selindu squatted down near the hackery he was no longer quite conscious of what was going on around him after a while the rada mahatmaya called to him to come round into the house and the boy who had driven the bullock poked him up with the goad he was taken along a broad dark veranda and suddenly found himself in a large well-lit room had it not been for the stupor of his fatigue he would have been very frightened for he had never seen anything like this room before it seemed to him to be full of furniture and all the furniture to be covered with strange objects in reality there was only a little travel battered furniture in the barn-like whitewashed room there was matting on the floor and rugs on the matting an immense writing-table littered with letters and papers stood in front of the window there were three or four tables on which were some ugly ornaments mostly chipped or broken and a great many spotted and faded photographs a gun a rifle and several sentimental pictures broke the monotony of the white walls the rest of the furniture consisted of a great many chairs two or three lamps and a bookcase with thirty or forty books in it when selindu entered the room with the rada mahatmaya the magistrate was lying in a long chair reading a book he got up and went over to sit down at the writing-table he was the white hamadoru whom selindu had seen before in the court he was dressed now in black in evening dress he sat back in his chair and stared at selindu in silence for a minute or two with his cat's eyes he looked cross and tired selindu had instinctively squatted down again the rada mahatmaya angrily told him to stand up the magistrate seemed to be lost in thought he continued to stare at selindu and as he did so the look of irritation faded from his face he noted the hopelessness and suffering in selindu's face the slow weariness of effort with which he moved his limbs he need not stand he said to the rada mahatmaya he looks damn tired poor devil you can take a chair yourself rada mahatmaya god this is a nice time to bring me work and you seem to have brought me a miserable-looking wretch you say it's a murder case yes sir or rather it appears so i do not know much about it in fact sir only what this man has told me he appeared at my place just now not half an hour ago and says that he has killed the arachchi of his village and another man i brought him straight to you sir oh damn it that means i'll have to go out there to-morrow how far is it betagama i don't know the place it's up the north track in the jungle sir it must be between fifty or sixty miles away sir oh damn and there are any number of cases fixed for to-morrow well poor devil he looks pretty done himself by jove i believe he is the man who was before me as an accused in that theft case the other day i would not charge him i remember no evidence against him it might have been better for him perhaps if i had and convicted him too he turned to selindu and said in sinhalese you were accused of theft before me a few days ago weren't you yes Hamadoru. uh i thought so well rada mahatmaya i suppose i'd better record your statement first in form come on now the rada mahatmaya made a short statement of how selindu had come to him and what he had said the magistrate wrote it down and then turned to selindu and explained to him that the offence with which he was charged was murder and that he was prepared to take down anything he wished to say and that anything which he did say would be read out at his trial selindu did not quite understand but he felt vaguely encouraged by the white hamadoru he had spoken sinhalese to him he had not spoken in an angry voice and he was the same hamadoru who had told him to clear out of the court when he was charged before it is as the de sema hatmaya said i have killed the arachchi and the madalali if the hamadoru sends to the village he will find that what i say is true the hamadoru remembers the previous case he knew that they brought a false case against me he told me to clear out but the whole case was false against baban too 
am i to tell everything i am very tired Hamadoru. for three days now i have been walking and no food but the jungle fruit and leaves if i might rest now a little and sleep until to-morrow what can i do i have told all i am almost an old man very poor what can i do i think i had better take down what you have to say now but you need not stand you had better begin from the case what happened after that ayo hamadoro ayo i am very tired after the case it was a false case the Arachchi for long had been trying to do me harm how long i can't remember but for many years it seems to me at that time it was because of my daughter he wanted to take her from baban and give her to the Madalali. well after the case i set out for the village with the daughter and all the way i was thinking thinking how to end this evil for i knew well that when they came back to the village it would begin again all over again they had put baban in jail it was a false case but how should the hamadoro know that with all the lies they told him they would get punchy manika for the Madalali. then as i went i thought of the old buffalo who is wounded and charges upon slindu caught sight of the gun and rifle and stopped ah the hamadoro is a hunter too he knows the jungle he asked eagerly yes i know the jungle good then the hamadoro will understand the evil and the killing there yes it is time i thought to end the evil i must kill them both i was a quiet man in the village all know that i harmed no one i wanted to live quietly and went back to my compound and sat down and waited in the evening came the punching arachchi to his house i saw him go in then i took my gun and went to him and said ralahami you may give the woman to the madalali and in return give me back my channel the Arachchi thought to himself here is a fool but he said very well i will give the chenna back to you then we started for the chenna and as he went on the track i shot him from behind he is lying dead there now on the track which leads from the village to the chenna if the hamadoru sends some one he can find the body yes and then then hamadoru i loaded the gun again and went back to the village there was still the madalali i saw him in the Arachchi's garden he called to me where is the Arach? i went close up to him he was standing by the stile and through it i saw his big belly i shot him too he must be dead now yes and then then i went to my house for the women ran out screaming i put the gun in my house and went out into the jungle i was tired i am a poor man and i have harmed no one in the village i am getting old i wanted to live quietly in my hut i wanted to rest hamadoru what good i thought to fly into the jungle only more evil so i came straight to the disanmahat maya i told him what i had done that is all the magistrate wrote down what Salindo said and when he had finished sat thinking the pen in his hand and looking at Salindo, it was very quiet in the room outside was heard only the drowsy murmur of the sea suddenly the quiet was broken by the heavy breathing and snoring of Salindo, who had fallen asleep where he squatted leave him alone for a bit the magistrate said to the Radha Mahatmaya, there's nothing more to be got from him tonight. We shall have to push on to Betagama early tomorrow. I suppose it's true what he says. I think so, sir. Damn curious. I thought he wasn't right in the head when I saw him in court before. Well, I'm glad I shan't have to hang him. You think he will be hanged, sir? He'll be sentenced at any rate. Premeditation on his own showing clearly, and a good enough motive for murder. A very simple case, so they'll think it you think so too it seems to be a simple case sir i see you would make a very good judge radha mahatmaya i don't mind telling you unofficially of course that i'm a very bad one it does not seem at all a simple case to me i shouldn't like to hang Salindu of betagama for killing your rascally headman now then radha mahatmaya here you are a sinhalese gentleman lived your whole life here among these people let's have your opinion of that chap there he's a human being isn't he what sort of a man is he and how did he come suddenly to murder two people it's difficult sir for me to understand them about as difficult as for you sir they are very different from us they are very ignorant they become angry suddenly and then they kill like like animals like the leopards sir savages you mean well i don't know i rather doubt it you don't help the psychologist much radha mahatmaya this man now i expect he's a quiet sort of man all he wanted was to be left alone poor devil you don't shoot i believe radha mahatmaya so you don't know the jungle properly but it's really the same with the other jungle animals even your leopard you know 
they just want to be left alone to sleep quietly in the day and to get their food quietly at night they won't touch you if you leave them alone but if you worry em enough follow em up and pen em up in a corner or a cave and shoot four fifty bullets at them out of an express rifle well if a bullet doesn't find the lungs or heart or brain they'll get angry as you call it and go out to kill i don't blame them either isn't that true i believe it is sir and it's the same with these jungle people they want to be left alone to reap their miserable chenis and eat their miserable curricon to live quietly as he said in their miserable huts i don't think that you know any more than i do radha mahatmaya what goes on up there in the jungle he was a quiet man in the village i believe that he only wanted to be left alone it must take a lot of cornering and torturing and shooting to rouse a man like that i expect as he said they went on at him for years this is not letting one another alone it's at the bottom of nine-tenths of the crime and trouble and in nine-tenths of that nine-tenths there's one of your head man concerned whom you're supposed to look after it's very difficult sir they live far away in these little villages many of them are good men and help the villagers but they are ignorant too oh, i'm not blaming you radha mahatmaya i'm not blaming any one and it's late if we are to start early to-morrow you'd better take your friend away with you and put him in the lock-up tell them to give him some food if he wants it good-night the radha mahatmaya shook Selinda until he woke up it was some little while before he realized where he was and then that he had to set out again with the radha mahatmaya he turned to the magistrate where are you taking me to hamadoru you will be taken to the prison you will have to stay there until you are tried but i have told the truth to the hamadoru let him give his decision it is to end it all that i came here i can't try you you will have to be tried by the great judge ayo it is you i wish to judge me you are a hunter and know the jungle if they take me away now how do i know what will happen what will they do to me let it end now hamadoru i'm sorry but i can't do anything you will be charged with murder i can't try you for that the great judge tries those cases but no harm will come to you you will be able to rest in the jail until the trial and what will they do to me will they hang me i'm afraid i can't tell you even that you must go with the dis uh, mahatmaya now Selindu passive again followed the radha mahatmaya out of the room the latter grumbling at the late hour and the foolish talk of the magistrate got into his hackery and the procession trailed off again into the darkness towards the lock-up here a long delay occurred a sleepy sergeant of police had to be woken up and the whole story had to be explained to him eventually Selindu was led away by him and locked up in a narrow bare cell which with its immense door made of massive iron bars was exactly like a cage for some wild animal in it at last he found himself allowed to lie down and sleep undisturbed the rest which the magistrate had promised him seemed however to be still far off for early next morning he was taken out of his cell and made to start off with the police sergeant for Betagama. the magistrate riding on a horse and the radamahatmaya in his hackery passed them when they were two or three miles from the town a little while afterwards a messenger from Betagama met the party bringing the news of the murder to the radha mahatmaya Selindu was being taken to Betagama to be present at the magistrate's inquiry but he did not understand this he was weak and tired after the excitement of the trial and the murder the long days upon the road and the little food he began to think that he had been a fool to give himself up as he walked behind the police sergeant through the jungle of which he knew every tree and track a great desire for it and for freedom came upon him again he thought of the great bars of the cell door through which he had seen the daylight for the first time that morning but bun was even now lying behind such bars and would lie there for six months and he himself he might never see the daylight except through such bars now for the rest of his life unless they hanged him he thought of the great river that cut through the jungle many miles away it was pleasant there to bathe in the cool clear water and to lie on the bank under the great wild fig trees in the heat of the day if he had not given himself up if he might have been there by now watching the elephant sluicing water over its grey sides or the herd of deer coming down the opposite bank to drink the thought came to him even now to slip into the jungle and disappear the fool of a police sergeant would never catch him would go on for a mile or two probably without knowing that his prisoner had escaped but he still followed the police sergeant 
and had not the will or the energy for so decisive a step for breaking away from the circumstances to which he had always yielded for taking his life in his hands and moulding it for himself he had tried once to fight against life when he killed the arachchi and the Madalali. he was now caught again in the stream evil might come but he could struggle no more he had forgotten panchimanika until he was a mile or two from the village and he saw her waiting for him by the side of the track the rumour reached the village that Salindu was being brought back by the police in chains some said that he was going to be hanged there and then in the village panchimanika had started off to meet him her first terror when she had been told of what her father had done had given place to bewilderment but when she saw him in charge of the police sergeant she ran to him with a cry is it true apochchi is it true what they say what do they say that i killed those two it is true i killed them then i went to kamburu pitaya and told it all to the disem mahatmaya and the magistrate hamadoru ayo and will they hang you now what do they say that they say that in the village it isn't true is it apochchi i don't know perhaps it is true perhaps it isn't but the magistrate hamadoru said i would be tried by the great judge ayo you were mad apochchi it would have been better to have given me to the badalali hold your tongue hold your tongue burst out Salindu angrily but his anger died down as rapidly as it had sprung up don't say that child don't say that no that is not true is it daughter it is not true it was for you i did it and now after all that surely in a little while all will be well for you well what is to become of me what am i to do they will take you away again and hang you or keep you in the great house over there and my man io is there too i shall be alone here what am i to do apoch chi hush all will be well with you i tell you there is no one here to trouble you now there will be quiet for you again and for me perhaps why not the killing was for that surely surely it must be child and baban why in a little while baban will come back in a month or two you will wait in the village you will sit in the house in the compound in the little mustard tree so quietly and the quiet of the great trees child round about nothing to trouble you now and in a month or two he will come back he is a good man baban and there will be no evil then now that the arachchi is dead and the Madalali, there will be quiet for you then and rest how can i live here alone there is no food in the house even now are not there others in the village they will help you for a month or two and they know baban he will work hard in the chana and repay them and you what will they do to you ayo ayo what does it matter what have i ever done for you it was true when they said that i was a useless man in the village to creep through the leaves like a jackal yes i can do that but what else isn't the bad crop in the chana rightly called Salindu's crop there was never food in my house the horoscope was true nothing but trouble and evil and wandering in the jungle it is a good thing for you that i leave the compound when i go good fortune may come do not say that approach gee do not say that to whom did we run in the compound hinihami and i what father was like you in the village must i forget all that now and sit alone in another's compound begging a little kanji and a handful of kurakan no no i cannot stay here won't they take me away with you to the jail i cannot live here alone without you the sergeant looked back and angrily told punchy manika to stop making such a noise they were nearing the village hush child said lindu said Salindu, you must stay here they will not take you and what could you do in the big town there you must wait here for baban the inquiry began as soon as they reached the village Salindu went with the magistrate the rada mahat maya the kerala who had been sent for and most of the men of the village to the place where the arachchi had been shot the body lay where it had fallen a rough canopy of boughs and leaves had been raised over it to shade it from the sun a watcher sat near to keep off the pigs and jackals when the canopy was removed for the magistrate to inspect the body a swarm of flies rose and hung buzzing in the air above the corpse the body had not been moved it lay on its face the legs half drawn up under the stomach the blood had dried in great black clots over the wounds on the back the magistrate looked at it and then the kerala turned it over a glaze of grey film was over the eyes the hot air in the jungle track was heavy with the smell of putrefaction 
the crowd of villagers interested but unmoved stood watching in the background while the magistrate sitting on the stump of a tree began to write noting down the position and condition in which he had found the body then the doctor arrived and began to cut up the body where it lay for post-mortem examination the magistrate walked back slowly to the village followed by slindy and the headman and such of the spectators as were more interested in the inquiry than in the post-mortem the same procedure of inspection was gone through with fernando's body which lay under another little canopy where he had died by the style of the arach cheese compound after the inspection came the inquiry a table and chair had been placed under a large tamarind tree for the magistrate to write at the witnesses were brought up examined and their statements written down after each had made his statement slindy was told that he could ask them any questions which he wanted them to answer he had none the afternoon dragged on there was no wind but the heat seemed to come in waves across the village bringing with it the faint smell of decaying human flesh the dreary procession of witnesses listless and perspiring continued to pass before the tired irritable magistrate one told how he had seen slindu and the arachchi leave the village slindu walking behind and carrying a gun another had heard a shot from the direction of the chenna another had seen slindu return by himself to the village carrying a gun the arachchi's wife told of slindu's early visit to the hut of how he left with the arachchi of how later hearing the report of a gun followed by screams she ran out of the house to see slindu standing with a smoking gun in his hand and fernando writhing on the ground near the stile late in the afternoon the inquiry was over as the radha mahatmaya had said it was a simple case slindu was remanded and would certainly be tried for murder before a supreme court judge for the present he was handed over to the police sergeant with whom he slept that night in a hut in the village next day he was taken back to kambur Pataya, where he again spent the night in the lock-up then he was handed over to a fiscal's peon who put handcuffs on him and started with him along the dusty main road which ran towards the west they walked slowly along the road for two days the peon was a talkative man and he tried to make Salindu talk with him but he soon gave up the attempt he had to fall back for conversation on any chance traveller going the same way towards tangala where the prison was this fellow he would explain to them pointing to Salindu, has killed two men he will be hanged certainly he will be hanged but he's mad not a word can you get out of him he walks along like that mile after mile looking from side to side never a word he thinks there are elephants on the main road i suppose he comes from up there in the jungle they are all cattle like that there of course i would rather drive a bull along the road than him they passed through several villages where slindu was an object of great interest people came out of the houses and boutiques and discussed him and his crimes with the peon the first night they slept in a boutique in one of these villages the boutique was full of people they gathered round to watch slindu eat his curry and rice with his handcuffed hands they too discussed him in loud tones with the peon there were two traders on their way to kamburu pataya the rest with the exception of one old man belonged to the village this old man was one of those wanderers whom one meets from time to time in villages upon the roads or even sometimes in the jungle very old very dirty with long matted hair and wild eyes he sat mumbling to himself in a corner a beggar and mad he had two claims to the charity of the boutique keeper who had taken him in for the night and given him a good meal of curry and rice the peon had for the twentieth time that day told Salindu's story with many embellishments and complained bitterly of his silence and stupidity the others sat round in the reeking atmosphere watching Salindu eat his rice by the dim light of two oil wicks will they hang him aya asked the boutique keeper yes he'll be hanged sure enough said the peon he confessed it himself you see but they never really hang people i'm told they send them away to a prison a long way off they say they hang them just to frighten people the other villagers murmured approval the peon laughed of course they hang them i've known people who were hanged why balapu who lived next door to me in kambur pataya was hanged he quarrelled with his brother in the street outside my house it was about a share in their land and he stabbed him dead they hanged him i took him along this same road to the prison three years ago a good man he was wanted to gamble all along the road but you don't know that he was hanged i no one saw it no one ever sees it 
nonsense said one of the traders in maha nuwara they hanged them i knew a man there whose nephew was hanged and afterwards they gave him the body to bury the head hung over like this and the mark of the rope was round the neck the old beggar had listened to what was going on squatting in his corner he did not get up but shuffled slowly forward into the circle still in a squatting position Selinda, who had before shown little interest in the conversation looked up when the beggar intervened ayo what's that you say the old man asked they are going to hang this man why's that he shot two men dead up there in the jungle gee gee why did he do that he's mad father as mad as you the old man turned and looked hard at Selindu while Selindu stared at him the spectators laughed at the curious sight the old man smiled he's not mad he said not as mad as i am so he killed twice did he dear dear the lord buddha said kill not at all kill nothing it is a sin to kill if he saw a caterpillar in the path he put his foot on one side man man why have you killed twice were you mad i'm not mad said Selindu. they were hunting me they would have killed me therefore i killed them the man is not mad no more mad than you or you but i i am mad so at least they say why do they say that i'm mad my son do you see this paper he showed a very dirty english newspaper to Selindu. well if you are quite quiet and no gecko cries and the jackals don't howl i will look at it like this afterwards for some short time staring hard then i shall see things on the paper not the writing i have wandered all my life a wanderer on the path seeking merit by the three gems i cannot read writing or letters but i shall see things themselves a little hut up there in the jungle if you desire it your hut my son and i'll tell you what is doing there and the woman is lying in the hut crying perhaps this paper was given to me by a white mahatmaya whom i met out there once also in the jungle it is a great power before i could only see what was doing in this country but now by its help i can see over the sea to the white mahatmaya's country then they say this is a mad old man well well who knows i'm always on the path to-morrow i shall leave this village from village to village from town to town and from jungle to jungle i see many different men on the path strange men and they do strange things thieving stabbing killing cultivating patty i do not cultivate patty nor do i thieve or kill i am mad perhaps but very often it is they who seem to me to want but a little to be mad all this doing and doing running round and round like the red ants thieving stabbing killing cultivating this and that is there much good or wisdom in such a life it seems to me full of evil nothing but evil and trouble do they ever sit down and rest do they ever meditate desire and desire again and no fulfilment ever is such a life sane or mad did they call you mad in the village even before this my son yes the mad hunter said Selindu, and the others laughed again ah you are a hunter too that also i have not done but i know the jungle for i travel through it often on my path do the beasts in it speak to you son hunter yes they used to speak to me so they called you mad all the beasts in the jungle speak to me too except the elephant the elephant is too sad even to talk usually when i see him he is eating for he is always hungry because of his sins in the previous birth but sometimes i find him standing alone away among the rocks swaying from side to side he is very sad thinking of his sins in the previous birth then i say to him brother your feet too are upon the path it is good to think of the sins of the previous birth but there is no need of such sadness then he sways more and more and his trunk moves from side to side and he lifts one foot up after the other very slowly but he never says a word watching me with his little eye once indeed i remember he lifted up his trunk and screamed i too lifted up my hands and cried out with him for we were both on the path you do not know the jungle father said Selindu. it is of food and killing and hunting that the beasts talk to me they know nothing of your path nor do i ayo it is not only in the jungle that they say that they say the same in the small villages and the great towns what do you say sir he said turning to one of the traders i do not go into the jungle or talk to elephants old man said the trader i know the bazaar and there they think of phantoms first and the path last a man must live said the other trader it is only priests and beggars who have full bellies and idle hands the lord buddha was a beggar and a priest too said the old man and began to mumble to himself the laugh was against the trader Aya said the old man to the peon who is going to hang this hunter the government of course he will be tried by the judge and then they will hang him this is another thing which i do not understand to the madman this seems foolish to kill a man because he has killed 
if it is a sin will he not be punished in the next birth the old beggar had a strange influence on selimbi who watched him the whole time fascinated the mumbled words seemed to excite him greatly what do you mean father he said his voice rising how punished in the next birth they will punish me here the judge they do that they will hang me you hear what these have said i do not know about that i only know of the path on my way through the villages i hear them say this or that but i do not understand to-morrow i shall be gone to the east and you to the west do you know my son where you will sleep to-morrow night no no nor i either but we go on the path each of us because of the sins in our previous births as the lord buddha said to the she-devil o fool fool because of your sins in the form of birth you have been born a she-devil and yet you go on committing sins even now what folly is not that clear of these punishments of the government i know nothing if they are punishments they are because of sins committed in your previous birth but be sure that for the sins which you commit in this birth for the killing for that is a sin a great sin you will be punished in the next birth how many will hell await there surely son it is better to wander on and on from village to village always begging a little rice and avoiding sin but surely i have committed no sin all these years they plagued me and did evil to me was i to be starved by them and my daughter starved was i to allow them to take her from me and from baban the lord buddha said it is a sin to kill even the louse in the hair must not be cracked between the nails the other things i do not understand i have no daughter and no wife and no hut it is better to be without they stand in one's way on the path and to starve would need to starve my son in every village as a handful of rice for the wanderer as for the hanging that is very foolish the judge must be a foolish man but i do not think it will hurt you remember it is not for the killing of the two men but for the previous birth then there comes hell you must have killed many deer and pig yes yes i am a hunter but what of that father what of that each is a sin for i told you didn't i that the lord buddha said it is a sin to kill my son you are a hunter you know the jungle surely you have seen the evil there and the pain always desire and killing no peace or rest there either for the deer or the pig or the little grey mongoose they have sinned and are far from nirvana and happiness and like the she-devil they sin again only to bring more evil on themselves by their blindness what happiness is there in it my son the deer and the pig they too are upon the path it was greater sin to kill them than the other two for those two you say were bringing evil upon you but what did the deer and pig do to you eh hunter tell me that do nothing of course but there is no food up there one must have food to live no food up there there is always food upon the path a handful of rice in every village for the beggar i have been forty years now on the path have i starved what was your village father the name i have forgotten but it lay up there in the hills a pleasant place rain in plenty and the little streams always running into the rice fields and cocoa nut and areca nut trees all around oh hey murmured one of the villagers it is easy to avoid killing in a place like that have you ever worked old man said the peon have you ever earned a phantom by work in this part of the country rupees don't grow on wera bushes no said the old man i've never done anything like that i am mad you know i remember once they took me to the field to watch i was a boy i had to scare the birds away i was there alone sitting under a small tree beside the field the little birds came in crowds to feed on the young paddy they were very hungry what harm i thought if they eat a little plenty were remained for the house so i sat there thinking of other things and i forgot about the paddy and the birds until my father came and beat me after that they took me no more to the fields and i sat in the compound all day thinking foolish things until at last an old priest came by and he told me of the path and how to meditate and i followed him he died many years ago many years i have been no more to my village it is forgotten but i think it was up there in the hills it is very long ago and i have seen many villages since then they are all the same even the names i never know always some huts and men and women and children suffering punishment for their sins and sinning again this is fool's talk said the peon impatiently we cannot all beg upon the road i have heard the priests themselves say that every one cannot reach nirvana nor are we all mad there are the women and the children are they too to become holy men it is hard enough to live on the eleven rupees which the government gives us i don't kill deer but i eat it when i can get it is that too a sin old man 
but before the old beggar could answer slendu threw himself down on the ground in front of him and touching his feet with his hands burst out it is true father it is true what you say i did not understand before though i knew yes i knew it well i have seen it all so long in the jungle but i did not understand how many times have i told the little ones not understanding about it all always the killing 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 everything afraid the deer and the pig and the jackal after them and the leopard himself always evil there no peace no rest it was rest i wanted it is true father i have seen it it is the punishment for their sins and always evil for me too there hunger always and trouble always you should have shown me this path of yours before father even now i do not understand that and it would be useless now through all the evil i have but sin more killing the deer and the pig and now these two men it is too late they will hang me they will hang me and what then old man what then the old man began to shake with laughter he mumbled incoherently pulling at his beard and long hair with his hands the scene caused great pleasure and amusement to all the others except the peon who was annoyed at finding that he was no longer playing the most important part after a while the old man's laughter began to subside and he regained sufficient control to make himself intelligible well well he said well well i'm not the lord buddha my son well well do you see that he touches my feet as though i were the lord buddha himself i've never seen that before and i've seen many strange things and become a holy man well well here again he was overcome with silent laughter do not laugh father said Slindu. why do you laugh is it lies that you told me just now the other became serious again at once lies no no i do not tell lies ayo it is all true but what was it you were saying just then ah yes you were afraid afraid of the hanging and the punishment and of the next birth too late you said too late for the path my son it is never too late to acquire merit perhaps they will hang you perhaps not who can say it matters little for it will be as it will be i do not think it will hurt very much and before that it is possible for you to acquire much merit it will help you much in the next birth you must meditate you must think of holy things here are holy words for you to learn he repeated a poly stanza and tried to make slindu learn it it was a difficult task and it was only after innumerable repetitions that slindu at last got it by heart when he had at last done so he sat mumbling it over to himself again and again so as not to forget it that is good went on the old man along the road as you go wherever you are going to the prison or to the hanging repeat the holy words many times in that way you will acquire merit also meditate on your sins the sin of killing the deer and pig which you have killed so you will acquire merit too and avoid killing remember if there were a caterpillar in the path he put his foot on one side so too you will acquire merit it will help you in the next birth i think you are already on the path my son and perhaps if my path too leads me to the west who knows i shall see you there again and we shall talk together now however i grow tired so saying the old man shuffled back into a corner and covering his head and face with the dirty cloth soon fell asleep Slindu continued to mumble the Pali stanza which he did not understand the villagers seeing that no more amusement was to be obtained from the strangers left the boutique and the boutique keeper and the other travellers soon after spread out their mats on the ground and lay down to sleep the next day the peon and slindu started off very early in the morning all along the road slindu repeated the holy words to the great annoyance of the peon they reached the prison at tangala late in the evening it was dark when he arrived and slindu was at once locked up in a cell he fell asleep still repeating the pali stanza slindu remained three weeks in the prison it seemed to him an immense building it was a large and ancient dutch fort with high battlemented grey walls of great thickness the inside formed a square paved courtyard in which the prisoners worked at breaking stones and preparing choir by hammering cocoa-nut husks with wooden mallets round the courtyard were built the cells of oblong bare rooms with immense windows and gates iron barred which looked out upon the yard slindu not being a convicted person was not made to do any work he squatted in his cell watching the prisoners working in the yard and thinking of what the old beggar had told him he tried to meditate upon his sins but soon found that to be impossible he began however to forget the village on punchy manika and all the trouble that had gone before he repeated the pali stanza many times during the day he was very happy he grew fat upon the good prison food 
only once was the monotony of the days broken for him he was watching a group of prisoners in their blue and white striped prison clothes they all looked almost exactly alike they were quite near the gate of his cell filling the bathing trough with water suddenly in one of them he recognized babun he jumped up and ran to the bars of the gate crying out oh hey babun 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 looked round there was no surprise or interest in his face when he saw that it was salindu a great change had come over him in the short time during which he had been in prison his skin a sickly yellow colour seemed to have shrunk with the flesh and muscle which had wasted he was bent and stooping his eyes were sunken a look of dullness and hopelessness was in his face he looked at salindu frowning salindu danced about with excitement behind the bars you know me babun he shouted you know me why do you look like that all is well all is well i shot the arachchi and fernando they are dead but all is well they'll hang me that's why i'm here but i have my feet on the path i've acquired merit the old man was right a jail guard shouted across the courtyard to salindu to shut his mouth and the woman said babun in a low dull voice where's the woman she is there in the village waiting for you all is well i tell you they are dead i killed them it was the only way though a sin a great sin the old man said they will hang me every one says so but all is well i found the path and you you'll go back to the village punchy manika is there waiting the evil is over babun stared at him frowning his face had lost completely the open cheerful look which it had once had and last he said slowly you are mad i don't understand you if you have killed those two you are a fool madman what's the good i shall never go back there i shall die here and you yes they'll hang you as you say what's the good you are mad mad you always were he turned away and slowly lifting the pail of water emptied it into the trough slindu often saw babun again in the yard but never spoke to him babun seemed purposely to avoid passing near his cell and if he had to do so he kept his eyes fixed on the ground the day of salindu's trial arrived in the morning he was taken out of his cell and handed over with four other prisoners to an escort of police they put handcuffs on his hands and led him through the streets to the court salindu's case was the first case for trial he did not pay much attention to the proceedings he continued to mumble the poly stanza but he felt the greater pomp and solemnity of this court compared with the police court the judge was a grey-haired man in a dull scarlet gown there was a jury among which were several white mahatmayas there were a great many lawyers sitting round the table in the centre of the court and there was a crowd of officials and policemen standing about salindu had an advocate assigned to him by the court to defend him the lawyer soon found it useless to discuss the case with the prisoner the line of defence was clear however he would admit the killing and plead insanity and provocation the indictment for murder was read and the witnesses for the prosecution then gave their evidence they were cross-examined by salindu's advocate only with a view to showing that it had been well known in the village that salindu was mad they admitted that he had always been tika pasu they none of them knew anything about a quarrel with the arachchi before the theft and the conviction of baban salindu's advocate then put him in the witness-box he repeated the statement which he had made to the magistrate he was asked very few questions in cross-examination but the judge examined him at some length the judge's object was to make it clear when the idea of killing the two men first came to salindu and what was in salindu's mind during his walk to the chenna with the arachchi salindu understood nothing of what was going on he did not know and could not have been made to understand the law he understood the point and reason for no single question asked him he knew he would be hanged he was tired of this continual slow torture of questions which he had to answer he wanted only to be left in peace to repeat the holy words again and again he had told them of the killing so many times why should they continue to bother him with these perpetual questions he answered the questions indifferently badly most of those in the court listening to his bare passionless sentences describing how he determined to kill the two men how he watched for their return to the village sitting all day long in his compound and how he finally killed them on the next day were left with the conviction that they had before them a brutal and cold murderer the summing up of the judge however showed that he was not one of those who regarded it as a simple case he laid stress on the fact that the prisoner had never been considered in the village to be completely sane and he directed the notice of the jury to the queer ideas which the prisoner seemed to have had in his mind about the hunting and his own identification with the buffalo it was right for them also to consider the demeanour of the prisoner while in court his apparent listlessness and lack of interest in what was going on 
they must however remember that if the defence of insanity was to succeed they must be satisfied that the prisoner was actually incapable owing to unsoundness of mind of knowing the nature of his act or of knowing that he was doing what was wrong or contrary to law after the judge had summed up the jury were told they could retire to consider their verdict but after consulting with them the foreman stated that they were all agreed that the prisoner was guilty of murder slindu was still muttering his stanza he had not tried to understand what was going on around him the court interpreter went close up to the dock and told him that the jury found him guilty of murder was there anything which he had to say why sentence of death should not be passed on him a curious stillness had fallen on the place slendu suddenly became conscious of where he was he looked round and saw that every one was looking at him he saw the faces of the crowd outside staring through the windows and craning round the pillars on the veranda all the eyes were staring at him as if something was expected from him for a moment the new sense of comfort and peace left him he felt afraid again hunted he looked up and down the court as if in search of some path of escape ayo he said to the interpreter does that mean i am to be hanged have you anything to say why you should not be sentenced to be hanged what is there to say i have known that a long time they told me that i should be hanged all the people along the road what is there to say now ayo Slindu's words were interpreted to the judge who took up a black cloth and placed it on his head Slindu was sentenced to be hanged by the neck until he should be dead the words were translated to him in sinhalese by the interpreter he began again to repeat the stanza he was taken out of the court handcuffed and escorted back to his cell in the prison by five policemen armed with rifles he was to be hanged in two weeks time and the days passed for him peacefully as the days had passed before the trial he had no fear of the hanging now if he had any feeling towards it it was one of expectancy even hope vaguely he looked forward to the day as the end of some long period of evil as the beginning of something happier and better he scarcely thought of the actual hanging but when he did he thought of it in the words of the old beggar i do not think it will hurt much four days before the day fixed for the execution a jailer came to Salindu's cell accompanied by a sinhalese gentleman dressed very beautifully in european clothes and a light grey sun helmet Salindu was told to get up and come forward to the window of the cell the sinhalese gentleman then took a document out of his pocket and began reading it aloud in a high pompous voice it informed Salindu that the sentence of death passed on him had been commuted to one of twenty years rigorous imprisonment when the reading stopped Salindu continued to stare vacantly at the gentleman do you understand fellow said the latter i don't understand hamadoru explain to him jailer you're not going to be hanged do you understand that you'll be kept in prison instead twenty years twenty years yes twenty years do you understand that Slindo did not understand it he could understand a week or two weeks or a month or even six months but twenty years meant nothing to him it was just a long time at any rate he was not after all to be hanged for the moment a slight sense of uneasiness and disappointment came over him in the last four days he had grown to look forward to the end now the end was put off for twenty years for ever it seemed to him he squatted down by the gate of his cell holding the great iron bars in his hands and staring out into the courtyard he thought of the past three weeks which he had spent in the cell after all they had been very peaceful and happy he had been acquiring merit as the old man told him to do now he would have more time still for acquiring it he would be left in peace here for twenty years for a lifetime to acquire merit and at the end he might make his way back to the village and find the bun and panchiminika there and sit in their compound again watching the shadows of the jungle it was very peaceful in the cell a jail guard came and unlocked the cell gate Salindu was taken out and made to squat down in the long shed which ran down the centre of the courtyard a wooden mallet was put into his hand and a pile of coconut husk thrown down in front of him for the remainder of that day and daily for the remainder of twenty years he had to make choir by beating coconut husks with the wooden mallet End of chapter eight chapter nine of the village in the jungle by leonard wolf this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine punchy manika had been present at the inquiry of the magistrate in the village but she had not spoken to Salindu after her meeting with him when he was being brought to Betagama by the police sergeant the magistrate and the headman and the prisoner had left for kamburu pataya very early in the morning following the day of the inquiry 
she and the other villagers woke up to find that the village had already been left to its usual sleepy life there was nothing for her to do but to obey selindu's instructions to wait for baban's release living as best she might in the hut with carla nahami her present misfortunes the imprisonment of baban the loss of her father and the fate and the uncertainty of it which hung over him weighed numbly upon her and the future filled her with vague fears she did not could not plan about it or calculate about it or visualize it or anything in it she did not even think definitely of how she was going to live for six months until baban should return there was scarcely food in the house for her and carla nahami to exist in semi-starvation through those six months yet the future loomed somehow upon her filling her with a horrible sense of uneasiness uncertainty it was a new feeling she sat in the hut silent and frightened the greater part of the day she thought of slendu stories of hunters who had lost their way in the jungle their terror must have been very like hers she was alone terribly alone and deserted she too had lost her way and like them one path was as good or as bad to her as another carla nahami was nearly fifty years old now and in a jungle village a woman and especially a woman without a husband is very old very near the grave at fifty the sun and the wind the toil the hunger and the disease sap the strength of body and mind bring folds and lines into the skin and dry up the breasts a woman is old at forty or even thirty no one man or woman in the jungle lives to the term of years allotted to man it would have been difficult to say whether carla nahami looked nearer eighty than ninety nearer ninety than a hundred the jungle had left its mark on her her body was bent and twisted like the stunted trees which the southwest wind had tortured into grotesque shapes the skin too on her face and thin limbs reminded one of the bark of the jungle trees it was shrunken against the bones and wrinkled and here and there flaking off into whitish brown scales as the bark flakes off the cumbuck trees the flesh of the cheeks had dried and shrunk the lips seemed to have sunk into the toothless mouth leaving a long line damp with saliva under the nose and under the lined forehead were the eyes lifeless and filmy peering out of innumerable wrinkles the eyes were not blind but they seemed to be sightless the pupil the iris and even the white had merged because the mind was dying it is what usually happens in the jungle to women especially the mind dies before the body imperceptibly the power of initiative of thought of feeling dies out before the monotony of life the monotony of the tearing hot wind the monotony of endless trees the monotony of perpetual hardship it will happen at an age when in other climates a man is in his prime and a woman still bears children the man will still help at the work in the jenna cutting down the undergrowth and sowing the crop but he will do so unthinking without feeling like a machine or an animal and when it is done he will sit hour after hour in his compound staring with his filmy eyes into nothing motionless except when he winds one long thin arm round himself like a grey monkey and scratches himself on the back and the woman still carries the water-pot to the bunny pool to fetch water still cooks the meal in the house while they still stand upright they must do their work they eat and they sleep they mutter frequently to themselves but they do not speak to others and no one speaks to them they live in a twilight where even pain is scarcely felt carla nahami was sinking rapidly into this twilight in the jungle decay and growth are equally swift the trial of selindu and baban the murder of the arachchi and fernando and now the loss of selindu had meant very little to her she had felt vaguely that many evils were happening but facts no longer had meaning for her clouded mind she fetched the water as usual for the cooking muttering to herself but she did not speak to punchy manika and punchy manika knew that to talk to her or consult with her would be useless a month after the conviction of selindu the life of the village would at first sight have appeared to have regained its ordinary course but in reality a great change had come over it it had been a small village a dwindling village before one of those villages doomed to slow decay to fade out at last into the surrounding jungle now at a blow in a day it lost one out of its six houses and seven out of its twenty-five inhabitants for after the death of the arachchi nan kohami his wife decided to leave the village 
her children were too young to do chenna work so that it was not possible any longer to support herself in betagama in kotagoda where the arachchi's relations lived there was paddy land and coconuts and rain fell in plenty every year they would give her a hut and a little land she would marry her children there she had always said that betagama was an unholy place full of evil and evil omens she packed up her few possessions in a bullock hackery which she borrowed from the kerala and set out for kotagoda the arachchi's house was abandoned to the jungle there was no one to inhabit it and indeed no one would have been foolhardy enough to go and live in it it was ill-omened accursed and very soon came to be known as the haunt of devils it seemed to make a long fight against the jungle the fence itself merged into the low scrub which surrounded it growing into a thick line of small trees the wara bushes with their pale grey thick leaves and purple flowers the rank grass the great spined slabs of prickly pear crawled out from under the shadow of the fence over the compound up to the walls and the very door but the walls were thicker and better made than those of most huts the roof was of tiles there was no cajun thatch to be torn and scattered by the southwest wind the rains of the northeast monsoon beat against the mud walls for two years in vain they washed out great holes in them through which you could see the jungle sticks upon which the mud had been plastered the sticks exposed to the damp air took root and burst into leaf great weeds and even bushes began to grow up between the tiles from seeds dropped by birds or scattered by the wind an immense twisted cactus towered over the roof the tiles were dislodged and pushed aside by the roots the jungle was bursting through the walls overwhelming the house from above the jungle moved within the walls at last they crumbled the tiled roof fell in the grass and the weeds grew up over the little mound of broken red pottery the jungle sticks of the wall spread out into thick bushes tall saplings of larger trees began to show themselves by the end of the third rains the compound and the house had been blotted out it was as if the jungle had broken into the village other huts had been abandoned overwhelmed blotted out before but they had always lain on the outside of the village the jungle had only drawn its ring closer round the remaining huts it had not broken into the village the village had remained a whole intact but now the jungle cut across the village separating salindus and bastian apu's hut from the rest the villagers themselves noted it they felt that they were living in a doomed place the village is dying nancho hami had said before she left an evil place devil haunted it is dying as its young died with the old no children are born in it now an evil place in ten years it will have gone trampled by the elephants it was however only very gradually that this feeling of doom came to be felt by the village and the villagers at first after the excitement of the trials and the murder they seemed to have settled down to the old monotonous life as it had been before the veterala was appointed a rachchi punchy manika waited for baban she did not and could not count the passing of time a week was only some days to her and six months only many months but she waited watching the passage of time vaguely but continuously for the day when baban should return she heard the rumour which eventually reached the village that after all cylinder was not to be hanged he was to be kept in prison they said for ever for the remainder of his life it brought no comfort to her he had been taken out of her life she would never see him again did it matter whether he was dead or in prison she waited month after month her first feelings of fear were lost in the perpetual sense of expectancy as the time slipped away and she had to work to labour hard in order to keep herself and karlinahami alive the little store of Kurakan in the house dwindled rapidly she had to search the jungle for edible leaves and wild fruit and roots like the wild onions which the pig feed upon when the chenna season came she worked in the others chennas balupas and bastianapus and even puncharalas she worked hard like a man for a few handfuls of curacan given to her as a charity the others liked her and were in their way kind to her they liked her quietness her gentleness and submission even puncharala said of her she goes about like a doe they used to call the mad veda a leopard the leopard's cub has turned into a deer as the months passed she gradually began to feel as if each day might be the one on which baban would return and as each day passed without bringing him she tried to reckon whether the six months had really gone she talked it over with the other villagers some said it was five months others seven months since the conviction they discussed it for hours wrangling quarrelling shouting at one another 
he had been convicted two months about two months before the st helise new year no it was one month before the new year it couldn't be one month before because the chenna crop was not reaped yet reaped why it had only just been sown it must have been three months before three months you fool i said chenna crop like ninety days rice fool who is a fool hold your tongue hold your tongue at any rate it was before the new year and it's already six months since the new year i yield six months since the new year it is only a month since i sowed my chenna who ever heard of sowing a chenna five months after the new year it is not three months since the new year bunchy manika would stand listening to them going over again and again hour after hour she listened in silence and would then slip quietly away to wander in the evening down the track towards kambu pataya it was on the track that she hoped that she was certain that she would meet him then all would be well the evil would end as lindu had said but as the days went by the certainty left her even hope began to tremble to give place to forebodings fears the time came when all were agreed that the six months had passed something must have happened to him he was ill perhaps or he had just been forgotten there one can never tell anything may happen when a man gets into prison they simply have forgotten to let him out punctuala the new headman was consulted the man he said is probably dead punchy manika shuddered her great eyes in which the look of suffering had already grown profound and steady did not leave the veterala's face yes i expect the man's dead they die quickly over there in prison especially strong men like baban they lie down in a corner and die there is medicine for diseases but is there any medicine for fate so they say and lie down in the corner and die there is nothing for you to do no i can give you no medicine for fate either you must sit down here in the village and marry a young man if you can find one and if not perhaps an old one eh why not though the jackals are picking the bones of the elephant on the river bank there are other elephants bathing in the river nor are they all cows well well ralahami do you really know anything have you heard that he is dead i've heard nothing from whom could i hear if you want to hear anything you must go to the prison it will take you many days first to kambu pataya and then west along the great road three days to tangala where the prison is you must ask at the prison they can tell you punchy manika left the veterala in silence she walked away very slowly to the hut the conviction had come to her at once that she must go to the prison the thought of the journey alone into an unknown world frightened her but she felt that she must go that she could not bear any longer this waiting and doubt in the village she made some cakes of curricon tied them up in a handkerchief together with some uncooked grain which the villagers gave her when they heard of her intended journey and started next day for kambu pitaya the first part of her journey the track of kambu pitaya she knew well she had too no fear as other women have of being alone in the jungle it was when she turned west along the main road to tangala that her real troubles began she felt lost and terribly alone on the straight white dusty road the great clumsy bullock carts laden with salt or paddy perpetually rumbled by her the carters she knew were bad men terrible tales were told about them in the villages the life of the road frightened her far more than the silence and solitude of the jungle that she understood she belonged to it but the stream of passers-by upon the road the unknown faces and the eyes that always stared strangely inquiringly at her for a moment and had then passed on for ever made her feel vaguely how utterly alone she was in the world and nowhere was this feeling so strong for her as in the villages which she slunk through like a frightened jackal everywhere it was the same the crowd of villagers and travellers staring at her from in front of the village boutique the group of women gossiping and laughing round the well in the paddy field not a known face among them all she had not the courage even to ask to be allowed to sleep at night in a boutique or hut she preferred to creep into some small piece of jungle by the roadside when darkness found her tired and hungry she was very tired and very hungry before she reached tangala her bewilderment was increased by the network of narrow streets she wandered about until she suddenly found herself in the market it was market day and a crowd of four or five hundred people were packed together into the narrow space which was littered with the goods and produce which they were buying and selling fruit and vegetables and grain and salt and clothes and pots every one was talking shouting gesticulating at the same time the noise terrified her and she fled away 
she hurried down another narrow street and found herself at the foot of a hill which rose from the middle of the town there were no houses upon its sides but there was an immense building on the top of it there was no crowd there only an old man sitting on the bare hillside watching five lean cows which were trying to find some stray blades of parched brown grass on the stony soil she squatted down happy in the silence and solitude of the place after the noise of the streets and market nothing was to be heard except the cough of one of the cows from time to time and from far off the faint confused murmur from the market-place she looked up at the great white building it was very glaring and dazzling in the blaze of the sun she wondered whether it was the prison in which baban lay she looked at the old man sitting among the five starved cows he reminded her a little of selindu he sat so motionless staring at a group of coconut trees that lay around the bottom of the hill he was as thin as the cattle which he watched as their flanks heaved in the heat you saw the ribs sticking out under their mangy coats and you could see too every bone of his chest and sides panting up and down under his dry wrinkled skin the insolent noisy townspeople had terrified her this withered old man seemed familiar to her like a friend he might very easily have come out of the jungle she went over to where he sat and stood in front of him for a moment he turned on her his eyes which were covered with a film the colour of the film which forms on stagnant water then he began again to stare at the palms in silence father she said is that the prison the old man looked up slowly at the great glaring building as if he had seen it for the first time and then looked from it to punchy Manica. yes he said in a dry husky voice why my man must be there said punchy Manica, gazing at the white walls he was sent there many months ago they sent him there for six months it was a false case the six months have passed now but he has not returned to the village i have come to ask about him here a long way i am tired father tired of all this but he must be there the old man's eyes remained fixed upon the coconut palms he did not move what is your village woman he asked i come from betagama betagama i know it i knew it long ago i too come from over there from maha Wellagama, beyond betagama you should go back to your village woman but my man father what about my man the old man turned his head very slowly and looked up at the prison the sun beat down upon his face which seemed to have been battered and pinched and folded and lined by age and misery his eyes wandered from the prison to one of the cows she stood still stretching out her head in front of her her great eyes bulging she coughed in great spasms which strained her flanks he waited until the coughing had stopped and she began again to search the earth for something to eat then he said speaking as if to himself they never come out from there not if they are from the jungle how can they live in there always shut in between walls these town people they do not mind but we surely i should know i am from mahawela gama a village in the jungle over there i would go back now but i am too old when one is old it is useless but you go back to your village woman it is folly to leave the village there is hunger there i know i remember that but there is the hut and the compound all by themselves and the jungle beyond here there is nothing but noise and trouble and one house upon the other but i must ask at the prison first for my man why are they keeping him there they never come out surely i should know my son was sent there he never came out the case was in this town and i came here and spent all i had for him then i thought i would wait here until they let him out but he never came it will be the same with your man go back to the village punchy Manika wept quietly from weariness and hunger and misery at the old man's words it is no good crying he said i am old and who should know better than i they never come out it is better to go back to the village punchy Manika got up and walked slowly up the hill and then round the prison there was only one entrance to it an immense solid wooden gate studded with iron nails she knocked timidly so timidly that the sun was not heard within then she sat down against the wall and waited hours passed and nothing happened the gate remained closed no sound could be heard from within the prison the hill was deserted except for the five cows whose coughing she could hear from time to time below her but she waited patiently for something to happen only moving now and again into the shadow of the wall when the sun in its course beat down upon her at last the door opened and a man in a khaki uniform and helmet carrying a club in his hand came out he looked at punchy Manika and said sharply what do you want here i've come about my man Haya. a long time ago he was sent here for six months the time has passed but he has not returned to the village they say he is dead is it true ayah what was his name and village he was from betagama his name ayah 
how can i tell his name what was his name fool they called him baban what was he convicted for it was a false case they said he had robbed the arachchi oh that man yes the arachchi was killed afterwards wasn't he yes yes my father did that well he was here too have you any money woman no i none we are very poor ah well we can't tell you anything here you must go to kamburu pitaya and send a petition to the agent hamadoru but you know my man i you said you did what harm to tell me is he here now what has happened to him i have come many days journey to ask about him and now you send me away to more trouble the jail guard looked at punchy manika for a minute or two willie said charity they say is like rain to a parched crop you were asking for drought in a parched field i knew the man he was here but he is dead he died two months back the jail guard expected to hear the shrill cry and the beating of the breast the signs of woman's mourning punchy manika astonished him by walking slowly away to the shade sitting down again by the prison wall the blow was too heavy for the conventional signs of grief she sat dry-eyed she felt little but the intense desire to get away to the village to get away out of this world where she was lost and alone to the compound where she could sit and watch the sun set behind the jungle she did not wait long she set out at once down the hill the old man still sat among his cows looking at the coconut trees ah he said as she passed him they never come out i told you so he is dead father yes they never come out go back to the village child i'm going father End of chapter nine chapter ten of the village in the jungle by leonard wolf this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten two years later punchy manika was still living in the hut which had belonged to selinda but she lived alone kalinahami had died slowly and almost painlessly like the trees around her her death had brought no difference into punchy manika's life except that now she had to find food for herself alone the years had brought more evil death and decay upon the village of the five houses which stood when punchy manika returned from her journey to the prison only two remained her own and that of the headman vetarala pancharala disease and hunger visited it year after year it seemed as the headman said to have been forgotten by gods and men year after year the rains from the northeast passed it by only the sun beat down more pitilessly and the wind roared over it acro across the jungle the little patches of chenna crop which the villagers tried to cultivate withered as soon as the young shoots showed above the ground no man traveller or headman or trader ever came to the village now no one troubled any longer to clear the track which led to it the jungle covered it and cut the village off disease and death took the old first podi sinho and his wife angohami and the jungle crept forward over their compound and three years later two other huts were abandoned in one had lived balapu with his wife and sister and his two children in the other bastianapu with his two sons a daughter a daughter-in-law and a grandchild they had tried to help punchy manika by letting her work in their chennas and by giving her a share in the meagre crop they struggled hard against the fate that hung over them clinging to the place where they had been born and lived the compound they knew and the sterile chennas which they had sown no children were born to them now in their hut their women were as sterile as the earth the children that had been born to them died of want and fever at last they yielded to the jungle they packed up their few possessions and left the village for ever to try and find work and food in the rice fields of mahapotana they tried to induce punchy manika to go with them but she refused she remembered her misery and loneliness upon the road to tangala and the words of the old man from mahawalagama who sat among the cows upon the hill there she remembered baban's words to the Madalali surely it is a more bitter thing to die in a strange place it might be a still bitterer thing to live in a strange place she was alone in the world the only thing left to her was the compound and the jungle which she knew she clung to it passionately blindly the love which she had felt for slindu and the bun who were lost to her for ever 
whose very memories began to fade from her in the struggle to keep alive was transferred to the miserable hut the bare compound and the parched jungle so she was left alone with puncherala he was an old man now weak and diseased after a while he became too feeble even to get enough food to keep himself alive she took him into her hut she had to find food now for him as well as for herself by searching the jungle for roots and fruit and by sowing a few handfuls of grain at the time of the rains in the ground about the hut he gave her no thanks as his strength decayed his malignancy and the bitterness of his tongue increased but he did not live long after he came to her hut hunger and age and parangi at last freed her from his sneers and his jibes the jungle surged forward over and blotted out the village up to the very walls of her hut she no longer cleared the compound or mended the fence the jungle closed over them as it had closed over the other huts and compounds over the paths and tracks its breath was hot and heavy in the hut itself which it imprisoned in its wall stretching away unbroken for miles everything except the little hut with its rotting walls and broken tattered roof had gone down before it it closed with its shrubs and bushes and trees with the impenetrable disorder of its thorns and its creepers over the rice fields and the tanks only a little hollowing of the ground where the trees stood in water when rain fell and a long little mound which the rains washed out and the elephants trampled down marked the place where before had lain the tank and its land the village was forgotten it disappeared into the jungle from which it had sprung and with it she was cut off forgotten it was as if she was the last person left in the world a world of unending trees above which the wind roared always and the sun blazed she became one of the beasts of the jungle struggling perpetually for life against hunger and thirst the ruined hut through which the sun beat and the rains washed was only the lair to which she returned at night for shelter her memories of the evils which had happened to her even of baban and her life with him became dim and faded and as they faded her childhood and selindu and his tales returned to her she had returned to the jungle it had taken her back she lived as he had done understanding it loving it fearing it as he had said one has to live many years before one understands what the beasts say in the jungle she understood them now she was one of them and they understood her and were not afraid of her they became accustomed to the little tattered hut and to the woman who lived in it the herd of wild pigs would go grunting and rooting up to the very door and the old sows would look up unafraid and untroubled at the woman sitting within even the does became accustomed to her soft step as she came and went through the jungle muttering greetings to them they would look up for a moment and their great eyes would follow her for a moment as she glided by and then the heads would go down again to graze without alarm but life is very short in the jungle punchy manika was a very old woman before she was forty she no longer sowed grain she lived only on the roots and leaves that she gathered the perpetual hunger wasted her slowly and when the rains came she lay shivering with fever in the hut at last the time came when her strength failed her she lay in the hut unable to drag herself out to search for food the fire in the corner that had smouldered so long between the three great stones was out in the day the hot air eddied through the hut hot with the breath of the wind blowing over the vast parched jungle at night she shivered in the chill dew she was dying and the jungle knew it it is always waiting can scarcely wait for death when the end was close upon her a great black shadow glided into the doorway two little eyes twinkled at her steadily two immense white tusks curled up gleaming against the darkness she sat up fear came upon her the fear of the jungle blind agonizing fear apochji apochji she screamed he has come the devil from the bush he has come for me as you said ayo save me save me apochji as she fell back the gray boar grunted softly and glided like a shadow towards her into the hut End of chapter ten end of the village in the jungle by leonard wolf